Yes, we are. Here we are. Yes. Ready. Okay, good, good morning. Yes, okay, great. I'm ready. Good morning, I'm ready. Good morning. I'll just share my screen. And we good morning, start. everyone. Ciao, Paolo. Hi, Tom. Nice to see you. No, 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 sono Orazio che ti saluta, Paolo Ah, Caraffa. perché ho visto Tom che faceva così con la mano. Ciao, Orazio. <laughs> Ciao, come stai? Bene, tu? Bello vederti. Bene, bene, anche bene, per bene. me, caro. Good morning to you all and good, welcome. Good morning. To well, uh, welcome to the International Symposium of the Roman Forum Architecture and Archaeology. Same. Now I will introduce you to the two organizers of the ISAI International Summer School. Come and the you? first person that I'll be introducing is Alessandro Camis. Alessandro Camus graduated in architecture at Sapienza University. Before graduating, he cooperated with Sarto the Architetti Associati for the project of the new Italian embassy and the Church of Jesus' Holy Faith. In 2007, he discussed his doctoral thesis on history of, of medieval town planning in Ravenna in Sapienza and therein attended postdoctoral studies until 2014. He taught, he taught at the Rome program of the School of Architecture, University of Miami, and at the Faculty of Architecture, Design and Fine Arts of Vienna American University in Cyprus, where he directed until 2018 the International Center for Heritage Studies, ICHS. He is member of ICOMOS Italy and Secretary General of the Cyprus Network of, for Urban Morphology. He is now Associate Professor and Director of the Laboratory of Dynamic Research on Urban Morphology at the Faculty of Architecture and Design of Erzin University, Istanbul. His main research interests are in arch architectural design, urban morphology, and advanced digital technologies for the conservation and enhancement of archaeological heritage. So you have the floor for a few words, if you may. Thank you very much, um, uh, Simge. And um, so, as we know, as we all know, we're doing a summer school in the Roman Forum, but it is online. And when we uh, designed this, it was not meant to be online, of course. It was meant, meant to be on site, but then we had to do it as we are, even though some people are in the photo and you can see them this morning. We inspired our uh, learning environment to the medieval classroom, where a cathedra is where the lecturer is sitting, and these are the students listening to the lecture, but it is all happening inside a room. Now, we don't have the room, so we designed a virtual room. We designed a number of rooms, uh, and you are now in the Aula Cesare Brandi, uh, but we also have workshop rooms, and each one of those rooms has a catheter. This virtual learning environment is a distributed learning environment. Some of these resources are provided from, from Sapienza, uh, others from uh, Uzigin University. Uh, some are provided by Curtin University and University of Florence. So altogether, we arrange this into this plan, which is the key plan for our students. Well, our students will be working in these tutorial spaces, which are dedicated to famous people that operated in the forum, such as Giacomo Boni, uh, Goethe, Antonio Munoz, Giovanni Battista Nolli, and Andrea Palladio. Uh, so welcome to our International Summer School, which today is done on site in Rome, but also online in Istanbul and Perth, Australia. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kamis. 
I will share my screen again. So now I will introduce you to the second organizer of this uh, summer school, uh, who is Tom Rankin. American architect Tom Rankin received his master's in architecture at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design. A, uh, a bachelor's in architecture at Princeton and a laureate in architecture at Sapienza University of Rome. He was lived in Rome. He has lived in Rome since 1991. Engaged engaged in design research practice and teaching focused on the historic and emergent city and landscape as framework for sustainable urbanism and architecture. He teaches at the Università di Roma La Sapienza School of Engineering, the California Polytechnic Rome Program in Architecture, and the Iowa State Rome Program. He is a founding member of ISAR, uh, a nonprofit organization dedicated to architecture, art, and archaeology in Rome. And former director of the association Severetano Onlus, Tom is the author of Rome Works, an architect explores the world's most sustainable city and has written numerous articles on sustainable urbanism and presented frequently at conferences. Professor Rankin, you have the floor. Professor, are you there? Tom, you have to unmute yourself. We cannot hear you. Yes. Okay. Good morning, everybody. And thank you, Cynthia, for the introduction. Thanks to everybody for joining us. As you can see, I will be moderating here from the Roman Forum. And I want to bring, uh, first and foremost, institutional greetings from ESAR, which is the sponsoring, one of the sponsoring organizations. ESAR is the International Society for Archaeology, Art, and Architecture of Rome. And we have a, a, an agreement signed last year with Oxygen University, uh, with whom we are happy to collaborate. Uh, we have been excavating here in the Horia Abiraziana area of the Roman Forum since 2016 in collaboration with the superintendency, the authorities that oversee the site here. And um, we, the students, will be learning about the excavation, and you all following us will be learning about this and other excavations during the conference this morning. So uh, really great to see everybody here. I will be seeing you in between as I introduce some of the speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, we will have uh, lectures throughout this uh, seminar, and uh, we will uh, have the question part at the a part at the end of the seminar. But first, I'd like to uh, send our salutations to the Dean of uh, Faculty of Architecture and Design of Erzurum University, Orhan Hacı Asanoğlu. Uh, Orhan Hacı Asanoğlu graduated from MEU, METU in 1979 in, uh, and from ITU uh, Master of Architecture in 1981 and PhD in Architectural Design in 1986. He's a professor of architecture. He teaches architectural design, urban design, urban design practices, morphological studies in architecture, architecture and identity, research methods course, courses. He's a member of Chamber of Architects, NIMED, Association for Architectural Education, ENHR, IAPS, CSBE. Um, he, he had articles, papers, and book chapters on the subjects of cultural and space, cultural and space, housing design and assessments for disabled and aged architecture and city and identity architectural education. He won numerous prizes in architectural and urban design competition. He worked he works as the dean of, of the faculty of architecture in uh, ITU uh, from 2008 to 2012. ITU Senate member representing Faculty of Architecture from 2004 to 2007, Head of Department of Architecture ITU uh, from 2000 to 2004, as Editor-in-Chief of uh, AIZ ITU Journal of the Faculty of Architecture from 2004 to 2013, and Head of Architectural Accrediting Board um, in 2008. Uh, Professor Hadja Sanolu, if you have a few words to share with us, you have the floor. Simge, thank you very much. Good day to everybody. I would like to express my best wishes on behalf of students uh, and faculty members of Zane University, Faculty of Architecture and Design, and also would like to welcome uh, to Zane University Digital Campus on behalf of our president, uh, Professor Esra Gensturk. Uh, the opening conference of the first international 
uh, Isar Summer School Architecture and Archaeology in Roman Forum as the opening of uh, Isar Summer School, uh, which will be realized online in between uh, 18 and 28 to 2020, organized jointly by Sapienza University of Rome, Ozean University, and other universities. We will have two summer schools in the summer, organized jointly by Dynamic Research on Urban Morphology, DRAM at Ozean University, and ISAR, the International Society of Archaeology, Art, Architecture, and uh, of Rome. Uh, the first uh, is this one and related with the distinguished heritage of Roman Forum, architecture and archaeology of the site. And the second one related with the Abruzzo um, Online International Summer School again, uh, which will be re re realized in uh, um, a town, uh, Castelvecchio, Calvizio in Italy, at Abruzzo region. Um, and the second the international summer school will be uh, 20, uh, 17th and 27th July 2020 in coll collaboration again with Ram and Isar. Uh, and also Calpoli and University of Florence uh, will be also collaborating universities. I'm very happy that with the endless efforts of Professor Alessandro Camis, we, the Faculty of Architecture and Design at Ozean University, had many very good student and faculty exchange programs and joined summer schools with the universities from Italy. We have now one of these uh, joint organizations of Sapienza University of Rome and Ozean University, although uh, we uh, just uh, signed uh, framework um, agreement, um, but we start immediately work together. I would like to express my sincere thanks to Orazio Carpenzano, the director of the Department of Architecture and Design, Sapienza University of Rome, for this co collaboration. We follow many valuable presentations and invited academicians from Sapienza University of Rome, University of Florence, University of Bologna, Rome Tre University, Politecnico di Bari, University of Naples, Federico II, and University of Debrecen. I would like to thank all presenters for their support to this opening conference. I'm continuing my thanks with Tom Rankin, who is one of the organizers of this event, and many thanks to Professor Alexandro Kamis, Özge Özkovancı, and Tim Gallag from the University for the summer school and open conference organization. I would like to say welcome to our participants and express my best wishes to all of you. And I believe that this meeting will be a very well beginning of first international uh, ESAR summer school architecture and archaeology in Roman Forum. Thank you very much for your attention and participation in this meeting. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor. And Simge, if you share the screen, thank you about Orazio Carpenzano, and I will say a few words yes, by way I of am introduction. Sure. Wonderful. I'm sure. Yes. Okay, so uh, again, Speaking from the Roman Forum and uh, introducing the Dean of the, uh, excuse me, the Director of the Department of um, Architecture Design at the Sapienza University in Rome. Architecture and Design is DIAP in Italian, the coordinator of the Research Doctorate in Architectural Theory and Design. Um, Orazio Carpenzano, full professor of Architecture and Urban Design at Sapienza, also in the past directed the Quasar Institute the Culture Commission of the Faculty of Architecture at Sapia University. He's received multiple prizes and recommendations for various competitions. And his work has been exhibited at the Venice Biennale and in Barcelona and Delft. Now, among Horatio's recent projects, mm -hmm. he's done the new Corso Trento and Trieste project in Lanciano, 
the Piazza delle Pietre d'Italia, um, the first diffused museum of the Great War in Redipulia, and um, in preparation for exhibiting the Communicating Democracy show. He's currently coordinating a project for urban architecture and installations at the Federico Fellini Opera Museum in Rimini. So we're really happy that Horacio will say a few words to, to introduce the conference. And then later on this morning, he will be presenting a very interesting paper. Horacio, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting the organizers. Uh, and uh, thank you to the Dean or, uh, Oran uh, Machimana Zoglu, spero di aver pronunciato bene, eh, for uh, this joint uh, with uh, my department. Uh, I'm here in a double uh, capacity as a delegate of the Dean of my faculty to bring uh, a greeting uh, address uh, to the workshop uh, and uh, then later as a speaker on, this, on uh, the theme of the archaeological area and the new uh, widespread museum of the Colosseum. The Faculty of Architecture is linked to the destiny of the city of Rome, so it is natural for us to contribute to this, uh, to this discussion on uh, the historical culture of the project of uh, archaeology and architecture as uh, motives of progress, uh, of challenge, and uh, innovation. Then uh, we wish you, us, a good job and uh, a happy success for, to, to our words and uh, our projects. Thank you. I apologize from now on because afterwards uh, I will make a, a speech in Italian for two reasons. I am more comfortable in expressing my thought uh, with uh, the word I know and consequently I hope to be clear. Uh, the second reason is uh, uh, that uh, I studied English in a very bad school. Thank you uh, and more good work, uh, everyone. Thank you very much, Professor. Now I will introduce you um, Paolo Carafa. Paolo Carafa is full professor of classical archaeology at Sapienza University of Rome. His main scientific interests have been devoted to Roman topography, Etruria in Etruscan and Roman times. Basilicata, Calabria, Roman suburbium, sorry for the mispronunciation, in, Rome, in Roman times, an analysis of monumental complexes in different urban centers of ancient Italy, Rome, northern slopes of the Palatine since uh, 1986, Volterra, uh, 1987 to 1994, Pompeii, 1994 to 2005, Veii, 1996 to 1998, Rome Domus Augustana on Palatine, 2009, 2010. In 2005, he created an archaeological information system. This led to the addition of the Atlas of Ancient Rome, uh, Princeton University Press, 2017, the first and only tale of the landscape of a city of the ancient world, proposing detailed analysis and reconstruction for 260 buildings of, uh, or monumental complexes. Paula Carafa, Professor, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And just a moment, I'm going to share my screen. Anyway, I hope, you, okay. Thank you very much, Alessandro and Tom, for organizing this symposium and uh, inviting me, and at last accepting my suggestion of such a paper. And uh, I'm really happy to be here. And by the way, this is the first time I have the chance of sharing the 
results of our latest seasons of research in, in Rome. I also beg your pardon, but I, um, I shall leave you soon after my paper due to a, a previously scheduled meeting with our rector. So please excuse me, but I, I will have to leave in a while. Um, so we have been working in the center of Rome since 1985 and we have been mainly involved in the excavation of this area on the northern slope of the hill where we have been able to reconstruct the changing landscape of this part of the ancient city since the Iron Age that is the end of the 10th century BC until the early medieval times. Now, since 2017, we, we change our focus of interest and we shifted to this corner of the hill. In um, archeological terms, this is a quite an uncharted area. You see, it's the only green spot still surviving all along the summit of the hill. And uh, in, this is the area we have been dealing with since two years ago. This is the situation. Uh, three years ago, the Parco del Colosseo has inaugurated here the naturalistic track that is a walk along uh, flowers and, and trees of certain species. And um, this means that the area is virtually unknown, apart from these two blocks here that were uncovered uh, during the 30s of last centuries. And, and that's all, more or less. You see the Church of Santa Anastasia here the body of the imperial palace here, the upper part of this uh, section here where the Domus of Augustus is, and this is the green area. We can have a quick tour. Uh, this in, is blue shaded now, the, the area where we are working at the present. This is, once again, Santa Anastasia Church, the void area, the imperial palace, and the house of Augustus. And once again here, this is a different view. Circus Maximus, Santa Anastasia, Imperial Palace, and Domus Augusti. And this area has been, in some sense, suddenly involved in the evaluation of the house of the first emperor of Rome. You can see here the remains of the house plotted over the aerial view and you see that we are very close to the last uh, uh, structures that are documented or visible in this area. At the beginning, this was just really a void area. You can see here the plan drawn by Rosa in 1868. You see the Imperial Palace here and this is the void area at the base of the hill. And once again, in Lanciani's plan, he plotted the few remains here. He had been able to identify. This is the location of San Anastasia. And um, this was not considered a very interesting area because the house of Augustus was located in a different section of the hill by uh, the end of two centuries ago. Uh, there were these three maze. This is the face plan, the archaeological face plan of the hill. And in that spot, a room with wonderful uh, paintings that we now call as the Aula Isiaca had been uncovered. And this painting can be dated to the end of the first century BC. Therefore, Christian Hulsen thought that this could be interpreted as a part of the house of the first emperor. Later on, the English scholar, uh, Richmond, identified these remains as the podium of the temple of 
Apollo, and we know, thanks to the lead resources, that this temple should have been the core of the palace of this emperor. Therefore, it's not moving. Okay, this is the podium of the temple. This is the plan drawn by uh, Richmond, and therefore. Richmond himself suggested a reconstruction of the house of Augustus around temple using all the names that were uh, served in the resources. Later on, Alfonso Bartoli extended the excavated area and during the 50s of last century, uh, the excavation were uh, at the end carried on in front of the temple and the so-called house of Augustus had been finally uncovered. Um, this is what have been published after such an excavation. It's not properly an archaeological plan, but this is what we were used to when we were students. This is uh, uh, an illustration taken from an, um, a handbook of classical Archaeology. This is not a very uh, clear indication of the, the shape and the faces of this building. Uh, lately, the, uh, a new plan of these remains have been published, and this is the result. But you see, the lower part is still uh, is missing. Still, since this moment on a number of hypotheses have been carried on trying to identify the shape of the house of the first emperor. Here you can see a number of these uh, hypotheses. Uh, this is a, a small shape up to a wider shape with an upper part and a lower part with one or two terraces. This uh, is um, the discussion about this is still ongoing and this is the reason why we decided at the end of the previous excavation to move of the opposite slope of the hill trying to gather some more information about the architectural remains in that section the starting point of this research has been the facing of the already known remains and um, the excavation carried on during the 50s of last century um, by the way, discovered not one building, but two buildings, a lower one, which is this shaded area here, which is a late Republican house. All this building had been backfilled during the first century BC once again, and a new building, an upper building, has been imposed to this place. Sorry. Uh, we can tell a lot about the, um, the way they backfilled and created the new uh, building. At first, they created foundation. You can see these pillars here. They have been interpreted, and sometimes they still are interpreted as, as the huge basis for huge statues. But in fact, they are a part of a foundation done like this. This is the pillar. And different retaining walls such as this one in this spot this wall is this one in slide have been uh, created in order to um, create a backfill in that area to be contained by these huge structures and after that a new house has been created this is the face plan of the structures dating to the first phase of this period all comprised between the end of the first century BC. We have a century here and the previous house with other structures all around. The result is as follows, a, a, a small house dating at around the half of the first century BC has been enlarged with a peristyle and some rooms here is enlarged and, and turned into a two peristyles house, one here and one here, with rooms all around. These are the famous rooms we can see now, the Stanza delle Maschere, the Stanza 
dei festoni Tipino, the so-called studiolo di Augusto here. They have been interpreted as the house of the emperor, but in fact, they can be dated just at, around the middle of the first century BC. This is once again a, a, a summary of the situation we can now state. Uh, the first phase of the lower building with one peristyle, the second phase of the lower building with two peristyles, and in this section here you can see the relation in between the rocky cliff of the hill, which is the limit of this house. The rocky cliff is more or less here. And in the cliff has been uncovered recently a round room interpreted by someone as the sanctuary of Cupercal. And you can see was this room has been seen uh, thanks to the deep core uh, and the camera has been inserted in such a room. You can see a decoration here dating back around the year 40 or 30s of the first century AD with an eagle in the center, which is clearly a symbol of power. To amuse ourselves, this is a suggestion of how the complete uh, architecture should have looked like. The two peristyles here with porticos around, this abutting part here, the rocky cliff of the hill, and the round chamber here. Uh, according to the pottery recovered in this earth field uh, during the last part of the first century BC, this lower building has been backfilled and a new building, a new upper building is created. And these are the structures remaining of this new um, artifact. And thanks to the lit resources, we know that the Emperor Augustus decided in the year 36 BC to upgrade his house because a lightning struck the house and he interpreted this as a, as, as a claim of the god Apollo to have his house. So he decided to create a, a larger and, and upgraded house uh, to host this god claiming a seat like that. This is the relation in between the new upper building and the lower one. This is the two peristyle building and two Republican house embedded in the new building, which is now larger. This is once again, the limit of the cliff. And we have envision here uh, um, private houses that are attested by the way, by the lit resources, but we have no evidence for that yet. This is a possible relation in between once again, the cliff, the retaining wall and the upper part of the new house with the temple in the center and two blocks on each side. And in this section here, you can see the relation between the upper building here and the backfield remains of previous house. So we were ready to uh, analyze this unknown area at the moment. Now you have some reference here. This is the podium of the temple of Apollo, this is one of the two peristyle, which is still there, still backfilled. This can be excavated one of these days. And once again, here, this is the temple, the limit of the later imperial palace, and one of the peristyles still to be excavated, San Anastasia, the two blocks uncovered during the 30s of last century. And you can see here there's a quite limited area by the limit of the upper house, the wall dividing the Flavian Imperial Palace from this area. 
the line of the Scala Cachi here and a fourth wall which is standing here. We will talk about this later. So this is the, the architectural box we have been trying to analyze at the moment. Uh, we have some information due to these visual documents. This is Saint Anastasia, you can see, and there were quite imposing remains still in the 16th century BC. This is the Circus Maximus, this is Saint Anastasia, this is the block we have been looking at. Uh, in this plan, you can see here, this is Saint Anastasia, a number of rooms aligned running like the limit of this church by that time the upper part of the hill was still void and uh, that this monument here should have looked like quite a substantial uh, building we can see here at least three stories one two and three the upper part here and what we can see now is just this fragment you can tell clearly this door is this door this arch retrieving arch here is there this round windows is this one so all this word is now lost and in fact in later uh, images such as this one of the 7th century, 70th century, sorry, this is the church and no remains are still visible. And also in the plan drawn by Nolly, we have just few remains here still visible and nothing more. Everything has been once again backfilled. So this is the situation we have been working on at the moment still. And the first thing we did was geophysics in the area. And this is the result. There are structures in red color and closing a wet area here. This section here is this one. So you can see this red spot here is a substantial structure, quite imposing and quite deep. And also this red spot here is another limit there's a sort of a huge box enclosing this area at first we thought that this could be a huge basin or drain or cave but do you or thank the drill course we know this is a backfill just wet so uh, the idea of a substantial structure with more than one story that still uncovered here has been confirmed by this first analysis in this in this place so we dug one of these rooms there are narrow and long rooms this is the front view of the wall is a, a brick wall we have no dating at the moment but the building techniques we have no stamp unfortunately but due to the technique we think that this could be a wall dating back to the second century AD, at least the end of the first century AD. This is something the Flavian age and Hadrian age. After that, we analyze once again, the remains still standing underneath the church of Santa Anastasia. This is the southest limit of this possible complex because after that we have a street dividing the Circus Maximus from the Imperial Palace. And this is a very tall wall in tufa blocks with a door in between. You can see the lintel here. And in, we will see in a plan later, this door with this lintel are placed exactly along the axis of the, the podium of Temple of Apollo, so there should be some relation in between the two features. If we look at the whole slope, we realize that this wall, this is the in, here, and the door is not included in this view. We have one store here, 
then a second store with a second door and pillars in blocks, a third store with this remain here. There are blocks supported by uh, other walls. And this system should have been taller than this because this, sorry, these two more levels are clearly indicated in the wall. This is the wall limiting the Domus Augustiana in here. And you can clearly see these traces of a vault abutting against it with a last and highest store here. You can see here better in this section, you see trace of a, a erased structure with a threshold and a door here. And in the end, this level here is the level of the upper part of the Domus Augusti where the so-called Curia Biblioteca is on. Last but not least, this is the area when we can locate a fragment of the Forma Urbis in, in marmol with the indication Area Apollinis. Uh, this fragment has no limit of the slab, but due to the orientation of the letters, we can place the fragment in such a place. And you can see these structures indicated here are coinciding with these structures underneath the church of Santa Anastasia. Therefore, to make a long story short, this is the evidence we have at the moment the upper part of the house of augustus with the limit of the rocky cliff limited by the structure revealed by the geophysics the limit of the domus uh, augustiana the the, the scalicaci and the limit indicated by the second structure revealed by the geophysics and the wall underneath the church of santa anastasia all this area should have been occupied by a multiple story building with an altar on top with the indication area Apollinis. This means that it had to be related to the temple of Apollo, which was enclosed within the house of Augustus. And therefore this area could be uh, imagined as an integral part of the house of first emperor. This is the relation between the plan of the evidence we have and the front view indicating the how tall this structure was. Chronology. As I told you, we have no clear evidence about that. We know that a part of the structures we have been able to identify in the lower slope can be dated to the second century BC, but this kind of walls here can be firmly dated to Augustan age. Therefore, we suggest that during the first century BC, end of the first century BC, beginning of the first century AD, a huge structures could have been already created in this area. If we compare this archeological evidence to lead to resources, we have some clues. Uh, Dionysus of Alicarnassus visited Rome between uh, year 31 and then he died in year 8 or 7 BC. And he, he describes this slope and he indicates clearly the rocky cliff of the hill. Therefore, unless until the year 7 BC, the rocky cliff should have been uncovered and visible by people passing by along here. Therefore, we suggest that if we can assume that an addition had been created in this area, this addition should be dated after the end of the first century BC. We know that the whole house of Augustus had been destroyed in year uh, 3 AD due to a great fire. Therefore, it is possible to suggest to relate this extension of the upper terrace around the first years of the first century AD. 
We ourselves tried also to falsify such an hypothesis, integrating this archaeological skeleton with the information uh, we have from the literary sources, and this is a, a possible reconstruction of the old structures locating within that the uh, places and the monuments remembered by the literary sources, and it works at the moment. This is a suggestion of how the front view of this huge building could have looked like, looking from the Circus Maximus. You see the temple in the middle, the entrance with the lintel we have seen, the pillars and the story of such a huge building leading up to the upper terrace in front of the, at the same level of the upper terrace in front of the temple of Apollo. In this section here, you can see once again the relation by this building, this new building and the round chamber here, the relation between the reconstruction and the archaeological evidence dating back to the beginning of the first century AD or the end of the first century BC we have, and once again the relation between the, uh, the sunken house here and backfield, the upper house, the rocky cliff and the extension of the new terrace with a suggestion of uh, the possible location of the, the altar indicated by the fragment of the forma urbis. Once again, to amuse ourselves, uh, this is how we try to imagine the whole building. We just at the beginning of our analysis. This is just one more hypothesis to be falsified or eventually accepted. And uh, we will be back on site next Friday uh, with new uh, geophysics and georadar analysis. And this is just the first step. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paolo. That was very interesting. And we're going to move on to the next presentation. And I want to say a few words again here from the Roman Forum, where you can see uh, the colleagues from the University of Firenze and from Sapienza are busy scanning the very area which uh, Luca Mashali will now be presenting to you. So I'll let us say a, word, a few words about um, my colleague archaeologist Luca Mashali, who graduated in the master's program in archaeology at Sapienza University in Rome. Um, he is a fellow of the Q Colleg um, International Research Group in Humboldt University Berlin and Sapienza. Uh, he has published the results of his research in various publications and uh, since the beginning of ESAR's projects here in the Roman Forum, he has been collaborating with us um, particularly in a, a building, a domus that is, is adjacent to where we are right now in the Foria Agrippiana. So thank you for joining us, Luca Mashali. Good morning, everyone. Um, I try to... Do you see my presentation? Yes, we do. Yes, perfectly. Okay. I'm very happy to have been uh, invited in this uh, symposium. Thank, uh, thanks to all uh, the um, participants and the organized collaboration, um, collaborator the ESAR, University Professor of Sapienza and uh, Ozigan Univer University. Presentation, uh, uh, particip participation uh, in um, research and um, archaeological excavation um, at the site of Eurydipiana has um, allowed me uh, to be part of the Signum Bortoni project uh, in collaboration with um, Dr. Dora Cirone, Alessio De Cristoforo and uh, Professor Tom Rankin, Scientific uh, Director of the Cultural Association ESAR, the International Society of Archaeology, Art and Architecture of Rome. Through this research since uh, 2016, I have uh, had the opportunity to deepen some historical topographical aspects uh, of the northern western sector of the slopes of the Palatine close to the Roman Forum. At the same time, I have been able to document some structures located behind the Oregon Piana against the low slope of the hill. 
the complex uh, is uh, bounded between the bottom wall of the Oregripiana uh, to the west and the steep uh, slope of the hill to the east. The northern hedge uh, is established uh, by the Palatine Tuff ledge uh, that lays uh, in the eastern corner of the Gustan warehouses. Uh, the southern border, instead, uh, it is not traceable since uh, this uh, sector of the monument, upper the church. Uh, of the Saint Theodore is covered by remarkable infill. The altitude the change of this palatine slope is exploited by the building throughout a predisposition of three levels. The ground floor is at an altitude of approximately one meter higher than that of the area, 14.15 meter above the sea level. The ladder is uh, at the same height uh, as the so called uh, Clevus Victoria, 13 meters um, above sea level. The construction of uh, Agrippa's warehouses uh, con in, con uh, conditioned the, the original extension of the complex in question, preserving only a path behind them. What remains of uh, it is, in fact, uh, a high brick facade that cover and uh, hides. Uh, a series of wall in opera quadrata, incerta and uh, reticulata, pertinent to various phases uh, of building succession between the third and the first century BC. The operations also modified the original morphology of the land, characterized by a um, sequence of the natural terraces uh, sloping west to the valley of the Labrum. Putting the result of drilling and stratigraphical surveys all together conducted in the area at various times and by different teams of archaeologists, it is possible to reconstruct in broad line the following morphological articulation. A meter 39 above sea level, a first terrace is at the same level of the so-called Bastione Parnesiano. A second at the, the 30 meter above sea level at the level of the so-called Clevus Victoria, a terracing at 19.50 meter above sea level documented on the vertical stratigraphy of the Tupa ledge in the east corner of the area. One lower between 14 and 15 meter above sea level at the center of the, um, the center belt of the Augustian warehouses. At the last, at the 11 meter above sea level, touches uh, the path of the Vicus Tuscus. Over time, uh, these uh, different levels were gradually regularized uh, and uh, the lower ones partially removed uh, in the Augustan age and during the first century AD. What I'm going uh, to present is a periodization of the various walls attested at the uh, grounded floor in the building, be in the building behind the area. The chronological subdivision by building phases is the result of the autoptic analysis of the walls, observation of construction techniques, building mortars, weaving of facing and wall covering when preserved. The oldest evidence is presented by a wall in opera quadrata of red little tooth visible in the southern sector, where they draw in plan at least four rooms open to the width and leading to the hist against the slope of the hill. The architectural scheme is just a functional proposed to support the natural terracing between 13 and 15 meters above sea level. The wall to the north wall uh, to, the, to the north would be identified as a battery size, a battery size of the first substantive organism, probably pertinent to Adamus. This construction phases according to the build technique can be seen between the middle of the third century in BC and the second half of the second century in BC. The same chronological frame is suggested by the plaster covering with the creation of the first initial style preserved still in situ on the one of the world. Period second is attributable to the construction of the substantive wall in operating charta that covers the southern slope of the tupa overhang east of the Oregrippiana, and then to right in the direction of the north west, so south west, uh, west. This orientation is documented in the room on the ground floor of the building in question. In room one, in a tunnel uh, water pipe obtained in the thickness of the same building, and in uh, another 
curtain covered by the background wall of room two. In the, in the same room, the northern limit is marked by a wall in opera incerta, orthogonal to the substruction, right at the point where these two walls are tied, the remains of a rustic mosaic wall. Decoration with shell, polychromic glass pebbles, and Egyptian blue are preserved, suggesting the presence of a new film, Specus Estivus, of a structure connected to the presence of water pertinent to a, a private residence, a domus. This proposal uh, should thus be defined as that of the adjacent environment, which uh, precisely because of the presence of a water pipe would be identified as a, a cistern. At this, uh, at, um, this, sa this same strange uh, the room in the northern sector are equipped with a new bottom wall, always in the opera in Charta. All these uh, walls show in the cladding, sing uh, cladding significant similarities with those of the house of the Griffey that confirm our chronology at full second DC. In the following period, period third, in the northern part of the complex, uh, Two construction phases are documented with us by wall in opera reticulata that indicated the restoration of the previous domes. This constructional operation can be seen around the first half of the first century BC. They refer to wall in opera reticulata that for different composition and morphological characteristics denounce two distinct activities. The last one for this foresees a structural straightening of the main story place close to the Palatine slope. Their section, in fact, is almost doubled. The operation has a static purpose so that the average third of the wall increase can contain both the oblique thrust of the hill and the vertical thrust of the structure above. Later, all the structure of the previous period that have survived up to this time undergo a remake. The wall that extended to the west are cut on the same line, northeast, south, and west, to rest their uh, high wall in brickwork integrally fracture, and uh, leaning to the ladder a ramp of brick stairs. The, these operations, uh, the limit seven irregular room, belong to a building that surely continued west in the area of Oregriffiana and where the substance subsequently cut by the ladder. The partiality of these remains uh, um, does not allow us to put the forward the hypothesis about it. Beyond the probable pertinence at an insula and the chronological surely before 33 BC area construction, therefore between the first and the second triumvirate. The reason for its survival could be traced in its purely function, the space is placed side by side, covered by a low bar wall and organized on three levels to create a typical bone bearing scheme for what are called cave sub substructures. Through a system of a trust and culture trust, the weight of the ground behind and the structure above is distributed in several points and reduced before this discharging to the ground. In this uh, fairly common construction, the building serves a dual functional, one defined substantive, uh, the other that offer a practical opportunity. In this query substructures, uh, usable space are obtained that probably became cellar and storage like the taberna that uh, in the same time, in the same period, were installed along the Clevus uh, Victoria. It is possible to relate uh, the trap collected here in the period one and second with author in Opera Quadrata and in charta of the excavation of the Sinium Vortumni project in the area in front. In the northern quadrant of the Aurea Griffiana, in fact, remains of a rich domus similar to those discovered behind the warehouse were brought to light. In both case, cases, the previous um, Opera Quadrata wall are leaned against the wall in opera in Charta. Under the floor of Aurea, 
In the room uh, to the north as the east, uh, there is a wall with the northeast southwest orientation under um, that, uh, consti con that constitutes uh, the background wall of the city of uh, open environment that uh, to the west and uh, the same time served a covering and support of the natural terrace above 14 15 meter above sea level also in this case the flanked rectangular room open to the west are an effective building system with the back wall they serve to statically strengthen the slope while with their thickness they act as an adequate platform to for the, de the development of at least one, uh, one upper deck. In one of these rooms, there is still the original black and white mosaic flooring and the lower part of the wall decoration on the back wall. On the plaster, you can see rectangular monochrome panels with a width of about 14 centimeter each, which alternative in the color of uh, red cinnabar and, uh, and green. Connecting the evidence um, of the Senior Vortumni project with those uh, um, documented to the hist behind the, the Augustian warehouses, it is possible to speak of a single domus of considerable size articulated on several levels along the different slope of the palatine and connected by decorative apparatuses in line with decor of the late Republican aristocratic houses that also occupied other area of Palatine Hill. In this sector of the city, the urban fabric of the third, the first, the first BC, transformed and uh, obliterated by the monumental expression of Augustan architecture, so the Oregriana, provided the domus gravitating toward the west of the on the Vicus Tuscus and articulated to the east along the low slopes of the hill. Archaeological stratification document intense construction activities of private interest during the century of the Middle and Late Republic, activities not forgot by literary source, which speak in fact of transfers of property and housing speculation, even with strong political repercussion. Everything would admit in this big context that not having enough space to exploit on horizontal plans other artificial space was created vertically. The natural slope is in fact exploited to realize with the successive cut a sequence of levels sloping downstream toward the, the Vicus Tuscus. There are plans superimposed on underlying basement environments that multiply in this way the usable surface. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we will move on to, the, to our next lecture, uh, which is going to be given by Marika Grifo and Carlo Inglese. Um, so I will introduce both of them. Uh, Carlo Inglese has collab collaborated since 1993 on courses in the scientific disciplinary sector, ICAR 17 at Sapienza University of Rome. Faculty of Architecture in 1999, he took a PhD in Survey and Representation of Architecture and Environment at the Department of Survey and Representation from 2000 to 2010. He is assistant professor in, in 2003. He won a two-year research grant for the H11 X uh, disciplinary SDSICAR 17 at the uh, RADAAR department. Uh, since 2006, he is a professor at the uh, Paris uh, PARES Master of Second Level in Architecture and Historical Construction for the Recovery of Public Spaces of Sapienza. In 2010, he wins a researcher position at Sapienza University of Rome Faculty of Architecture for the SDS ICAR 17. 
Marika Griffo, Architect PhD. Architect PhD at the Department of History, Representation and Restoration of Architectural, uh, Architecture at Sapienza University of Rome. She investigates the field of architectural representation and survey with both traditional and digital me methods. She is involved in the exploration of the workflow connecting the data acquisition to the data elaboration by integrating methods and technologies and evaluating the accuracy of, the, of 2D and 3D models. She is currently studying strategies and tools of tools for the communication of architectural and archaeological heritage, including augmented reality and virtual reality. She takes part to the national to national and international conferences on the topics related to digital photogrammet photogrammetry, 3D data ca capture and modeling, and she is author of national and international publications. From 2017, she collaborates in academic activities for courses of science, of representation, and architectural survey at Sapienza University of Rome. You have the floor. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, exactly in the forum, in the Roman Forum, and uh, I'm exactly in the place from which we made a lot of investigations that we, you are going to see. Um, what you see here behind, it's the Basilica Iulia. So we are in the Roman Forum, as we can see. And um, Ale, is, are you okay with sharing the presentation? Uh, yes, I am. I'm starting right now. Okay, great. Okay, yeah. So um, our work was in collaboration with uh, archaeologists and um, uh, even geophysics, uh, archaeologists of uh, Sapienza and uh, CNR, CNR um, uh, from Lecce, and together with a group of geophysics coming from Lecce as well. Um, uh, okay, uh, go ahead, Ale. Mm -hmm. So uh, already you know where we are. We are nearby the Colosseum in the Roman Forum. And what you see there is exactly what we can see over here, uh, the Basilica Iulia. Um, our investigations were uh, about the East Excavation Area in particular. That is exactly what you see over there. So under that part of the Basilica Iuria, there, there is an excavation area of more or less 150 square meters. And our um, main goal was to survey that area and to connect the excavation area to all the uh, survey of the whole forum. Ale, you can go ahead even like... Uh, quicker yes so what we uh, our first step was the survey and then we uh, made some geophysical investigation and then of course data elaboration and uh, 2d and 3d model elaboration now um, the east excavation area was actually excavated during the 1960 and the 1964 so during this uh, period um, uh, they of course made a very precise survey of course hand drawing and um, uh, they started to discover um, uh, some archaeological remains dated back to the fifth century uh, before christ um, okay uh, the thing, the, pro, the main problem with that was that we had to investigate this, this area, the whole basilica and the excavation area that is be, beneath it in just 15 days. This is because, as you can see now, the area is completely closed, so uh, neither archaeologists can go there. This is because the um, surfaces are very fragile. And so for conservation purposes, of course, they had to remain underneath. Um, and so in this uh, time span of 15 days, we had to connect um, uh, the survey to the existing topographic net. Uh, we have to be sure to, um, that our survey had an RGB accuracy more than a metric and geometric accuracy. So even uh, from both morphological point of view and even from aspect, our 3D survey had to be uh, a more accurate, um, as accurate as possible, let's say. Okay. 
Um, uh, so we go, uh, okay, Ale. We go ahead with an integrated um, uh, survey starting from um, a photographic for photogrammetric survey. Um, we mounted our camera, a DSLR camera, on a camera cage and um, we used two lights that you see um, uh, here in the presentation to uh, be sure to ensure um, uh, an illumination that was as uniform as possible. More than this, with this system, we could ensure that even the white balancing, so the tone of the colors of the area that was um, um, shotted, um, was the same for all the data sets, for all the pictures. Uh, here you see uh, three different um, uh, da numeric models that we generated. So the one mm -hmm. was a, the first one was a topographic model and was used as a reference for um, the pictures. But more than this, the topographic net was used to connect the um, east excavation area to the topographic net of the Roman Forum. The first model was with SFM, so with structure from motion and image matching processing, and it was to be sure to have an RGB um, accuracy of, uh, of the area, while the third model was with a laser scanner, a 3D laser scanner, and uh, it was done uh, not only for the east excavation area, so the area that is underneath, the level of the Basilica Iulia, but even to the whole, to the whole Basilica, to the uh, superficial part of the Basilica Iulia. Okay, so these three models, okay, Ale, these three models were connected together to generate just one point cloud. Uh, this point cloud has a sort of multi-resolution um, uh, approach because, of course, the level of details depends on um, the interest of archaeologists and all the um, uh, historians and so on that had to study the different parts of the basilica. So the less, uh, let's say, not important but relevant in terms of uh, historical study and archaeological studies were uh, less dense while of course the area that were more precious let's say from this point of view were um, uh, surveyed with uh, um, uh, more details uh, okay now, the thing is that with, with survey, generally speaking, we just care about morphometric, um, okay, morphometric information. So we are able to just um, know and, and understand what is on the surface of objects. But anyway, this is just one aspect of the knowledge, on, on, of a deep knowledge. So um, uh, if we think about everything that is, has a mater material features, has even immaterial features. Okay, Ale. Uh, you can go ahead, such as the environmental situation uh, factors, the conservation context, the interpretations, and so on. More than this, it, so um, uh, um, this is just to understand that when we talk about survey and we talk about models and so on, from a certain point of view, we are almost um, sure that with a survey model, we can say everything and we can know everything. We can uh, uh, explore, mm -hmm. let's say, um, uh, an object from every, uh, every sort of point of view. But this is not true because, of course, survey is just one of um, uh, the different approaches to um, uh, investigate an object. So for what concerns the surface, we have the architectural survey. And so we can talk about the geometry, the morphology, and the color. But what is under the surface is, the, um, uh, is connected and related to geophysics investigations that can, for example, lead 
to considerations about the structure, the physical comp components, and so on. So whenever we talk about knowing an object, knowing um, an architecture, and so on, of course, we always have to keep in mind that with survey, we just uh, have the access to, one, to um, some properties, just some properties of the object. That's why for this reason, in collaboration with CNR, we decided to, um, uh, to go ahead with a GPR investigation, first of all. And what you see here is um, interesting because it's the first result of um, a GPR investigation. They are called radargrams, and it's just the response of uh, this kind of investigation uh, when it goes on um, the surface. But this is a sort of 2D elaboration, a 2D model. What we wanted to do is to convert this um, 2D information in a 3D information. Okay, Ale? Uh, for this reason, the first step, so what you see on your left is what archaeologists are used to work with, is a plan with the area uh, covered by geophysics investigation, but it's uh, a 2D representation. What we wanted to do is to convert these in a 3D representation. Um, okay, Ale? That is what you're going to see here. Okay, so what you see here is uh, the 3D representation inside the softwares that geophysics are used to, uh, to use. Okay, Ale. The other um, investigation that we carried on was with um, topo tomography. Um, even in this case, the approach was similar. Um, generally speaking, archaeologists and historians are used to work with these um, time slice. They call it them, geophysics call them time slice because every, um, uh, every slice, let's say, represents a different time that the waves um, uh, sent from the, um, uh, the, um, the radar um, takes to go ahead, go in the soil and then come back. So even in this case, we have horizontal slice and cross section, vertical slice, but they are, as you can see, uh, again, once again, 2D representations. Even in this case, what we tried to do was to convert this data in a 3D representation. Um, and to connect it even with survey, um, uh, with the survey. So this is a first integration between uh, the architectural survey and the GPR data. While uh, if we go ahead, we have the integration between the architectural survey and the tomography. The tomography was very uh, important for archeologists to detect uh, on a lower levels, the different, um, uh, let's say, the chronological uh, story of the Basilica Iulia. So, for example, with tomography, they were able to detect the Cloaca Maxima or even um, some parts of the um, domuses that were um, uh, underneath the Basilica Iulia. Okay. And um, uh, then the, um, the following step was, of course, the interpretation of data. So once we were able to build um, uh, a digital clone, a digital um, twin, let's say, of, um, uh, of the object, um, uh, together with the archaeologists, we started to segment this model in order to uh, isolate and study the different um, uh, stratigraphical phases. For the, uh, with this approach, we were able to detect the fifth century before Christ phase, the fourth century before Christ phase. Go ahead, go on. And even, of course, the um, Basilica Sempronia remains. So what you see is, um, uh, still the east excavation area. 
the Basilica, um, uh, the Caesar, Basilica di Cesare remains of the first century before Christ and uh, the remains of the Basilica di Augusto. So the 3D model was segmented in order to uh, preserve this kind of interpretation and to transform it in a 2D models, in drawings, let's say. Go ahead. And so we, here we have all the different phases. So the fifth century um, before Christ and then the fourth century uh, ahead with the different phases. Okay, yeah, you can go ahead showing the drawing that, is, start, that starts to appear, let's say. So the... Um, uh, and even, of course, the vertical sections. So um, uh, this process started from the data acquisition, of course, of architectural survey and uh, continued with um, uh, geophysic investigations, so other kind of investigations. And then um, the first step was to uh, link together all these different kind of informations in just one virtual environment. Uh, this was made before interpret um, and so given interpretation of, um, uh, of all the, uh, the data collected. Now, what we see is that from a certain point of view, we have the need to have a general model that just collect and contain uh, an heterogeneous um, kind of data. So as we said, um, uh, for example, um, historical information, archaeological information, architectural survey, and so on. This is important to have a knowledge on a global, on a global scale. But in the same time, we have the need, the specific need, to explore data in their own environment. So we want a speci specialistic models. Because, of course, whenever you put together heterogeneous data, you are transforming them. And sometimes you can lose information. So these two aspects always have to be um, uh, kept in mind because um, uh, um, we, generally speaking, we need both. We need a general model that is more, comp uh, as more um, wider, let's say, as possible but even specialistic models. Uh, ahead. And so there, there are, of course, some strengths and some uh, weak points of both approaches. But the important thing is that among these two approaches, there is a process of continu continuity. So uh, a person who is working with archaeology and architectural archaeology always have to keep in mind to create general models as well as specialistic models. Uh, okay. Ale, go ahead. Yeah. So the first step, the first phase of this um, uh, work was the architectural survey, and we have done it. The second phase was the data interpretation. The thing, um, uh, the third phase is a construction of um, an integrated informative system that is able to connect and to uh, give accessibility to heterogeneous source, data sources. Okay, thank you. I'm, I finished my presentation and I give you, I say you goodbye from the Basilica Julia and the Roman Forum. Thank you very, thank much. You very much, Marika. And I'm going to introduce the next speaker who is also with you there in the Roman Forum where I was uh, just 10 minutes ago, and now I'm reporting from my studio in the Renaissance section of Rome. So back to Giorgio Verdiani, who you saw briefly working with the laser scanner, and he'll be presenting um, his talk about cultural heritage documentation from digital surveys to multimedia. Giorgio is a researcher, uh, has been since 2006 a researcher at the Department of Architecture University of Florence and just recently became associate professor there in the department uh, DIDA. Um, 
survey and representation of architecture. He's an expert in digital surveys, photography, photogrammetry, multimedia, and he's the coordinator for DIDA Labs system at the DIDA University of Florence. Um, Giorgio has been active in various conferences. I've seen his work at various presentations in collaboration with Professor Camas and myself. So I'm very happy that he is helping us out as we speak in the Roman Forum in the Horia Agrippiana. Over to you, Giorgio. Are you there, Giorgio? Maybe he is not able to hear us. I'm going there, if you just can wait. Okay. Thanks, Marika. Giorgio has been uh, working all morning with the laser scanner together with his uh, teams, Yelena Ricci, Andrea, and, and um, others. And they're probably just in the middle of a scan, which might mean that he was unable to make the connection. We'll give him a minute as Marika goes down to him, and I'm going to send him a message as well, just to see that he's ready. If for some reason we're not able to talk to uh, Giorgio right now in the forum, we can move ahead and um, in which case that would be Michele Dumarchi, but hold on Michele before we begin. Looks like Giorgio should be able to join us still. Marika, are you connected? Live yes, just one okay. second more. <laughs> Getting closer to Giorgio. We were lucky the weather looked like it might be rainy today and it's cleared up so they're able to get all the scanning work done. The forum is overgrown with vegetation but not so bad and they're actually cutting it uh, these days which makes it easier for us to document the site. We are streaming live on Facebook and I checked before we've got quite a few followers all over the world watching this uh, conference and uh, it will be there for asynchronous viewing. So many of my students in California will be tuning in to watch the presentation when they wake up uh, later on today. We also have some people from Australia who are following us, our students who've joined us from Perth from Curtin University, students and faculty. And Marika should be now at Giorgio and we will see if... Yes, I think that Giorgio is ready. Giorgio, right? Yeah. Yes, okay. So we are ready. Bringing in Zoom, okay, great. We'll wait for his screen to show up then. I'm just looking at the various participants who are following us. I see my colleague Scott Schlingen from Academic Initiatives Abroad, who will be presenting during the week, early next week. I see Jan Gudain, archaeologist, following us. And I don't yet see Giorgio Verdiani, who will be speaking to us from the forum right now. I see we even have a participant, Jasmine Cloud in California in the middle of the night. Marika, why don't you show us the situation there? Since yes. You're, you're on the ground. Is Jimmy? I see. <laughs> yeah. I did. And, and is Giorgio there trying to connect? <laughs> He is like two meters uh, nearby me, but on a, in a very small room. Okay. So, <laughs> maybe, we anyway, just, maybe we should yeah. just hear Giorgio present on your phone since yeah. you are connected. Tom, if we're not ready with Giorgio, why don't we move on to the next one while he is preparing? Yeah. 
Um, otherwise, Marika, if, if you're next to Giorgio, could you just let him present on your phone? He doesn't have any slides. Um, no, but apparently he was trying to, to do something different. So um, this is not an option. <laughs> it seems this uh, is not okay. Good. Shall we come back okay. to him then? Just ask Giorgio if he's ready in 30 seconds, or if not, we will hear from Michele and then Giorgio. Otherwise, I will make the call. I think we'll come back to Giorgio. So, Michele Trimarchi, I'm going to make the introductions to Michele Trimarchi, who is our economist. So we're shifting now from archaeology and architecture to cultural economy. And one reason being that Michele Trimarchi has recently completed a strategic plan for the Park of the Forum and Colosseum. Michele studied, studied law and economics and music. He teaches economy of culture at the University of Bologna and other institutions, also in Calabria. He works on design strategies um, for art, culture, by addressing the fundamental issues outside of conventional formats. He believes in intergenerational synergies. He is convinced that culture, like all other useless things, is indispensable. Michele is passionate about opera. He listens to and sings Mozart, he reads Jane Austen, and Tommaso di Lampedusa, since Michele Trimarchi is a Sicilian. So Michele, on. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everybody. Be patient. I'm an economist, so maybe I will be out of the track you can imagine. I try and share my um, desktop, which is not ever granted, but it could work. Do you see anything like a slide? Yeah, apparently. Yes. Yes, it's coming yeah. up now. That's good news. And try and uh, have a full screen. Mm -hmm. um, blah, blah, blah. Of course not. But tutto schermo. Uh, modalità tutto schermo. Tutto schermo ci arrivo. No, no. Grazie. <laughs> no, no, no. Just go down. No, sulla sinistra, il menu a sinistra dove stavi prima. Giù, giù, giù. Ah, tutto scusami. Schermo. Okay, okay. Grazie. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I told you, be patient. Okay. Now, the point is, first of all, normally when anybody has a project, I mean, architect, archaeologist, even economists, normally their mood is simply, they go um, addressing their counterpart, say, uh, administrator, public administrator, somebody, somebody who could fund the project, and says something like, please like my project and give me money. I am suggesting you should invert 180 degree this perspective because normally if you put somebody in the position of deciding about you, they of course feel a judge. And so they say, do I like it or not? And the pity is, A, technicalities of your project don't come ever on the table because it's an instinctive, intuitive kind of um, choice. B, uh, you give the power to decide. And the, the third, um, shortcoming of this is that normally you say, I like it more, I give you more. So you, even the amount of money you get, can receive is depending on what you, how much you have been liked or not. So the question is, we should demonstrate what is the value of heritage, to be more precise, what is the unf unfungible value of heritage? Something like, we may generate flows of benefits that nobody else can generate, which is exactly the contrary about contrary to what we normally do, which is imitating the manufacturing sector. The question is exactly, we are in some way stuck in a dimensional view. This is, of course, the, po the place where you associate culture, tourism, money. The idea is simply a very stupid statement, my heritage is bigger than yours, which is exactly the, the common place in Italy we normally say, I mean, also in the institutional debate, they say and write something like we owe, uh, we own 75%, two thirds, I mean, something always more than 50% of the word heritage. Now, the point is, A, you can't measure it, of course. Word heritage is made of a myriad of things. You can't have any uni unique measure, unique metric, so you can't. And in any case, even if it was true, what's the problem? Maybe it gives us a lot of responsibility. So the point is, this dimensional view is really, really stupid. And it brings us to many, many uh, wrong views. If you imagine, even, in, even recently, the ministry proposed during lockdown, why don't we organize something like a Netflix of culture, which is simply ridiculous. Even 
the evocation of Netflix is just really not really intelligent. And in any case, the point is not to simulate what you do in other areas, uh, which is movies, TV series, etc. Maybe the question is, what can we do naturally, being consistent with our content, our message, etc. Right. So this is the first point. Point. We don't need to say, hey, look, people, we also generate money because what we generate is more, is wider, is deeper, and is more important than money. And I'm, I'm not speaking about ethical values because, of course, that's another, the, the opposite, that's another contradiction. On one hand, we try and imitate the industry. On the other hand, we say we generate ethical values. This is not true. Evidence, make the blacklist of the people you hate and you would like to kill. I have a long list of it who actually love movies, archaeology, museums, read novels, etc. I have a long list of people I really would kill, would simply stamp on a wall, but they are cultural people. So culture doesn't rescue my soul and doesn't transform me into another person. I'm what I am, uh, fortunately. So, I mean, I would be relaxed about this. Uh, we don't need to give us so much ritual, you know, uh, priest-like kind of attitude. So the question is, when people come to Venice, the discussion is normally they come for culture. The evidence is solely contrary. A, only 6% of visitors, when I'm speaking about a million of people, visit a museum. They only go to Palazzo Lucare, which is not really a museum because it's history of Venice. It's like uh, crossing Rialto Bridge. So it, it's a different place. Maybe they have exhibitions there, but it's just blockbuster events. So the systematic figures about people visiting a museum in Venice is 6% out of 100. B, if you consider what people do buy in Venice, it's like, I mean, you can do, it's more or less the same in Colosseum. So 90% of visitors of the Colosseum don't even know what it is and don't even care about this. They only are obsessed about selfing themselves in the Colosseum, showing off with their relatives saying, so look, ignorant people, you were at home and I've been in the Colosseum, so I'm becoming something, somebody different, which is totally stupid. Um, tourists in Venice don't buy culture. Uh, as, um, uh, imaginary, I mean, a real tour, an average tourist in Venice normally uh, is taken in a gondola, which is not the boat used by Venice people, which is a sandalo, which is totally different. The gondola is a ritual, uh, simply like a celebration, so fake, more or less fake uh, boat. Um, the, the, the sailor is um, dressed up like a French sailor with a striped t-shirt and a hat, which is something French sailors in our, you know, comics view is in some way uh, oleographically uh, pictured. And uh, the sailor sings Oso Le Mio when he brings you around the canals in Venice, which is not a, exactly a Venetian song. And you eat pizza at the end of the day. So you do nothing Venetian, not even culture, not even praxis, not even, uh, you buy an atmosphere. You buy exactly what you make yourself there. So an atmosphere. So in such a way, you can speak about any uh, flow of benefits um, generate, being generated by culture. So the question is, what is the impact of culture? Because the dilemma is the economic impact of culture. There are a lot of studies of research, uh, paid research, where you say uh, people living, I mean, uh, sleeping in hotels, eating at restaurants, uh, paying for taxes, et cetera, are generating a flow of benefits. Okay, right. But every production, even many legal activities, not only illegal ones, generate a lot of money. I mean, even whatever small shopping mall generates 10 times the uh, outflow of culture. So I wouldn't care about this. The point is that normally we can't associate the physical presence of people in a museum with the outcome that they may generate. Very often I am in a town, maybe for business, for the university, for whatever, for friendship, and then I happen to visit a museum. It's not generated strictly by this. Parenthesis, of course, uh, I mean, out of this bad news, there is a good news. Uh, if we, like in industrial world, um, focus upon the short-term effect of culture, then we are losing our challenge because we are just poorer, less systematic than other many other areas of action of production of trade etc if we look at the long-term perspective maybe we should discover we could discover a lot of good news for example sweden is the country normally awarded with the best uh, uh, industrial innovation um, 
rank in the world. So every, every year they publish this in, uh, industrial innovation ranking and Sweden, Finland are normally at the first um, places. Which implies, for example, that we, if we observe Sweden, we discover that Sweden is the country where the highest per proportion of children play an instrument when they are at school. I mean, in a material way. So they prepare themselves, they, I mean, in some way, are normally alphabetized in improvising, creating, listening, uh, establishing a dialogue. When they are 40 years old and they are architects, engineers, etc., they innovate. So a long-term impact of culture is unique. It's like uh, art cities in the Renaissance, etc., which is something we should focus upon and we normally don't do. So what we can do, the question is not how much culture my heritage is bigger than yours, but simply what are the specific features of the cultural heritage in one place? This is not the war among countries. The, normally Italy is so chauvinist in this, they say normally everybody says Italy is the best culture, of the, this is simply stupid. I would say differently, what are the specific features, something, the features you can find only in Italy, not because we are winning any battle, but simply because in other countries, Culture is um, located, established, featured, blah, blah, in many other ways. In Italy, we have some specific specificities. For example, A, there is a stratification of styles and culture. You walk for 10 kilometers, I mean, in Rome, even one kilometer, and you, in some way, cross many different layers of cultural civilization, which implies you are in a palimpsest where the readability of heritage is in some way uh, cross-generated, cross-justified, cross-interpreted through the rest of heritage, which is something we do only in Italy, just because, I mean, only, or in some way more intensively in Italy, just simply because we have been more conquered than other uh, places. So it's not a merit and it's not good or bad news. It's simply that many other countries conquered Italy through time, uh, in some way also um, uh, revolving among each other. Uh, I mean, I come from Sicily, we have also, we have also Arabic domination. So you find signs from many, uh, I mean, how much this multiple layer heritage is visible? Zero. So that's the first responsibility we should take, which is we need to offer an interpretation which is stratified. Even in the Roman Forum, we have many places where you have Roman temples and churches, etc. Maybe this could be made evident not necessarily only for technicians i think everybody could understand i mean if i like it everybody could like it if i understand it everybody can understand it the idea of going out of this idea that only us can understand this kind of uh, technical uh, historical blah blah elements i think everybody could of course slowly gradually but they could the second element is that Cultural heritage in Italy is urban heritage, more than other places. Of course, we may have some castle in the countryside, but I mean, the real, the average, the norm of cultural heritage is its urban setting, which implies that you have two flows of uh, interpretational benefits. On one hand, you understand the town, given the location, the respective location of cultural heritage, just to be elementary, as I can understand it, for example, the relationship, the, the relationship between powers of church and civic power, which is something you can read in every town. You have the parish church or the cathedral and the town hall, and you understand a lot of things in such a kind of, you know, map. Uh, on the other hand, the urban texture gives value to um, cultural heritage depending on the location it normally has in some place because they have a symbolic meaning they have a functional meaning both things i mean the I, i'm telling you you know of course but I, I just understand this hearing but imagine rome of sixtus uh, the fifth which is redesigned uh, according to the idea that pilgrims should be carried precisely from one obelisk to the other and they should not be distracted to any kind of carnal sin that could in some way spoil their money. Otherwise, with this obelisk trail, the, it was granting the church that they would give money to the church. So it is a functional, symbolic, historical, cultural kind of 
readability. Normally in Rome, nobody reads the shape of the town or that part of the town in terms of a trail between. <laughs> Can I go on? Third element, I'm, I'm, I'm closing, I'm about to the end. Uh, the third element is that Italy is a theatrical place, not just because it is ridiculous, which is a, a true thing, but because, I mean, not only we have many monumental theaters, but also urban texture is theatrical. Imagine Piazza San Pignazio in Rome, where I, when, when I saw it for the first time, and every time I go there, I imagine an opera being performed there. My idea is Così von Tutte by Mozart, but certainly that's a, so it was built to be a theater. And we have, of course, due to uh, weather, uh, attitudes, uh, culture, etc. Normally, we are uh, we tend to be theatrical also in our um, use of urban spaces. This could imply a readability. And parenthesis after the virus, we should consider how much we could, um, in some way, extract deposits from museum, deposits from theaters, etc., and rearrange the the urban location of culture, of cultural heritage, even intangible heritage, not necessarily in blocked, locked places like museum. A museum, which was in some, something uh, which was generated at the end of the 18th century, maybe exhausted its original function, and we should ask ourselves what can be a museum in the future. And still nobody in the establishment considers this. They won't sim simply perpetuate eternally the all time 19th century museums. So if this is so, we may say maybe we could reconstruct, and this is the constructive part of my presentation, which is exactly what are the values we generate? So dear mayor, dear minister, dear funder, even a company funding me, what is the value I only may generate? First of all, the sense of belonging and the identity of the place which is in, in economics, we define it social capital, which is the responsibility of members of a community towards that community. I mean, for example, just to be simple, I pay taxes. I don't evade if I am endowed with a sufficient social capital, which implies this is something a shopping mall doesn't generate. Second, the quality of urban life, which still implies a responsibility. For example, close to a museum or a theater, are we sure? we can obtain something like a pedestrian area, green area, we can have night socialization, which is safety, for example. So the presence of, we don't have certainly this in the case of a shopping mall. So even uh, in this layer of flaws of benefits we may generate, quality of urban life is something that culture generates and no other activity can do at the same, with the same intensiveness, with the same, uh, you know, uh, even systematicity. Allocation of resources, it absorbs professions that were otherwise would be, con uh, would be in some way compelled to go away, change areas. I am an archeologist and compelled to work in a post office, which is not bad news, I mean, it's not exactly what I wanted. Uh, so the idea of having cultural action implies the po possibility to give, uh, uh, in some way to absorb, to give an outcome to human resources that otherwise would abandon the place or abandon the area. Uh, social inclusion is something you don't get in the shopping malls, which is something uh, related to the sharing nature of culture. Whatever you do in culture, from a movie to archaeology to museums to theater, you share it with unknown people. You don't do it in a shopping mall, which is social inclusion. This gives sit full citizenship not only to migrants, new citizens, but also to the elderly and to children, which are normally kept aside from the mainstream society. And even more important, what we may define creative atmosphere, which is corresponding to what in the 30s of the 20th century, they used to define industrial atmosphere. Italy is made of cultural districts, producing ceramics, uh, textile, etc. Uh, if you put uh, start an activity with archaeology, contemporary art, whatever it is, the many areas of culture, in a place you generate a creative atmosphere, you attract other people. And in, in a medium term uh, horizon, they will come and locate themselves in the town, which will imply in some way benefits that you would, it's like Berlin, you know, just last story, it's 
10 seconds. In the 60s, Berlin was abandoned because it was isolated in the East Germany area. And the only clever idea the government had was to exempt people from the military service, which is 16, 18 years old people were exempted from the military service just locating their residence in Berlin, which implied many pacifist, anarchist, crazy people, whatever it is, but also creative artists went to live to, um, uh, to Berlin because they simply wanted to spare two years in, in the army or in the navy. And when they became 40 years old, we were in the 80s and they reshaped Berlin. So that's why Berlin became in the 80s the real factory uh, of creative activities. And many architects were there because this was exactly the outflow, the, the outcome of people locating themselves, falling in love with the town where they were, simply because they were attracted there by a simple, stupid exemption, I mean, intelligent exemption from the military service. So, I mean, we can get a lot of benefits. The only thing is that we need a responsibility. So to be happy as cultural managers, we need action. We need responsibility. We can't imagine that things happen mechanically. This is quite important because what happens now, for example, in the Colosseum, is they simply open the gates and people come, and that's totally mechanical, and they don't manage it, which is bad news in some way. Finished. Thank you very much, Professor. Now, Uh, now we'll move on to Giorgio Vardiani's presentation, uh, who, we, uh, who Tom Rankin already introduced. Uh, Professor Vardiani, are you there? Are you ready to present? Yes. Welcome everybody, good morning. Do you see me? Yes, you see yes. me? Yes. <laughs> and uh, right now we are uh, in the area uh, Gristina and uh, we are together with uh, Elenia and Emilia, and uh, uh, is a little bit uh, in the inside right now. So I don't know the connect how good is the connection in between the walls. But uh, obviously, what we are doing is the survey of the area, and right now we are entered in these rooms that are. Uh, quite small, quite dark. And here we have the laser scan unit that we go we use right now. And the tools we are using is exactly this one. So we are using a 3D laser scan unit, which is a quite a good one. This is a phase shift scanner. It allows you to take the measurement of Everything is around you from a very close distance up to 360 meters of distance with an accuracy that right now allows you to get one point each centimeter at 10 meters of distance, which means a denser point cloud in the nearby and then little by little a more sparse. Obviously, I can create more dense grids that allow me to have more details at distance, obviously. But right now, in this narrow space, this is more than enough. Here, there is, uh, obviously, a space that you see as a vault, partially fallen, and the walls, and also a lot of items around that are a little bit in the middle because of the wall. But it's not a problem because we are moving around and uh, avoiding the main occlusion in trying to create a complete map of everything. Uh, the scanner has a series of settings and you may notice that this tool has a mirror, this one, that is rotating, and an emitter of the laser that is this one. In this way, the laser beam reach the, the mirror is reflected all around. And then when uh, the signal is reflected back, the measurement uh, allows to get the distance using the variation in the phase of the light beam. Uh, 
obviously this scanner rotate rotate automatically and if we go now to set it up you will see that i have first of all a bubble uh, electronic bubble level here sorry here it is and here i can set it to zero so i have a perfect horizontal plane for all the area of the scan then i go back to the settings and i can regulate set up the resolution the quality of this the final quality of the scan and i can set up sorry maybe i uh, am afraid that it's a little overexposed let's try in this way no it's keeping the uh the exposure overall i go setting and then when i have regulated the density and the quality i go pressing start and the scanner move and start is working in this way so rotate quite fast and get the measurement of everything we don't see the laser beam because it is in the near infrared uh, range of the light so in this way it's not possible to have a visible light beam and but this allows also to have a class one scanner that can be used also in between the people without the risk of damaging uh, the, um, the tissue, the skin, the eyes, and so on. So you can use it uh, without any trouble in any environment, even when there is a bunch of people. So inside a museum, in a supermarket, in a railway station, and so on. But obviously, yeah, right now we are just uh, the three, I might say, the four of us working year around and the survey is going on a little by little because any every time that the one scan is finished i move the scanner to the following position and then this evening we will put all the scan together and remove everything in a single point cloud the single point cloud will allow us to have a map of all the geometries and the shapes of the things in this area even in the very dark rooms uh, even in the uh, very tall walls uh, and so on so you will have a map a 3d map of everything so each scan take about one minute and an half it is possible to take even the picture in some of the uh, scans will be recolored using the picture taken by the scanner which is a uh, quite good um, looking of the scan but is uh, they are in the end not that useful for the plan view for the section but can be an enrichment and may support the photogrammetry in fact at the same time while the scanning goes on there is the other operator andrea that is taking care about the photogrammetry and so we'll do marica and elenia and emilia in the uh, in these days and uh, the set of feature will be uh planned to cover well and to give you a very high level of details from all the walls and the main element of the uh archaeological site so it will be possible to plan with uh, accuracy uh, and intervention and it will be possible to have also element for the graphic aspects of your work uh, starting from friday evening friday night uh, the data will be available in the shared uh, drive in various folders so wait for friday night or saturday morning go and take a look and you will be able to download the recap format the autodesk recap format of the wall point cloud this uh, is uh, quite a universal solution because you can download the recap uh, program from Autodesk as a student, uh, you have a three years free license, and you can directly use inside uh, um, Autodesk AutoCAD, inside Autodesk Revit, and inside Autodesk uh, 3D Max. 
and uh, this solution is uh, quite practical because with the uh, same file you can access from different programs and manage your project. Obviously, the most and more common solution is to use this data inside AutoCAD just to prepare your QD drawings and so on. The tools to be used are very simple because it's all a matter of planning the plans and most of the commands are the AutoCAD commands. So you don't need a data that is a, a solution that are far from the common use of the program. You just have to understand the use of cut planes, of sections uh, to cut out the, the parts that uh, you need to see better. The final data will be optimized, but will be in the end mm, uh, quite a huge file, huge file because the, I suppose we will be around 40 gigabytes of data at the end of the second day. But uh, we will provide also uh, in the following day, about uh, on Saturday, we will provide a um, strongly reduced uh, point cloud with a minimal number of points, just uh, what is needed for the user at a scale representation. Uh, and uh, this will be available from Saturday in the evening, probably in the same folder. Uh, so, yeah, obviously, while talking, the scan is finished. So, I pass the, the camera to Vilenia so she can follow us in the operation. Hi, everyone. I'll follow you, Giorgio, through the moving on the laser scanner. So, so here it is. And we go in the darkness right now because we want to have the scan of this part in the inside which is extremely dark and there is, there is a room inside and this position all of us to have data there the total darkness is not a problem because the laser beam has all the light it needs for the scan just for you because you are following the operations i will set up the uh, pictures so it will take pictures of the scanning, and this will produce the use of smart light. In fact, the scanner in this side has the camera, and there's a four LED lighting, a LED lighting system that allows us to have a specific light. So when right now I pass the scan to uh, Emilia. And moving this in the dark. So I think that there will be no such of a tripod to manage it better inside the room. There are various plants growing around the area that are a little bit aggressive, I may say. Because this part now, let's see. Professor, your connection is, seems to be freezing, so maybe not to go in wherever you're going at the moment. Yes, and I, I think that we probably shouldn't be going into that back room also for this phase of, of the measurement, if Giorgio hears us. I'm going to, I'm going to um, interrupt Giorgio with, with great apologies, but um, for, for two reasons, we're losing his audio and um, he is moving into an area which we're um, really not supposed to be entering um, at this moment. Do you hear me, Giorgio? So, uh, and we also have various other speakers who we're bringing in. Is, um, we have been able to make connection with Professor Franciosini and if he, is, um, if he has joined the Zoom, we'd be happy to introduce him. Uh, last that I noticed, um, 
Professor Francesini was not yet in the Zoom, and so we may pass um, ahead. Simge, would you like to sure. move on to um, Professor Carpensano, who I've already introduced, and I think we'll be hearing from Horacio Carpensano with his presentation. Sorry for this. Yeah, no, it may be out of order. Well, it doesn't matter. We've already introduced Orazio Carpensano as a professor of architecture and director of the Department of Architecture and Design at Sapienza University. Orazio, are you with us and ready to bring up your presentation? Yes. Wonderful. And Orazio is going to be speaking. He's going to be doing his presentation in Italian. I will be um, simultaneously translating a few sentences at a time. So quite a loose translation. So I'm going to keep my audio on and off. Okay, okay. Prego, go ahead, share your Hello. screen. As agreed with Tom Medale, whom I thank, I will speak in Italian, thanking uh, advance uh, of the leave uh, or uh, deferred translation for uh, our foreign uh, friends and colleagues. Uh, I have listened uh, carefully to the previous speeches and I promise to treasure them for my research. Meanwhile, uh, as you will hear, my contribution has a more general character. One, uh, the one hand, uh, uh, I think it, uh, it is necessary to redefine the concept of ruin as an aesthetic and uh, design category. On the other hand, uh, I will show a project that uh, has uh, the ambition uh, to be in continuity with the work of Raffaele Panella uh, on the holes uh, to collect the last design contribution of the Adriatic uh, 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 Academy, Academy Adrianea consultation and the research carried uh, out in my department by the group coordinated by Lucio Altarelli on the thermal bath of Caracalla to get uh, to the preliminary news of the research still in progress and coordinated by me and uh, Filippo Lambertucci on uh, the widespread museum of the Colosseum, of which we are preparing the press in two volumes, uh, hopefully in uh, bookstores uh, in the spring of uh, next year, uh, if the COVID died. Okay. Allora, a questo punto uh, direi... You're going to share your screen? Are you sharing some uh, images, si, Orazio? Si, si, si. We uh, don't see them yet. Okay. I'll let you know when we see your screen. Wait. Uh, Allora, sto, sto cercando di, di condividere lo schermo, ho qualche difficoltà in questo yeah. punto, ma share, share arrivo, okay. arrivo, arrivo. Ok, it's coming up now, we can see your full screen and just open up your presentation file. Ok, and if you just full screen that, perfect. Go ahead. Bye. Uh, no. Uh, si, vede, si vede tutto. No. Scusa, mi io dovrei... No, 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 qui. Devi avanzare, un attimo, però. Scusa un attimo, posso avere anche una... Eh? Noi lo vediamo, Orazio, basta che sul tuo PowerPoint mandi avanti i slide. Noi le vediamo. Eh, io pensavo di poter farle... Ok, benissimo. <ride> sì, sì. Allora, no, eh, diciamo, la prima, la prima cosa che voglio dire... La prima cosa che voglio dire riguarda, eh, come ho anticipato... 
il concetto di, eh, di rovina, perché credo che c'è bisogno di mettere a punto una dimensione teorica di questo concetto, eh, soprattutto oggi, eh, che eh, abbiamo a che fare con questo grande peso che la storia ci ha lasciato e che naturalmente ci, ci mette in grave difficoltà eh, nel portare avanti ehm, ehm, con dei progetti che sappiano eh, attualizzarla. Ok, let me, let me take it from there for that first notion. Um, he's addressing the concept of ruin that we have to put in a theoretical perspective, theoretical context, and consider the enormous weight of history which we have, which makes it challenging for us to consider how to move forward into the future. Okay. Allora, eh, la rovina rappresenta innanzitutto il futuro di tutte le cose e, ed esiste perché esiste il suo paesaggio. E, esiste perché esiste il luogo circostante in cui essa è presente. Eh, questo è il primo concetto che voglio mettere in evidenza. Ok, faccio uno, un concetto alla volta. So, the, the first concept is the ruin which represents the future of everything in its landscape, in its context. Uh, the ruin has to be considered in its place. Okay. La, la rovina o le rovine sono simboli tangibili e sono anche dei piccoli pezzi di storia, certe volte anche grandi pezzi di storia, in sospensione. Che yeah, vivono... Ruins are tangible symbols. There are pieces of history, small and large pieces of you know, history with substance. E, e loro rappresentano in qualche modo un paesaggio eroico dove il tempo eh, in qualche modo è sconfitto. They represent a kind of heroic uh, landscape in which time has been overcome. Ci tengo a dire anche un'altra cosa eh, che molto spesso viene fraintesa. La rovina non è il non finito e non è il frammento. Eh, non ci può indurre solo al compiacimento per la sua discontinuità o per la sua incoerenza. Yeah, the ruin isn't just, it, it isn't a non-finished piece. It's not just a fragment. And it can't make us... Um, complacent in the observation of it as a beautiful item. La, la rovina è semmai un enigma e in qualche modo qualcosa che porta a un pathos perché è un corpo in tensione tra la forma e l'antiforma, tra il tragico e il romantico, eh, tra ehm, eh, qualcosa di... Eh, isolato, ma qualcosa che cerca anche delle relazioni eh, formali, qualcosa più da toccare che da osservare. Ok, hey, so the, for, the ruin is more of an enigma. It gives us a sense of pathos. It's, uh, it's a dialect between form and non-form, intention, between the tragic and the romantic, between uh, isolated elements, and a kind of formal relationship between elements. Eh, molto bella la espressione che Marco Gé usa eh, quando eh, scrive eh, della rovina in, eh, nel suo saggio Rovine e Macerie. Lui scrive una cosa che, eh, che più o meno eh, eh, recita così. Mentre tutto concorre a farci credere che la storia sia finita e che il mondo sia uno spettacolo nel quale quella fine viene rappresentata, abbiamo bisogno di ritrovare il tempo per credere nella storia. Questa potrebbe essere oggi la vocazione pedagogica delle rovine. 
Okay, I, I should be quoting from Marco J's uh, quote, and I was just looking for it, but didn't find it. But uh, from his book, uh, uh, Ruins and Macerie, um, Ruins and the Ruined, um, which talks about the ruin finding its place in time. Questa immagine è un'immagine che presento molto volentieri ed è il frontespizio del terzo libro di del trattato di Sebastiano Serlio, nel quale, diciamo, campeggia una scritta sotto il cartiglio che dice Roma quanta fuit ipsa ruina docet. E di questo frontespizio, eh, come di altri frontespizi, ho fatto degli studi quelli a destra che vedete sono la restituzione di due miei disegni, naturalmente eh, inventati. Uno, eh, diciamo, che cerca di restituire in pianta il, la sequenza dei resti che stanno dietro quella, eh, quella sorta di eh, portale eh, eh, quadripartito che potrebbe anche alludere in qualche modo a una, a una delle campate del Colosseo, con un obelisco che si vede in fondo. E poi c'è una controprospettiva. Eh, these two, sono... let, let me just point out these uh, three images that Orazio Carpenzano is showing us. It's the, the cover piece of Serlio's um, third treatise, um, which quotes Roma quanto fut, uh, the Dolce, I can't quite read it, but Rome um, teaches with what it is. And uh, then one of um, Orazio's drawings, which attempts a reconstruction in plan and section of the image of the, the arches, which could be, for example, an arch from a piece of the Colosseum. Um, and then it's unfolded in a perspective vision, which of course is based on a, a fantasy and invention. Eh, questo per dire anche che le macerie accumulate dalla storia, se noi le mettiamo in confronto, per esempio le macerie della storia recente e le rovine del passato, non si assomigliano ovviamente, perché vi è un, un grande scarto fra il tempo storico della distruzione, che quindi rivela la follia della storia, è il tempo puro, il tempo in rovina, le rovine del tempo che ha perduto la storia o che la storia ha perduto. So if we put in comparison ruins, modern ruins and ruins of the past, they don't speak to us in the same way because the ruins speak to us about the time that has passed. Allora, adesso proseguiamo con, eh, diciamo, un'altra immagine che è quella della copertina del libro che Raffaella Panella eh, pubblicò poco prima eh, di andarsene che è il frutto di una ricerca quasi trentennale sui fori di Roma. E il titolo del libro è Roma, la città dei fori, ed è un libro nel quale ci sono molti contributi. Questo è stato una delle grandi vocazioni del mio maestro, quello di costruire delle comunità scientifiche interdisciplinari che lavorassero attorno a un unico problema, e per cercare di proiettare dentro la dimensione di questo problema, di questo tema, diverse prospettive dalle diverse angolazioni disciplinari che lui chiamava a concorrere per cercare di capire il fenomeno e poi eventualmente progettarlo. Ok, so now we're looking at the cover of the book by Raffaele Panella, who was Professor Carpenzano's mentor. Um, Panella worked for 30 years, over 30 years, and on the question of the forum, and he was able to bring together various different disciplines and to create um, strategic teamwork, um, which was one of his great um, blessings. In questa seconda diapositiva si vede molto okay. bene il... il... Tor torna in full screen, però, perché sei uscito da scusa, full scusa, screen. Scusa, scusa, scusa. In questa seconda okay, si, va, si vede molto bene diciamo, l'ambito della ricerca e soprattutto si vede eh, il cuore, la polpa di questo centro archeologico monumentale eh, che eh, da questa visione eh, appare subito per quello che è, cioè una, un territorio eh, diciamo, eh, incapsulato all'interno della città moderna eh, dal quale sono state ovviamente cancellate dei brani eh, di un palinsesto che si era accumulato nel tempo 
dopo la fine dell'impero e il riemergere gradualmente di questa città sepolta eh, che ha, ha, ha portato non pochi problemi, eh, diciamo... Yeah, let, let me interrupt you here or I'll lose it. Um, the image that we're looking at here is an overview of the archaeological center, the area of the forum, which is, as you can see, encapsulated in the modern city, um, where parts of it have been erased and replaced, where we, we really reveal the palimpsest which the, the forum has left us. Okay. Bye -bye. Uh, naturalmente è chiaro che il, il problema che ci siamo posti dal punto di vista della, uh, delle categorie che in qualche modo attiva un progetto che vuole in qualche modo guardare alla, uh, al progetto di sistemazione, all'idea di sistemazione di quest'area, uh, sono molto difficili da affrontare. La prima di tutte è quella che eh, dovrebbe tendere a un'integrazione di questo palinzesto con la città viva, quindi della città morta con la città viva. Ok, quindi so the, the challenge here is how the living city and the city of ruins, the dead city, how they can be integrated. Um, and this image here, the, the title uh, takes advantage of the pun in Italian, cancellare, which means to erase but also it means fencing to keep out. Molti di questi di queste aree archeologiche sono cancellate nel doppio significato del termine, cioè escluse alla vista e oppure con dei cancelli davanti. E lo vediamo non solo nell'area archeologica centrale, ma anche un po' in tutte le aree archeologiche e soprattutto in quello che Aimonino definiva i buchi all'interno della città. Wait, wait. Okay, so what Carlo Arminian called uh, holes in the middle of the city, areas which have been either erased, so cancellati in both senses of the word, meaning to hide from view, to erase, or to prohibit access to. Uh, naturalmente è chiaro che l'idea uh, di lavorare per grandi recinti, come si vede in queste immagini, del progetto che Raffaella Panella elaborò per i fori e, si, e, e qui c'è un suggerimento implicito ma anche abbastanza esplicito nella forma che è quella di creare attraverso questi grandi recinti dei, dei, dei sistemi di relazione, relazione fisica, relazione visiva tra i resti, cercando di lavorare su queste, su queste quote e del raccordo tra queste quote per consentire ai visitatori non solo di vedere e di osservare come da un acquario o come da una uh, eh, l'archeologia come se fosse l'animale di uno zoo ma anche di potersi avvicinare di toccarlo e di sperimentarla la dimensione che emerge dallo scavo ok so these projects that we see here which are the products of Raffaele Panella's long work in the forum Um, e, e, Orazio, lascia le, le immagini di prima mentre parlo. Sì. We're going to go back to the image that's here that we're looking at where Panella worked um, on a kind of implicit but also explicit suggestion of the idea of fencing, of um, boundaries, which are physical boundaries. Um, a boundary also makes a connection. So physical boundaries and connections, visible boundaries and connections um, to avoid really this concept that the visitor is looking at the forum as if uh, looking at an aquarium or animals in the zoo. Okay, vai avanti. Questo tema del, di andare oltre il recinto per una percezione diretta è un tema importantissimo per l'archeologia, che però anche lo deve coniugare con il problema della protezione e quindi con il problema di una, uh, diciamo, dell'uso eh, che si fa eh, di, un, di uno scavo archeologico nel momento in cui si consente alle persone di poterci entrare, di poterlo in qualche modo vivere. Questo è lo scavo della Meta Sudans prodotto dalla sorella di Raffaele Panella, Clementina Panella, una grande archeologa che ha lavorato per molti anni eh, ai piedi dell'arco di Costantino e oggi questo scavo non è più visibile ma è, è interessante il, il modo in cui attraverso questo 
progetto stratigrafico furono rintracciate più mete all'interno dello stesso punto. Mm -hmm. we're, we're looking here, let me say here, we're looking at the Meta Sudans, which is no longer visible like this. This was an excavation that uh, the sister of Rafael Panella, uh, Tina Panella, Clementina Panella, worked on for years. And it's uh, interesting for the stratigraphic exploration in which they found that there was not just one meta, there were several of them. And it's also interesting in this context because it, it focuses on the question of regime, the boundaries of fences which separate, they have to provide safety for the site, they have to protect the site, but they also have to allow viewing of the site. Capite bene che se uno dovesse in qualche modo valorizzare eh, questa, um, questo scavo, questa rovina, dovrebbe porsi il problema di eh, che cosa mettere in evidenza e quante mete dovrebbero concorrere al racconto di questa restituzione. Eh, sarebbe molto affascinante, ma in questo momento è quasi impossibile poterlo praticare. Tanto è vero che per, eh, sono finiti... Eh, una volta raggiunti alcuni piccoli scopi di questo scavo, poi si è dovuto interrare perché non c'erano i soldi per restituire in qualche modo il, quello, quello che lo scavo aveva, aveva eh, lasciato in termini di informazione, eventualmente poi poterle pubblicare e comunicare al pubblico. So, so in this site it's interesting to, to con contemplate what would happen if we were able to um make visible to um increase our knowledge to valorize the um different levels and then the question would be which level do you want to show is it possible to uh, make visible all of these different levels of course in this case once they finished the excavation the funds were finished and the entire project was uh, reburied un, un altro grande tema eh, dal punto di vista della, della chiamiamola così, della, delle categorie che eh, il progetto introduce eh, eh, nel manipolare eh, diciamo, la, la dimensione archeologica e quindi anche la dimensione storica in qualche modo è quello della natura. La natura che molto spesso è letta come un ambiente ideale dove isolare, dove confinare, dove eh, diciamo inserire un'immagine di queste rovine che in qualche modo resta alienata o in qualche modo separata dalla città viva. Eh, questo è uno scenario che piace molto, è piaciuto molto anche ai grandi viaggiatori e, ed è in qualche, a che fare con una dimensione romantica, eh, delle volte anche un po' manierata, eh, oserei dire certe volte stucchevole, eh, del modo di poter vedere eh, eh, o, o godere o, o riosservare la rovina nel so paesaggio another, So another grand theme, a great theme of ruins is that of nature, and nature proposed as a kind of ideal setting within which to isolate the image of the ruin. This is especially attractive to travelers on the grand tour. It's a very romantic vision, and sometimes it can be a kind of a kitsch vision. Eh, questa diciamo, è una visione del, del, di uno del, diciamo, dei, co dei concorrenti all'ultima consultazione dell'Accademia Adrianea che guarda eh, la natura appunto come un ambiente ideale da eh, rigenerare in qualche modo lungo il versante che separa la via dei fori dalla, 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 dal foro romano e quindi con un'immagine schiacciata sulla Basilica di Massenzo e sul Colosseo, eh, nella quale non vediamo niente eh, dal punto di vista della ricostruzione possibile degli scavi, ma anzi c'è eh, a questo punto una sorta di eh, avanzata della natura che eh, appunto con questi personaggi anche romantici, ri, riassorbe completamente, eh, anche se volete, il portato, lo sforzo scientifico dello scavo archeologico e lo porta in una dimensione al quale lui stesso vorrebbe rimanere sostanzialmente estraneo. So in this entry, which was one of the entries for the um, Hadrianic um, Academy uh, Piranesi Prize, 
we see um, an approach to the area along Via Fora Imperiale between the Roman Forum and the Basilica of Maxentio, which um, doesn't attempt at all to reconstruct scientifically what is missing in the palimpsest. In fact, it, it in fact covers it with a kind of romantic nature um, and even so far as inserting romantic sort of historic figures as if the designer himself is um, yearning to go back to an uh, earlier time. Uh, David Chipperfield thinks it, uh, come direbbe il mio amico. <laughs> Questo diciamo invece è un altro gruppo uh, capitanato da, dal mio amico Emanuele Fidone, eh, che eh, introduce eh, all'interno di questo eh, lavoro di pro del progetto sull'archeologia un'altra dimensione che è quella della eh, differenza, se volete, eh, nella continuità o se, o se preferiamo la discontinuità nella continuità. Eh, attraverso un atto che è protettivo e nello stesso tempo anche manifestativo eh, di quelli che sono i due pattern che in qualche modo si incontrano, si devono incontrare, affinché l'uno mantenga l'altro e viceversa, e cioè l'impronta moderna, eh, che in questo caso addirittura diventa viadotto nella parte superiore e nella parte inferiore un sistema di protezione, una specie di portico che usa... Uh, diciamo il parterre archeologico come un luogo uh, uh, da di, uh, dal quale viene esso diciamo uh, diventa l'elemento distributivo e okay uh, let, let me let me take it from there um in in this project which is um Barazio's friend Emanuele Fidoni is the head of the group so another entry for the Perinesi prize and this one focuses more on the kind of discontinuity of continuity, creating this division, this difference between two areas. So above we have actually a vehicular roadway and then below a pedestrian portico. And the portico focuses the attention of the visitor on the physical remains below their feet. Eh, per correttezza devo aggiungere anche l'altro mio amico Bruno Messina che mi mm -hmm. fanno parte del gruppo perché sennò poi mm -hmm. si arrabbiano e hanno ragione. <laughs> Questo qui invece è lo studio Valle che con Franco Purini progetta per i fori imperiali eh, praticamente un viadotto eh, che in qualche modo alleggerisce eh, secondo le intenzioni almeno eh, diciamo nobili di questo intervento l'attuale viadotto esistente nel senso che lo rende sospeso un ponte eh, tra una parte e l'altra dei fori per cercare di istituire una continuità visiva. Ecco, questa dimensione della visibilità è un'altra dimensione importante, perché nell'archeologia noi sappiamo che eh, la sistemazione dovrebbe rendere visibile l'invisibile, oppure meglio dire, dovrebbe aiutare a rendere visibile ciò che normalmente è occultato alla vista. Questa Okay, for me, for me. So this, this project, Studio Valle and Franco Purini, um, it's an attempt to minimize the, the vehicular road, which exists there now, to reduce its impact, reduce its dimension. And this works with a very important theme of the visibility and invisibility, and, and actually rendering visible what is normally masked, or in the case of history, what is... Um, obscured by history. Questo, questo, questo tema è molto importante perché consentire di accedere alla vista e quindi di poter proiettare l'osservazione al di là uh, diciamo delle cose che vedo significa poter riuscire a includere i resti o le singole unità archeologiche all'interno di un contesto che poi uno degli altri obiettivi dell'archeologia moderna, cioè l'archeologia che ha lavorato e che lavora ancora sul tema della stratigrafia e, e anche sul tema dello splateamento che, che consente ai contesti di, eh, diciamo, di allargarsi sui resti per capire quali erano le dimensioni eh, no? eh, all'interno delle quali i singoli fori, i singoli monumenti 
eh, erano inseriti. So is this theme of rendering visible um, that which is not visible, so allowing people to see the ruins measured against their context, it's a very important theme of modern archaeology. It's the theme which allows um, stratigraphy to reveal um, all of what was there and to also allow the visitor to measure it, uh, measure it by movement through it to understand its full extent underneath the modern city. Questo è un altro, diciamo, soluzione, sempre allo stesso problema, ma molto alternativa rispetto alle altre, ed è il, il progetto, diciamo, proposto dal gruppo capitanato dal mio amico Luigi Franciosini, eh, sui fori, in una visione qui che dalla Basilica di Massenzio in primo piano coglie eh, a distanza, diciamo, l'intera via del Corso, eh, arrivando, diciamo, ai confini eh, di Roma, idealmente, passando attraverso Piazza Venezia. Qui non c'è nessuna idea di viadotto. Eh, quello che vediamo in rosso, e quindi tracciato in maniera anche astratta, sono, è la quota archeologica, o per meglio dire le quote archeologiche, e sopra, diciamo, c'è la costruzione ideale di una sorta di grande piastra eh, pedonale che dovrebbe servire a rendere la continuità urbana con la città viva e nello stesso tempo diciamo, a modulare eh, attraverso questo grande sistema tutti gli affacci e i livelli di accessibilità mm -hmm. con la quota archeologica. Ok, so this project pr proposal by Luigi Franciosini and, and group, Uh, it, there's nothing romantic about this, and there's no creation of a viaduct, of a, a vehicular road. Instead, what it emphasizes is uh, kind of expanding through the historic center as far as Via del Corso, uh, the separation between the archaeological layer or layers, which are shown in red down below, and then the construction of a kind of a pedestrian plinth, which sits over this all and connects it all together. E questo è un altro modo di adoperare, cioè la rivelazione di una dimensione altra che diventa compresente con la dimensione della città attuale. Cioè due dimensioni che possono coesistere all'interno di una figura che non solo le contiene, ma che in qualche modo le lascia, lascia che si parlino tra loro. And so, and so what's going on here is it really a dialogue between these two dimensions of the city, the historic city and the modern city, in such a way that they are speaking to one another. And I've been told that we are at the 30-minute moment, so we should try to wrap it up, Orazio. Questa, 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 questa immagine la, la voglio far vedere per far capire a tutti che qui siamo nella sistemazione attuale di Via dei Fori, cioè c'è una sorta di paradosso visivo che mette insieme tutti gli strati, arriva fino addirittura alle cantine, che è il quartiere dei Pantani degli anni all'epoca, diciamo, demoliti per la costruzione del Via dei Fori Imperiali. And, and this image is important because it shows this kind of visible paradox where all of these different layers have been unearthed, including the basements of the Pantani area of, of Rome, which is a relatively modern area, demolished in the 30s. Questa è la grande eh, aporia, contraddizione della cultura archeologica contemporanea e alla quale, diciamo, ne consegue anche uno sgomento da parte dell'architettura che non riesce a eh, manipolare in termini di restituzione, questa eccessiva ossessione per l'analisi. So this is, it, it shows us this kind of contradiction in contemporary modern archaeology, where architects haven't really been able to overcome this obsessive um, tendency to analyze. Troppe cose da far vedere, non si sceglie quali sono le cose importanti da quelle che sono meno importanti e di conseguenza quando io faccio vedere tutto è come se non facessi vedere niente. So there's so many things to see and nobody is willing to choose what is most important. So you end up showing everything which is the same as showing nothing. Questa idea strana di una dimensione democratica 
eh, dell'archeologia in cui ogni cosa, compresa l'ultima superfettazione degli anni venti, diventa importante come eh, le colonne di Apollodoro di, 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 di Damasco e porta a questa eh, assurda incapacità da parte degli archeologi e quindi anche degli architetti di poter gestire un racconto eh, da eh, eh, affidare alle persone che vengono a visitare questi luoghi e con l'idea di, di volerle comprendere. So there's a kind of absurd level of democratization where everything is allowed to be seen so that the person visiting is not able to really understand anything. Mi sa che dobbiamo concludere. Ah, se ti piace, allora eh, io l'avevo detto che questo avrebbe rallentato. Allora vi faccio vedere solo le, le figure che avevo portato. Questa è la costruzione del colosso da parte di Carlo Monino. Questi sono alcuni miei disegni sui fori. Ok, wait, wait, no, no, aspetta un attimo, disegni. I'm just going to go through these last images to, Tom, to wrap buddy, up. Mm. We are ahead of schedule, so I, I think we can keep okay. going. You know, it's, it's okay. We're, timing is fine. Okay, good. So no, we can continue. Ho ancora molte diapositive da far vedere, però vado veloce. Sì, andiamo veloce. Well, we want we to see your drawings. Siamo avanti con il programma, quindi vai pure, insomma, non c'è okay, problema. Grazie, grazie. Allora, questa qui è una... È, è una nota eh, proposta di Carle Monino per il Colosso del Colosseo e la volevo far vedere perché credo che eh, l'altro grande tema dell'archeologia e dell'architettura che hanno in comune è quella della ricostruzione di dimensioni sagome che possono essere fatte in modo molto diverso, alcune eh, in maniera orribile, altre in maniera molto interessante. Questa proposta di Carle Monino io l'ho sempre amata. We're looking at this project, um, this wonderful project. Lascia sull'immagine di Colosseo. We're looking at this wonderful project by Carlo Alminino for the Colosseum, which uh, deals with this theme of the silhouette or the outlines, which sometimes can be very successful, uh, and sometimes it's, it doesn't work quite as well. Vai avanti. Sulla, sulla sinistra c'era un mio disegno ah. condivido, condiviso con Carlo nel lontano 94 in cui proponevo la mia torre al posto della sua torre con l'immagine figurativa. And on the Questa left è la... is one of Carpanzano's proposals which he shared with Aimonino which proposed uh. a tower in place of Aimonino's building. Questa qui è invece un'ipotesi ricostruttiva del basamento di Santi Luca e Martina e quindi anche delle curie che si vedono a sinistra in quella casa dove c'è il numero uno ed è un'ipotesi di ricostruire un basamento a una, una parte della città che attraverso quelle demolizioni è stata strappata completamente eh, dalla sua crepidine e quindi l'idea anche di conferire un bordo a tutta l'area scavata antistante eh, che in questo momento non ha nessuna soluzione dal punto di vista architettonico. And this, this drawing, this proposal is for a new base, a new foundation below the church of San Luca and Martina and the building on the left, which has the one on it, is the Curia, the Roman Senate House. And it's an attempt to create a limit, to create a boundary or an edge to the area, which is now kind of limitless. Questo è un altro tema che, che si introduce in tutto questo, eh, come dire, panoramica che sto facendo e che riguarda la comunicazione. Questa è un'installazione eh, curata da Piero Angela e da Paco Lanciano in questo viaggio nei fori eh, in cui c'era eh, questa narrazione straordinaria del Foro di Augusto eh, attraverso la proiezione nei resti di quelli che potevano essere le sagome, le sembianze di questo monumento al tempo della sua massima gloria. Quindi era interessante far vivere e convivere all'interno di un'immagine digitale eh, due figure in dissolvenza, cioè la rovina e la sua magnificenza, e insieme. And th this uh, is more of a theme of communication and these events which were curated by Piero Angela and Paco Lanciano. They projected onto the walls a kind of narrative in the, the form of Augustus and contraposing really the ruin and then the magnificent era of its splendor. Qui andiamo avanti, questi sono alcuni altri, eh, diciamo, disegni e eh, costruzioni mod nel, del modello del progetto di Raffaele Panella, dove 
l'idea era sempre quella di lavorare affinché tutto quello che era di nostra conoscenza potesse essere uh, riprodotto. Addirittura qui vedete in questo splendido disegno il parterre dell'Anfiteatro Flavio con il sistema delle taberne e il passaggio all'Udus Magnus che era la, uh, la, la, la palestra dei gladiatori che si trova oggi naturalmente isolato all'interno di quel pezzo di città senza nessun tipo di connessione con la conca del Colosseo. And these images that we're seeing now, various projects by Raffaele Panella for the re-systemization of the forum area, including uh, rendering visible again the underground tunnel which connects the Colosseum with the small practice gladiatorial amphitheater, the Ludus Magnus, um, which now is isolated in a kind of banal urban setting. Come vedremo nella parte finale, la, gli studi e i progetti che stiamo conducendo all'interno del Dipartimento, sotto la mia eh, coordinamento, si riferiranno anche molto, partiranno molto da questi studi in, in grande continuità, intendo dire anche sotto il profilo progettuale. Questa so you'll questione... see that these, there's a great continuity with the work that Orazio is doing in his department, which is, um, pulls from Panella's research very directly. Non sono mai arrivato a questi estremi di Panella. Questo, per esempio, è l'ipotesi della ricostruzione del foro transitorio, il foro di Nerva, che, come potete vedere, è attuata attraverso un sistema di corridoi a cielo aperto e di passerelle che in qualche modo lo scingono per cercare di identificarne non solo la forma eh, ma anche e soprattutto la sagoma in elevato, ricongiungendosi a quel pezzo di muro con le due colonne, le colonnacce, che guardano, eh, diciamo, alla, 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 e che sono impostate sul limite del Foro della Pace. So Questo... this is kind of an extreme example of a reconstruction, uh, a literal reconstruction in the Forum of Trajan, of the, the few columns which survive are then replicated with new, new columns which span the Via Fuori Imperiali. E così via. Qui c'è anche l'idea di una ricostruzione del Templum Pacis con le vasche della nuova alberata che danno anche l'idea in qualche modo di quello che erano lo stato di conoscenza e di avanzamento degli delle, delle ricerche durante il periodo in cui Panella ha affrontato questo progetto. Ok, and we're continuing with other examples of the designs for the Imperial Forum by Panella, where in, the, in this one, the base of a whole series of columns or trees are, um, are visible. In yeah. grid. Qui vedete anche la quota, il disegno della quota archeologica del Tempio della Pace, con l'inserimento delle nuove strutture di fondazione. E so poi... The Temple of Peace with a new insertion of new foundation elements. E poi voglio brevemente farvi vedere queste, queste immagini che riguardano invece la ricerca. Eh, devo dire che non l'ho mai, finora non l'ho mai presentata, questa è la prima volta, eh, che riguardano un po' la ricerca che abbiamo in corso. Noi in questo momento ci stiamo occupando, oltre che della, dei fori imperiali, di un museo diffuso attorno al Colosseo, cogliendo delle aree importanti dove intervenire. Una è quella dell'Udus, che vedete in alto a destra. What, what we're looking at now is a work which is currently underway, so he's never shown this to anybody before, and it's a project, it's a proposal for a kind of diffused museum, or a disseminated museum of the Colosseum. Allora, vedete che intorno al Colosseo, che è il cardine di questo progetto, ci sono molti sistemi che vengono riattivati. Allora, la Villa Silvestra Rivaldi, a destra, sul luogo, a sinistra, sul luogo della Velia, sul luogo della Velia. Il, la sistemazione della, della, del bordo del Colle Oppio e quindi anche dell'Argo Agnesi sul fronte nord del Colosseo, e poi a destra il Ludus, e poi giù a sud il nuovo Museo del Celio. Il Colosseo, come lo vedete anche... Scusa, ok, scusa, me, scusa. mentre parlo però metti il mouse così capiamo sì, meglio. Il, quindi quindi eh, l'Udus mm -hmm. e il, il Museo del Celio sulla Via dei Trionfi e poi come potete vedere il Colosseo è, è risarcito finalmente mm -hmm. della sua arena, mm -hmm. eh, cioè della sua, eh, della sua platea. Ok, so as I point and um, 
Horacio is going to point with me, on the left of the Colosseum, we're, we're basically looking at a system of architectural interventions aimed at reactivating the Colosseum. So to the left, it's the Villa Rivaldi Silvestri, which has now been given back to use. We saw before on the right of the Colosseum, the Ludus Magnus, where a new structure is put above the Ludus Magnus. Below to the south, we see in the, the park of the Celio, a new axial system. And um, in the center of it all, very important, is that the re-establishment of the floor of the arena. So what is now an open space opened up to the below floor area is now once again occupiable. Okay. Dunque. Okay. Andiamo verso la chiusura. Sì, andiamo verso la chiusura. Quando, quando? Yeah. Questi sono, no, qui ci sono alcune immagini mm, che nice. illustrano quello che abbiamo visto prima. Chiaramente c'è un'ipotesi ricostruttiva di un piccolo museo per il Colosso, una sistemazione della meta dell'Arco di Costantino. E qui andiamo su immagini che in qualche modo illustrano eh, in maniera ancora in progress. Questa è la sistemazione della... Della, della sala per la, per la forma urbis sulla velia. Ah, ok. Stop on that for a second. So, various pieces of this work underway include uh, uh, creating a museum of the Colossus, a museum of the Metasudans. And then that last image that we saw is to create a viewing, this one here is a viewing space for the forma urbis, for the marble plan, which is on the poster questo, for no, this event. Questo invece è un approfondimento del, 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 della sistemazione del Ludus. Questo è il collegamento con il Colosseo alla quota archeologica, su cui viene impostato un museo uh, eh, dedicato interamente alla palestra dei gladiatori. Questo è il rapporto tra questo oggetto uh, che sovrasta la quota archeologica e inquadra il Colosseo in una sezione prospettica. Mm -hmm. So they we're looking here at the proposal, the more detailed proposal for the Ludus Magnus, where there is a connection you could see in plan between, at, at the archeological level, so below the modern city, between the Colosseum and the Ludus. Uh, the museum here is dedicated fully to understanding this practice amphitheater. Alcune immagini invece del, del Museo del Celio. These are images of the Museum of the Celio, the one to the south qualche, of the Colosseum. Qualche, qualche vista in progress di questa immagine del Museo del Celio eh, sulla Valle del Colosseo e la sistemazione del bordo. Eh, questa è un'immagine della velia della parte della velia verso il dal muro del Mugnoz verso il Tempio di Venere a Roma e questa è un'immagine del Ludus uh, del Museo del Ludus Magnus sul Colosseo. Okay, so these images have been showing us both the views of the Museum of the Celio and this last one is the Ludus Magnus seen from the Colosseum. Molto belli. E queste sono le ultime due figure che volevo far vedere perché è meraviglioso il il tema ricorre ancora oggi in questa, in questa idea del passaggio dal Grand Tour al Global Tour, eh, di cui dobbiamo essere pronti e soprattutto saper capire come, cosa eh, e perché, in nome di che cosa, dobbiamo comunicare questo grande patrimonio di cui dobbiamo essere orgogliosi e di cui dobbiamo essere degni e eredi. So in these last two images, which show us this transition from the grand tour to the global tour of today, and show us the, the challenge that we really face, answering the question of you know, how and why are we um, doing something which makes all of this great cultural heritage um, of, of value, makes us worthy of all of this great cultural heritage. Okay. Bene, grazie bene. mille, mi scuso okay. di essere stato così lungo. No, 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 va bene, grazie. Oh, Orazio, bene. thank you very much, Professor Calfonzano. Grazie, grazie. And we can... Thank you very much, professors. Now I would like to once again... Okay, yeah, I am here. Luigi Franciosi, Franciosini, are you here, professor? Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, I'll... You can hear me. Uh, you can hear me? Yes. 
Eh, aspetta, no, Giuseppe Strappa. Giuseppe Strappa. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So Giuseppe, I'm sorry. Uh, Giuseppe Strappa uh, from Sapienza University of Rome. He will be presenting uh, about ancient Rome and contemporary city design. Uh, I'll read his bio very quickly. Giuseppe Strappa is senior professor at Faculty of Architecture, La Sapienza Rome University. He taught architectural and urban design and mor urban morphology in La Sapienza in Bari Polytechnique in Quebec, Laval uh, University, and in other universities in Italy and abroad. He is president of ISOF Italy, council member of ISOF International, uh, director of TU plus the Urban Form uh, and Design International Journal, director of the Lettura e Progetto book series uh, for the Franco Angeli publisher, member of the Urban Morphology Journal ed editorial board. He is author of many books as the recent L'Architettura come Processo, uh, Franco Angeli in, in Milan uh, 2015. Uh, and collaborates to a number of specialized magazines and to leading national newspapers. As architect, he obtained awards in international competitions and has built a number of works. Professor Strappa, you have the floor. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me to have this short lecture in the summer school <clears throat> Roman Forum. Um, I'm not an archeologist, I am an architect. So my point of view is the point of view of a designer. And I must say that as designer, I share completely the Carpenzano's idea <clears throat> that the excavation site is not just a laboratory, a scientific laboratory, is a piece of the city and it needs a design. So um, I think that as architects, um, we have to pose the question, especially speaking with students, um, in which way we can uh, use archaeology from the point of view of reading, in which way as architects we can read archaeology, and in which way we can use the notion, the knowledge we get with the archaeology for the design. I must say that from this point of view, <coughs> our city has a very noble and dangerous tradition um which le has led in the past often to romantic interpretation of the ruins and um, it was in some way a dangerous interpretation of this fascinating landscape which often led to imitation of the antique so i think that that's the reason why Le Corbusier um, told that Rome is dangerous for the students. It's dangerous because Rome lack of the uh, modern centuries. It lack of uh, 17th century, the 18th century, all the period in which the modernity was formed. So he considered Rome an anti-modern city not very useful, but uh, in some way dangerous for the students. Um, I think that Rome is a modern city, but it's a modern city in a different way from the idea of modernity which the modern movement has got. It's a modernity as updating of a continuous transformation. And if we see well, deeply, the historical center of Rome, all the historical center is modern, is 18th, 19th century uh, uh, fabric. Um, 
I think that the reading of the um, Roman uh, heritage, archaeological heritage, is very useful from two point of view to teach the notion of process as a transformation by phases of the built reality and which led lead to consider the contemporary design as the last phase of a continuous flow of transformations which is very interesting from my point of view and not just useful to deal with um, archaeology and historical heritage but in general and another notion which we can get from the knowledge of the historical heritage um, archaeological especially is the notion of organism architecture as organism as a, a set of elements linked together by a relationship of necessity which is a notion useful in general for the design so um, as you see for, from this picture, um, Rome has a very, very close relationship with this um, archaeological heritage. Uh, no other place in the world, I think, has a um, so close relationship with the antiquity. The um, archaeological remains, they are spread everywhere in Rome. And uh, this, I think, has led poets and artists to interpret the pittoresque as the main character of the city. So that's why I think that we should replace the romantic and sometimes overused term of ruins by the rational and from my point of view, very useful term of substrata. As you can read here, one of the possible definition of substrata, useful, I think, for the design, is as a not apparent pre-existing matter underlying the current city that generates any following development. So, I will try now uh, to present you some slides of example of these substratas and the vitality uh, of, of this remain and after we can make some general consideration one of the most clear example in, in my opinion of substrata and also an example of forming process is the theater of marcellus that you see here in this slide. Um, the, the theater was occupied in the Middle Age by the Kerleoni family, which used the monuments as a castle, as a fortress, and slowly it was changed in a palazzo by the Savelli family, which from the 14th century owned the uh, monuments, and transformed in palazzo until 16th century in which Baldassare Peruzzi started to transform the upper part in a true palazzo as you see in this slide. Um, now we don't have the impression of how it was lively these ruins because it was restored in the interwar period by Alberto Calzabini who freed the lower part from shops but all the lower part was occupied from the shops and we can have I think a better idea from this image of the original um, shape of the site um, you see this was the more or less the shape the foundation of the theater and we can learn just from this image a very important um, lesson from for what is the formation of the our tissue the tissue of room the fabric 
starting from the substrata. You see on the left here some row houses, which are, we call base building. Base because it's the base of the city, but it's also the base of a transformation. You see, those are row houses. I beg your pardon, but it's not easy to make drawing with the mouse. And all the uh, row houses, they are arranged in the same way with two windows, one main door, you see here, which was used for the shop, and another smaller door, which was used for the um, housing, for the house. You see from the plan here of Palazzo Savelli, how the Palazzo, the idea of Palazzo, was the idea of a society of houses. That's why we call the row house base building. It's the base on which had been founded also the idea of specialized building. This is a building in which all the houses, they are arranged around a common courtyard, a common open space. And the behavior from the morphological point of view of this plan is like a small city revolved inside in which this is the tissue this is the fabric with roads and houses and so on another even clearer example of substrata is the theater of pompeius you see here the foundation of the theater of pompeius pompeius was one of the most powerful um, men in Rome in that period, he has gained a lot of new territories for the empire and has won the war against Spartacus and the revolution of the slaves. So he was so powerful that in 55 before Christ, he gave to the Roman this gift, the first huge theater made in masonry construction. And you see here on the right, in which way the shape, the geometry of the theater has conditioned, has formed the base better, the base of the new transformation. We have a cavea, the, the place for the steps for the spectator. We have the scena here, the stage. And after we have a porticus, a huge porticus of 180 80 meters along this direction. So we can see in which way the base building has used this substratum and the way in which the actual, the nowadays form of the city is conditioned by this substrata. The new building which are in this case, not palazzos, but houses, row houses, they are founded on the foundation of the ancient building. You can see here. And the modulus of the ancient ruin give the modulus to the new houses. And this, I think, is very interesting. It's a very good lesson for us, because we see that all the shape of the new fabric had been derived directly from the shape of the ancient ruin. You see here, all these, they are row houses. And the row houses, they melt together and they form new type of houses in a continuous flow of transformation, which is the core, I think, of the architectural um, spirit of um, Roman fabric. You see here the cavea, all this, this part. You see here the part of the scena, the stage. And you see here how the alignment of the porticus has conditioned the new formation. All row houses that are organized on the ancient ruins. You see here, the only specialized building of the place, which not by chance had been founded on the Venus temple, a specialized building in the Roman time. 
And you see here how also this building is a society of houses which is organized around a uh, empty space, a cartier. Some slides of the inner part of the um, stage. This is the other part of the stage. And you see how even nowadays it's very evident the way in which the fabric has been formed. We have row house, like in the picture we have seen before, all with two windows and this characteristic element of uh, Roman uh, fabric, which is the window seal coats. The exterior, always row houses, you see here. Even if very deeply transformed, but you can see the uh, original shape of the row house. This is Via di Grotta Pinta, the in, inner part. And those are all uh, triangular uh, square, which are derived from the uh, shape of uh, the theater, the sub substrate. You see here the kind of houses um, which had been founded on the ruin of the theater of Pompeius. They are typically with a two window facade, the entrance for the house and the door of the shop. But we see here also on the left that there is another type of building. It's not just two windows, many windows. It continues on the left here. But if we will see and we know the forming process, we can easily distinguish that this one was the original row house with the entrance. It had been transformed, of course, now. The entrance for the shop. And here there is another one which evidently had been melted with the other, with the previous one, forming a new type, which is a multifamily house type, which we call um, in linear house. That's just to start to understand how the transformation of the city and the forming of the new type of building always derive from a slow transformation experiment melting and the modern shape of the of the city is derived from this continuous transformation you can see here now a more general um, plan of the central part of uh, the historical center in which we can try to organize the knowledge we can get from the fabric the fabric, this is following the observation by Saverio Muratori, but in general it's a, a common sense um, consideration. It's based mainly on roads, which are the base of the fabric, distinguishing matrix road along the, the parallel to the river, and orthogonal street road on which had been formed the tissue. After we have fabrics, the building, the base building and sometimes aurea, which are storage buildings specialized, but they are serial, you see, all along the main road. So we have a serial uh, fabric here, and we have also special nodal building. You see here the, the theatres of Pompeius, the Odeon, Odeon in Latin, and here we have the theatre of Marcellus we have seen before. So this is the, the, the general frame in which we can uh, uh, understand the transformation of the fabric, which is evident even now. See here how the shape of the Odeon, for example, is so clear. And this explains, for example, the facade of Palazzo Massimo here, 
by Peruzzi, which had been interpreted of a, a genial invention by Peruzzi because the facade is carved in, in this way, but it is it's just explained by the uh, substrata which underlay the actual building. And the theater of Pompeius here, with the stage and the alignment of the porticus. And you see here also the Balbus Theater, a little bit more complicated building, but it's evident the shape of the theater and also the so-called Crypta Balbi, which is the porticus, porched porticus here. We can have an idea from this map. This is the ground map, ground floor map made by uh, Muratori and uh, Bollati and uh, Rinucci. And you see here the shape of the Pompeius theater here. And in which way the porticus has conditioned the successive fabric. You see here the original shape in which the cavea and the stage gave rise to special building. A palazzo here, another here. This is the Mattei theater in which we uh, has done the, 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 the Isuf Italy uh, conference. And here a more serial substrata which give rise to a serial fabric which is present nowadays in the site. We can see here we have merchant house with the porch in origin here. That's why the name of the, the street is Via delle Botteche Oscure, the dark um, shop um, route. And here we have on Via de Delfini other row, row houses very clear in the shape. But we see here that we have the start of a special building. All these row houses, they are melted together and they form a society of houses, all arranged around a small courtyard here, giving rise to a uh, palazzo. Uh, we see here also a calcara in the exedra, which was a lime factory in which the ancient ruins were considered a matter to produce lime, destroying many monuments all around. And we see also here how the base building, the row houses, they gave rise to another new um, type of building, which is this collegium for the orphan, uh, which was built by Ignacio Lopez de Loyola, was the um, college for the Virgini Miserabili at Rischio, the miserable virgin at risk, and here the church of Santa Caterina. So we see now, we have seen how the huge monuments, they gave rise to the tissue, but they are the exception in Rome. I have shown to the students these, those uh, examples, because they are very, very clear. But most of the substrata is lying under, below the actual fabric housing. Like for example here, this is Via del Pellegrino, here there is Campo dei Fiori. And we have a substrata which was formed by Orrea and Insule. We don't know exactly if they were Insule or Orrea because the, the shape was more or less the same. And the elementary cell, the unity of this building was a room of six meter by six meter, which is even now more or less the modulus 
of the actual um, fabric. We can see from this aerial view how we have in this block, for example, four phases of transformation. The ancient Roman one, which is the um, probably an, an area. We don't have a survey, of course, of all the, the sites, but we have some um, a smaller survey of the underground floor of these houses, so we can understand the different phases. This is the Roman phase. There was a Middle Age phase in which all this part of the building was void and was considered like a free space in which to freely build houses. And they has built the typical Middle Age house, which was the Proferlo house, the house with the external staircase, which is not really an urban type, it's more a rural type, which was important just because all this place was considered uh, quite a place apart from the city. And that's why we can wonder if we enter inside the, the building, because here in the inner part, we have all the Proferlo type houses, you see here. The other phases, they were medieval Renaissance phase in which the outskirts of the building was transformed in row house and after updated to 18th century uh, row house transformed. So we can see in the inner court, we can be surprised to find uh, houses like this. They are not, they don't fit very much, very well with the um, urban fabric. They are more, they fit more with rural landscape, but all the inner part of the um, of the building is occupied by these houses you see here, with external stairs, which are the early uh, phase houses of the Roman fabric. In the outskirts, it was formed a tissue of row houses. You see here, briefly the actually uh, less dense part of the, the city, Via de Capellari, which was not a very busy road, we still have the original, more or less the original shape of the row house like this with the entrance for the house, the shop and so on. On the other Pellegrino, which was a very busy street leading to the Vatican, we see the type transformed, modernized in the 18th century, transformed with two symmetrical um, shop window, uh, sorry, entrance, and the wind scene, which was a typical uh, um, Roman um, feature, integrated by a, a string coat which was clearly imported, but it remained all the tra always the traces of the two windows and so on. So all this type of Proferlo house uh, and um, row houses, they are spread in all the Roman fabric. You see here an example in the ghetto quarter, very nice and uh, unfortunately abandoned. And here another one in Piazza della Scala, which is the typical um, Roman row house. So we can understand how the forming of the actual city is the result of a process for which we don't have time, but briefly just to give, a, give you an idea of the way we can study uh, this process, we can uh, um, investigate the forming process of the house, starting 
from this elementary cell, which is not by chance, more or less six by six, which is the same um, dimension, the same measure of the um, underlying substrata, the Proferlo house, the transformation of the Proferlo house into storey building, the domus solarata with the floor, and after the introduction of the inner staircase and the transformation in the row house, which in time when it was needed um, a more, let say, dense type of, uh, of housing, was transformed in multifamily house. This house doesn't, doesn't work very well because you can imagine all the staircase, they are constructed inside a very small uh, place. And the result, the final solution after many experiments was the melting of two row house to form a new modern type of building. You have here an early example of this uh, process. It's very clear how we have two row house which were joined together and they have in common a staircase forming a multifamily house. A small corridor here. And you see how the facade express this solidarity between the building. We have a row house here, another row house here, and the architect tried to make a unity of all the um, all the process to express the new unity which had been formed. And we can also um, apply this idea of process and organism to the fabric. We have a very clear in the Roman uh, Historical Center uh, examples of the forming process, which is very, very clear to understand. We have the main road, which we call matrix road, because it's the mother of all the other um, courts and roads, in which the first phase of building is formed. And after we have another phase of building here, along the building roads here. And at the end, we have a connection road. So the block is formed by the melting of many lot, plot of unity of row houses. And you see here the result, all this part had been infilled and the modern block is formed. The process is a little bit more complicated than the way I am posing the, the, the problem. But the core is this, all the, the result of all this long process is the new block. And this is very useful to learn for the students because for example, we learn that the unity of the modern city is not the block, but is the road. Is the road with the um, row house facing the open space, which is exactly more or less the contrary of the uh, usual interpretation of the modern city, which is interpreted as a, a city of blocks. We have an example here. The substrata is the, the Via Lata here, which is a territorial road, Via Flaminia, which arrived from the north of Rome and form the actual Via del Corso. And you see here the uh, building road, the first phase of construction with the <coughs> row houses, the second phase. And we can even interpret the succession of the building with a type uh, very clear here, a base type, and the type which had changed just because it arrived in the last part of the plot. And here we start again with the orthogonal houses 
and here we have another type and they start again here. So we can understand even the phases. So the problem of reading and design, I think I, I have not much time. Uh, I have five minutes left. I have five minutes left. Okay. Yes, yeah, please, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Five minutes. So, um, in which way we can interpret it, this substrata? Um, we have the important lesson, important from my point of view, of Saverio Muratori, who started to apply this idea of interpreting the fabric from a general point of view, elaborating a theory about the behavior of the fabric. Um, it is very important to note that he didn't elaborate a theory and apply it to Rome. It was exactly the contrary. He started to study Rome from a practice point of view, professional point of view. And he finished, ended in elaborating a theory, making general what is particular. He has seen many examples of specific particular building and fabric, and from these is derived a general theory about the way the tissue behavior. This is just one example of uh, the um, um, way Muratori interpreted the fabric as an architect, not as an archaeologist or an historian. Of course, Muratori careful, carefully studied from Urbis and all historical cartography and studied also the, the, the fabric on the spot, of course, but the huge gap, gaps in the documentation are filled following a general law recognized in the ancient organism. You see here, for example, this is Via della Lungaretta, which was the ancient Aurelia Vetus, was a territorial road in which we made this plan of the imperial Rome, which are the evidence, archaeological evidence in this map. Quite nothing. There was the um, fire brigade barracks, which were excaved here. There was the Ponce Emilius, the node of Ponce Emilius here, Ponce Cestius, but not much more. But you have seen how there is a general law in the transformation of insula and aurea in modern fabric, and they applied the law and they interpreted it as in the theory, via della Lungaretta as a metric road, building road, and he this explain why now the tissue has the shape we see in our days. But please notice that is not only the ancient which explain the modern, it's also the modern which explain the ancient, the interpretation of the fabric following the forming process. Um, you see here, this is the, uh, a survey by Lanciani. This is a very precious document we have from Rodolfo Lanciani, which was an engineer of the 19th century and the beginning of uh, the following century. Uh, he reported all the excavation in Rome uh, till uh, the date of the uh, map, which is 1901. And you see the remains are, it was called Vicus Tiberini, but it's Aurelia Vetus here, Ponte Cestius. Those are middle age remain and, and practically nothing else. But he, with the general theory interpreted the way in which the tissue had been formed. And after, with the collaborator, he developed also the um, 
successive phases of transformation overlapping the new one. For example, in this case, the mid middle age city to the imperial city. And you see how it's very easy in this way to understand how slowly it was formed the pole of Santa Maria in Trastevere, which is the joining of Via della, Lungare Via della Lungara. This is the prosecution of Via della Lungara and Via della Lungaretta. And after the successive Renaissance city and the actual city. So uh, I would like to conclude uh, this brief, this short lecture with this problematic example of design. Um, uh, the, the problem was the area of uh, Piazza della Moretta, which was a free space along uh, Via Giulia here. So the idea was the reconstruction of the tissue starting from the early phase of construction, the, the, the Roman time. So he interpreted finding a general law of the tissue of the fabric, he interpreted all the different formation of the block. Arriving to the conclusion that the space, the open space here of, Vicolo, of uh, Piazza della Moretta needed to be continued with the same law in a modern way. So he interpreted this block with the uh, uh, courtyard houses uh, de derived more or less from the domus in this side of the, the, the block and row house in this side. So the um, conclusion was not just a modern building, but was a building which is an update to the um, old uh, forming process. And so things, they seem very simple. Uh, we follow the process. We found the general law, we find the general law, and the result is, is surely fit with the previous um, fabric. But it's not a, exactly like this, because many years after the proposal by Canigia, the site was escaped, and you see the result. We have, this is the river. We have a fabric which is aligned in this way, so not exactly in the way of the Renaissance tissue, planning. But here we have a building which is clearly rotated in comparison of the other alignment. So I, I would like to conclude this brief lecture with the question. Today, should we take into account this layer which indicates a new geometry for the new intervention? Or once the substrate has been overcome by new stratification, should we consider it only as a documentation? So it's a question and also a warning, which I pose you in conclusion of this um, lecture um, as a, a question mark. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giuseppe. Very, very interesting discussion. And we're moving along now. And the next speaker has already been introduced, Alessandro Camis. I will just remind you that he is the director of the Laboratory of Dynamic Research on Urban Morphology at Osigiden University in Istanbul. And he'll be speaking to us today about the modern invention of archaeological excavation. Thank you, Alessandro. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'm ready to share the screen. Uh, here we go. So within the recent debate on the relationship between architecture and archaeology, um, the prevailing thesis states that the contemporary project design should take shape in the archaeological site by affirming its own contemporary ca character. 
And such an assertion characterizes most of the Italian uh, recent uh, design production, but also European, uh, in archaeological context. Um, and above all, it does feed, in my opinion, the con continuous controversy contrasting architects and the bodies responsible for protection of the archaeological areas, making projects in such contexts rather conflictive. Now, this contribution is questioning the need for this figurative statement, okay, of the contemporaneity figure. Uh, in an archaeological area, before an archaeological project uh, is done, the archaeologists have carried out another project, the excavation, which is to be configured as a negative stratigraphic unit. So I'm going to try to give, provide uh, a contribution to the ongoing discussion about the architectural design in archaeological areas by providing a theoretical framework. But I noted down there the word frame for a very specific reason. And then I'm going to show, and these are uh, for the purpose of showing to students what they could do, three projects that were done in three different summer schools that we did in the past year. And then I'm going to try to draw some conclusions. Uh, so um, this is a very good example of, you know, contemporary uh, architectural design within an archaeological project. So the, the project is completely occupying the space of the archaeological excavation by imposing its own contemporary character. As I said, in an archaeological site, before the architect steps in with his own project, there's another project, which is the excavation. The archaeologists have excavated that site by subtracting matter, uh, configuring that transformation as a negative stratigraphic unit. In this operation, um, the archaeological excavation was introduced only starting from time times of the Enlightenment, and it is therefore a modern operation. Archaeology is a modern invention. Therefore, the archaeological excavation is a contemporary operation now when we're digging, making the past visible, you know, by enhancing the historical value and uncovering those ruins. So the contrast, okay, claimed by some contemporary design does not consider this uh, fact that the excavation has been carried out by subtracting matter. And therefore, it is a prerequisite of the project itself. The compositional action, therefore, should take place uh, by taking into account, as everywhere, that the context and the process that is ongoing in that place, uh, so to you know, consider the context and the process, therefore, establishing a connection with the context and the um, process. Now, um, even though today most of the architectural production looks like this, I'm gonna go quickly, we have a glorious past of you know, architectural design within archeological areas, 1950s and 60s, which did not generate conflict with the superintendencies and Franco Minisi's projects, uh, but most of all Cesare Brandi, who was the mind behind some of those operations, is showing us that it is possible to design something contemporary in an archaeological area, but we need to have a different attitude. Um, Cesare Brandi's principles of restoration, reversibility, compatibility, recognizability, and minimum intervention can be applied even in the uh, architectural design in the archaeological area, but most of all, the um, contribution of stratigraphic um, excavation is a seminar for the understanding of the notion of the frame. So the process is ongoing in any area, in any site, but, so in, but also it is ongoing in an archaeological area. So we have like in the Horre Agrippiana, an Etruscan phase, a Roman phase, a late Republican phase, imperial phase, late antique, barbarian, medieval, renaissance, all the way to today. And then we have the, you know, the state of the site today. But the project is going to be defining the next phase. So understanding the process is essential for the future transformation. But there is another bit here in an archaeological area, which is the excavation itself, to be considered part of the process. 
And what is an archaeological site? Usually it is a place where by digging out soil and dirt, in this case sand, this is Salamis um, in Cyprus, as excavated in the 1960s by Karagiorgis, a place why, where by digging out sand and dirt that covered the ruins in centuries, where somebody is trying to bring back to today what is lost re-establishing the remains of an ancient settlement. And that is done because we recognize the very high value in those remains, historical, cultural, even economical, if you wish. Re-establishing, um, again, other pictures of this um, gymnasium of Salamis as it was excavated. But after the excavation is, is finished, there's another stage of re-establishing by restoring, remounting, or rebuilding with an astylosis like this case. Um, therefore, the entire operation of, you know, bringing out, carrying out an archaeological excavation is, a, in a way, a, an operation of restoration, because it's bringing back to the present what has uh, disappeared for the action of time. Uh, but who framed Roger Rabbit? Well, this is a metaphor it has frame, uh, has two different meanings in English, but, and it does not have the same two meanings in Italian, but framing Roger Rabbit, this is a movie some of you might have seen just to, uh, uh, as a metaphor of the notion of a frame. If I give you an empty frame, uh, you would feel the need to fill it up with a picture as the frame generally speaking, is meant to be surrounding the picture. So if it's empty, you need the picture. On the other hand, if I gave you a modern painting, like the C.D. Kambitsky composition, you do not feel the same. You don't feel in that the frame is missing. Hence, the contemporary and modern figurative revolution, revolution has abolished frames. No frames in modern pictures. So with this, uh, uh, attitude in mind, as modern people as we are, we don't need the frames anymore. But in this case, we need the frame as a metaphor of the understanding of what should be done, in my opinion, in an archaeological site when we design something. Uh, so who framed Roger Rabbit? An archaeological site is not a frame to be filled in with pictures, but it is more a picture that requires a frame because after the excavation um, is done to bring back the figure of those ruins, we need a frame to enhance those ruins and make them readable, understandable, hence their high value in history and culture. So we should not place a new picture in that frame. We should instead design a frame to that picture. Now, um, this operation is quite different with our contemporary mentality because we do not consider frames as part of the picture. But in designing an archaeological site, I think this is very important. Now, having in mind the notion of frame, the notion of stratigraphic unit and negative stratigraphic unit, and also the principles of restoration given by Cesare Prandi, I'm going to show you three different examples of projects that were carried out in a team during summer schools. Uh, the Beyond Pompeii uh, summer school we did in 2010 with University of Maryland, Miami, Oregon, Cornell, Bari, Sapienza, Naples. And in that time, working together with Valentina Porchedu, who is an archaeologist, and Gabriele Farre, who is an architect, and some students from Sapienza, we designed uh, the transformation of Villa Carmiano I in Gragnano. Gragnano is the capital of pasta, um, the most, uh, um, you know, the best spaghetti you can buy are from Gragnano. It's near Naples. Nevertheless, in uh, Gragnano, on the outskirts of Gragnano, uh, a rustic villa was excavated in the 1950s and then protected with these uh, not very beautiful um, uh, structures. Later on, late 1960s, the villa was covered again to protect it from the environment because the superintendency did not have enough money to 
uh, maintain the site. So this is how the site appears today. Uh, within the periphery of that city, an empty area with ruins of the modern protections of the villa, and then the lawn. Uh, there was another villa, Camiano II, uh, which was also excavated, but still underground to this day. So our team there designed, sorry, in, in this is the plan of the villa as it was excavated, a rustic villa, with very important artifacts like the mosaic of Varian, uh, the fresco of Ariana, who is now in the archaeological museum. Everything is underground, but we, what we designed there is a frame. It is a building that is acting in defining the limit of the archaeological area on the hypothesis of redigging and excavating that villa and also restoring the building by reconstructing the roof of that building, which is the best way to protect the building itself by putting a roof on top of the building. And that was done following the principles of restoration. So not, you know, nothing contemporary, just a restoration, which is distinguishable from the original, of course. But on the other hand, the modern building is defining the limit of that uh, site and providing a building which is a limit building, a border building, an edge building, defining and delimiting the archaeological area from the contemporary city, but also, on the other hand, as you might see in the section here below, sorry, I have to move the uh, menu right here, on the section here below, uh, connecting the two different levels, hence the contemporary city is some five meters above the archaeological site. So it is necessary, to, if you want to make this site accessible, to provide the vertical connection. So the building is a limit, it's an edge, it's a frame, but it's also a connector. Also, it behaves like a viewpoint, because from the main entrance leading into the small atrium, you, had, you would have an, a terrace from where it would be possible to see the villa. Frame, defining the frame, defining the connection across the frame. On the lower level, so the same level of the villa, coming down with the staircase and the elevators, you would be able to enter following the direction of the original entrance of that space, and then walk into the open archaeological area and inside the villa and explore those remains. You can see here a detailed section showing the terrace from where it was possible to see the ruins, and also the design of the fence, let's say, of the surrounding um, structure, the structure surrounding the archaeological area, which was designed as an extension of the building itself, not as a separate element. A few renderings show you what this could have been uh, using local material, tufus and rusted steel coming from the shipyards of Castello Mare di Stabia and local wood. And then we have two um, perspectives showing you the effect of this composition, which as you might notice is absolutely contemporary in terms of language, even though based on some sort of very conservative, conservative principle. So we're not talking about applying principles of restoration and composition by making fake uh, ancient buildings. No, that's not the case. We're trying to interpret those principles of reversibility, um, minimum intervention, compatibility. One last note is about the foundation. One other point I would say, in an archaeological area, you cannot dig for foundation. You can dig if you're archaeology. Foundation. So, therefore, buildings should be designed with. Oh, okay. Was a place in the periphery. Okay. Sorry. Um, the, Sorry. Uh, Some, place somebody the needs to be muted. Uh, somebody needs also. to be muted. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, foundations. Uh, foundations. I go, go back to the section. Uh, the foundations, in, generally speaking, in an archaeological site should be conceived and designed so they do not dig underground, because underground we have the archaeological strata. Uh, in this case, this building was designed in steel, unmountable, reversible, and 
and distributing the loads of the building itself on a widespread plateau. The next example I uh, would like to show you is the result of summer school we did last year in uh, Vibo Valencia with the summer school organized by the uh, University of Reggio Calabria Mediterranea in cooperation with Ozigi University. In that time, together with Ozigi Guvanchi and some of these students, um, um, and we also had other teams, but I'm going to show you just one of those teams. Uh, we designed the gate of the Greek city walls of Vivo Valencia and of the archaeological area of that uh, city. Our first operation we did in that time was making a digital photogrammetric survey of the city walls, of the ancient city walls, which I'm going to just show you quickly because we did not have a good, you know, representation of that um, artifact. Uh, I think it's more than one kilometer long. So we, you know, collected that information so that we could mount that um, plan and, and elevation within our project. Then we designed a master plan with different teams operating in different areas, the Greek temple and the, uh, the entrance to the, to the, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. The entrance to the archaeological park and other minor pavilions right here, a museum in this area, uh, with different teams working on different projects. But this one group worked on the entrance, sorry, on the entrance of the archaeological park by using an empty spot that was today, there's a, um, a gas station, I think, already excavated by placing the volume in the, at the edge uh, of the archaeological area, not over, not posing the new building on top of the walls, which are these ones, but placing it on the limit, but also establishing a connection with the viewpoint, the visual connection, and an entrance, uh, as you will see, so that you could walk all that way and with a vertical tower in this position, and a path leading all the way to the path uh, along the Greek city walls. So the building as an edge, the building as a connector, the building as a contemporary transformation of the landscape. And I see, you can see here some uh, images of that idea. Uh, and the plan, uh, this would have been a Archaeological Museum of Vivo Valencia, because all the finds of the archaeological excavations done there in the past are currently in the Archaeological Museum of Reggio Calabria, designed beautiful building designed by Marcello Piacentini, but probably it is convenient to place the findings where they were um, excavated. And renderings of the inside space, we, you know, placed the bronzi or priace inside, just to give you the idea of what this space would look like. Building as an edge, building as a connector, limiting and connecting in the same time, but also the building as a viewpoint. So the entrance of the building is establishing a visual connection all the way to the entrance of the cemetery which is on top of the hill and the beginning of the remains of the Greek walls of Vivo Valencia. Uh, the third project that I would like to show you is instead operating at a different scale, that, which is the scale of the landscape. And it's a graduation thesis of Antonio Derita and Silvia Uras, which at that time, uh, Giuseppe Strappa was the rapporteur and I was the core rapporteur in 2009, 2010. Actually, this graduation thesis was part of a big uh, research that we did in the area around Castel Madama. And not only about the aqueducts, also about the urban settlement of Castel Madama that was published um, in different books. But in this case, we're talking about the aqueducts, the Roman aqueducts bringing the water to the imperial Rome. Eleven aqueducts existed in Rome. Four of them were passing uh, along the river Aniene, next to the territory of Castel Madama. Uh, Aqua Marcia, Anio Novus, Anio Vetus, uh, and Aqua Claudia, four aqueducts. Um, and these are the remains of those aqueducts, as you can see them today walking in the countryside. 
But the aqueduct, which is what would run for 80% of its extension underground and have bridges for those parts that were overground, included a very interesting system of soil and land partition using these stones, Eugero uh, stones, that in this one is in the Castello Orsini in Castel Madama. It is related to the Acqua Marcia. These stones, um, as you're going to see in the next picture, would delimitate the area where the aqueduct was running as a place where it was not possible to build. Thomas Ashby has surveyed those aqueducts and provided plans and elevations as well as photographs showing as they were in the beginning of the 20th century. Now, along the line of the aqueduct, in both in the case when the aqueduct was underground or overground, these stones placed at regular intervals of 240 feet, which is the measure of the Ujuru, 71 meters, on either side would determine a strip where it was not possible to build or cultivate anything. But also, they would be dividing the surrounding properties, hence the aqueduct had been exploited from you know, private property as being public construction. Uh, what is interesting, and this is a theoretical reconstruction of the land partition and the usual stones along the lines of an aqueduct. What is interesting is that overlapping this theoretical partition to the actual countryside of the Año Novus, um, uh, there are two diremations of the Año Novus, the western and um, meridional one in what is called today Osteriola. So overlapping that grid to the existing countryside, we realize that most of the you know, roads and property lines, as well as trees, uh, seem to obey that theoretical grid. What is interesting is the understanding that the aqueduct is not only the you know, the, the duct, it's a system in the landscape of relations. And some of those relations are still readable today. Following this uh, understanding, we've designed together with Professor Strapper. Um, so this is a um, GIS, archeological GIS of the area, showing you that within this very large um, territory of Castel Madama, not only we do have the aqueducts, this is the Anio Novus and the Aqua Claudia in Aqua Marcia. In Anio Vetus, we also have Roman villas and tombs and many other uh, artifacts. But also, that in section, you can understand how the aqueduct, which is running, I mean, with a constant uh, slope, almost horizontally, is mostly underground in a tunnel and then comes out on what is technically called the bridge of the aqueduct. So, with we designed a restraint, an archaeological restraint that was proposed to the local administration of Castel Madama, uh, which is based on the same measure of the 240 feet, so a strip of land along the path of the four aqueducts, the Anio Novus, and the other three, Anio Vetus, Aqua Claudia, which are running uh, parallel a strip of land of 240 feet on either side of absolute uh, restraint, no construction of any kind. This uh, huge, you know, archaeological restraint was prefigurating a, an archaeological park, all the area included in this uh, limit. The Local administration accepted this proposal and inserted it into the variant of the uh, master plan with a slightly light color, pale oak instead of red. But you can recognize that shape. So this restraint is now uh, working and it's there. And I hope that in the future they can go on with the construction of an archaeological park. On Saturday, 
in uh, Casale on your nobles, which is right in this position, there's going to be the opening of a very big uh, happening, an event where they're going to talk about uh, all these uh, events. And also, I'm going to give a lecture there, even though the lecture was recorded on video. Now, the thesis of Beretta and, and Uras uh, was working on that same assumption along the path of the aqueduct, which you see here which is in ruins today and mostly underground in this area underground but on the part which was used to be out of the ground in ruins so it's not really legible it's not possible to see it um, but along the path of the aqueduct a strip of land of the width of 240 feet on either side was destinated to our uh, agricultural cultivations uh, olives and grapes and other essences along the usual grid. So to enhance the perception of the aqueduct in the landscape, as these aqueducts, four of them, from Subiaco to Rome, for an extension of roughly 50 miles each, altogether 200 miles, are compatible by measure with the Chinese Great Wall, which is visible from the moon, if even though these aqueducts are not visible because they are mostly underground. So this proposal was trying to make those uh, ruins visible and understandable by acting uh, using agricultural cultivations, but also, again, uh, the, defining the limit we have, we have set, but also establishing a viewpoint and a connection. In this case, the viewpoint, let me show it back in the other map, is uh, an underground building destined to the museum of the archaeological museum of the aqueduct which is a place from where it's possible to see the aqueduct it is also um, an underground building designed following the same usual grid based on the roman foot um, and it has a vertical connection so you can go inside of it and in this building not only would have been possible to look at the aqueducts in the landscape but also to explore and see as a museum all the different artifacts that were found in the area uh, such as the usual stones but also other fragments and um, belonging to the roman villas and to the tombs of the territory of Castel Mandana. This project with graduation thesis was awarded of a prize in, at the University of Camerino the following year and published on the book. So to conclude, the first thing is we have to understand there's an ongoing process in the archaeological area, which has not only to do with the past history of the area, but it also should include the archaeological excavation. The archaeological excavation is part of the process. And sometimes it's still ongoing. In the case of the Jorge Agripiana, as you know, uh, Tom and the others are excavating, not in this very moment because the lockdown, but there's an ongoing excavation there. So this should be taken into account. But also, the excavation is a negative stratigraphic unit. So the soil was taken away to show the ruins. And this was done, spending some money because those ruins have a value for our society. They have an economical, cultural value, and so we should not cover them up with the new building. We should instead define the frame with the new building, designing the limit, and as I said, establishing a connection and a viewpoint from where it's possible to see the ruins and understand them in their landscape. Thank you very much. This is a list of references. And I would like to remind also, as Orazio Capenzano did, of Raffaella Panella and his work on the uh, Roman forests. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alessandro. Now we move on to our next lecturer, who is Anna Irena Del Monaco, uh, who will be presenting Monument Survival, Cultural Viscosity, Tourism Industry.
Anna Irene Dal Monaco, Associate Professor in Architecture and Urban Design, teaching at the Master uh, Architectural Landscape uh, Archaeology at the Doctorate in Architecture and Construction of Sapienza, Secretary General of the UNESCO Chair in Sustainable Urban Quality, Sapienza University of Rome. You have the floor. Once you close, I can share my screen. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Can you see it? Yes, we're able to see. It's it's small, okay. but yes. Okay, now it's working, right? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Alessandro. Thank you, Tim, for Tom, for this invitation. Uh, um, I organize uh, a, a number of observations after a dense morning in which students uh, uh, had the opportunity to listen to talented uh, professor designers and architects and uh, brilliant archaeologists. And so I think that at this point, probably some observation that are sort of warm up uh, oriented for the workshop could be useful to reframe uh, uh, ideas and uh, prepare you know, the work uh, of their design. Uh, of course, you, you have my abstract. Um, first of all, the, the, the most important thing I think is to understand for students that we are working in the framework of uh, cultural production. A monument survival is not something that uh, is there from the be beginning of the world, but it's something that uh, was produced at a certain point, especially because of political and cultural will. And uh, the area uh, object of this uh, seminar uh, was um, particularly um, you know, under the attention of uh, politics and the culture during the 70s in Rome and the very remarkable personalities uh, involved both in politics and culture, people that today we could define uh, opinion makers like, I mean, uh, Giulio Calio Argan and uh, Luigi Petroselli that both alternated the uh, in the mayorship in Rome, uh, you know, raised a, a very dense debate on that area. And uh, it is important for uh, young uh, students and uh, young architects to understand that even though they were very, you know, powerful in terms of culture, they didn't succeed easily uh, in to, to, you know, convince and to uh, uh, the, the resistance of culture to, to you know, to implement their ideas. So the, uh, the idea to, um, uh, you know, delimit the area of the fora and uh, turn them into a pedestrian area was rejected by the Ministry of uh, uh, Cultural Heritage. So this is important to understand, even though when, when it is a very important political commitment uh, to realize the and to succeed into some ideas uh, is not so easy. And especially the kind of work we do as a designer and thinkers uh, sometimes take uh, at least 20, 25 years in Italy to, uh, to be absorbed by the uh, standard culture. I remember still when 20 years ago, there were in our department the first experiment between architects and, design and, uh, and archeologists in sharing some ideas, for example, to turn the metropolitan, uh, the underground station into something in the middle between infrastructure and the museum. And there was a lot of resistance from the archaeologists. Today, if you talk with them, everything became natural, especially because of the success in Naples and also some numbers of underground stations in, in Rome. So this is to say to students, think that the work you are doing now, maybe will find some results, not in the near future, but in a long-term action. And uh, um, not only in the 70s, of course, the area of uh, the central archaeological area was an uh, uh, object of interest since uh, uh, the uh, 18th century and the 19th century. You see here some, uh, a couple of um, uh, uh, drawings representing some proposals from, uh, uh, from the administration of the Pope and the administration of Napoleon, because Rome used to be also a French uh, city somehow in, in the past. And this is an article of Daniela Esposito, who is a professor of restoration of our departments. And it is not the only article very remarkable on this topic, but I mean, it's very useful to reconstruct the historical path of this area. 
Another important uh, reference, I think, I, I collected three, four uh, readings that I think can be easily reached in these days by students because they are written in English, they come from the, the Anglo-Saxon literature and they are almost accessible online, is uh, this uh, very well-known work by Spiro, Spiro Kostov, especially uh, American acad academics knows very well. It's uh, the, um, the result of, uh, you know, it is, it, it, um, the, um, how do you say, it's, um, I mean, it collects the result of a, an exhibition uh, that he organized in Rome and it describes carefully the history of the so-called modern Rome that he defines the third Rome. And it is important in title to understand that the problem is that how to keep together traffic and glory, which means the, uh, the next generation of infrastructural turn and of course the heritage and, and the past together. And this book is, I think is very useful, first of all, because it is not only a catalog of an exhibition, but it is a very well uh, written book at, a sto at scholarly standards, but helps foreign uh, students, non-Italian students especially, uh, to understand that uh, the, uh, the situation they s see now in Rome is not you know, or, or uh, belonging to the situation, uh, to the stage of 2000 years ago, but it's the result of tremendous and important transformation which happened not, not more than 100 years ago. And this is uh, uh, something that has to be clear because in the common sense, they all think that the eternal city is eternal uh, since, uh, since ever. On the contrary, you know, what you see now is, uh, a, 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 an important uh, and also difficult uh, uh, result of uh, the, the intervention of politics uh, through the ends of architects. Another uh, uh, author which uh, I think is useful and uh, it's um, Salvatore Setti, this book was translated in English, The Feud of, of Classical, is not a very recent one, it was published in 2004. I think it's useful, especially for uh, uh, you know a, um, a set of global uh, young people like the one involved in this workshop, because it, it, it stressed the attention to the fact who has the right to say that the Greek and Roman culture belongs to Greek and Italian more than uh, to, for example, Japanese or Muslim people. I mean, um, mm, it, it goes beyond some common sense related to the fact that uh, um, classicism belongs only to the people that have access to the reading and the translation. And for example, it quotes uh, the, the title of, an import, of a well-known manga uh, called Nausicaa. Nausicaa was a princess that, uh, you know, uh, Ulysses jumps into and is strolling around around the Mediterranean. So he stressed the problem of otherness, which is somehow, and, uh, and he says also that the more and more we don't read anymore directly or through the translation of the ancient manuscripts, the more we quote them. So it's a very complex cultural process that I think should be considered when we do this uh, design work. These ideas are confirmed uh, by another important author, David Lowenthal, with his um, book, uh, which was a success in 1985 when it was published and was rewritten by the author uh, uh, recently. And I think also um, just crossing the index can be useful for students because highlights uh, the ambiguity of a lot of the topics that we have been discussing, memory, memoir, and identity. Identity is the real issue that in, around which we are uh, working on because uh, the reason why politics uh, and uh, people involved in the transformation of society are particularly interested to the, pa to the past is because uh, as, as he says for example the past is a style which, has, which is much more interesting than the style of contemporaneity so we, we are very much glad to reflect uh, our need of beauty in the style of the past and one of the present and then the, the idea of nostalgia that is uh, very much ambiguous uh, and that goes beyond any kind of philological exercise like we have uh, been uh, seeing this morning very carefully by the uh, archaeologists. Another uh, in relevant work, I think, is by Lucia Alais, who is a, a young, um, I mean, uh, academically young. She is in, mid, in her mid-40s, I think. Uh, she's an historian teaching at Columbia University. She mm, did this book, very useful, because she reconstructs a global story of uh, uh, 
uh, you know, this important institution around the, the um, establishment of the World Derivative Conservation in 1972. Again, the 70s comes back as important uh, uh, um, historical passage to, con to build up this culture of monument survival. And um, also the, the, the bureaucratic authority. I mean, and she describes very carefully um, that the, the monument is a, is a construction I and mean, is not something that exists there because of implicit uh, reasons. And this is important, especially um, when we decide, as Professor Karim Persano, for example, will say what we decided to uh, stress, to highlight, to show, or, or, or to avoid to show. And um, for example, she mentions Giovannoni, Gustavo Giovannoni, which is very important, but not very well known abroad. So uh, it seems that also in the Anglo-Saxon sphere, some uh, less known uh, Italian authors are starting to be studied. And through the reading of Lucia Lyes, I jumped into this concept of cultural viscosity, which I didn't know was uh, uh, used by Manfredo Tatufuri in more than one occasion, because I passed through some digging. Uh, for sure, in an interview given, released to some uh, young uh, Italian scholars um, in late 80s, uh, uh, he was talking about exactly this, what we are talking now, that the monuments is, some, is, a, is something that is invented. So uh, it is a, a, a very ambiguous concept. The viscosity stays for something that is a shift or a switch, I mean, in, in terms of uh, also uh, discipline. And um, this is something that also needs some uh, attention because, uh, um, I mean, uh, the preservation uh, uh, domain, let's say, in the last 15 years became under the attention not only of uh, restorators or, or the people and the, the professionals that are traditionally involved around uh, I mean, monuments, of course, archaeologists or historians or whatever, but also from the point of view of uh, practicing architects that, of course, look for clients. I mean, and uh, uh, in, in the last 20 years, uh, the, the world of archaeology is not anymore, uh, is not anymore as a client, public client, but also private client. And this changed a lot also the, uh, the result and the focus of design. Um, Rem Kulas, I discovered after that I didn't uh, know because of my fault, the Manfredo Tafuri quotation, that in the end he follows this line when he says, uh, with which the, the interest for sacred sub substan substance for, uh, for monuments, so the monument intended for, I mean, the, the production of uh, buildings from, from kings or from popes or from uh, priests or whatever, to also so the sociological substance. So in this moment, we preserve whatever, even prisons or whatever has a significance from the sociological point of view. And this is something that determines a switch from design to curatorial activity. And um, it's a key point to me, and I will rapidly arrive to that and conclude. Another important uh, personality around this topic is Otero Pilo, um, who is a professor in, again in Colombia, and uh, he teaches preservation, but a kind of preservation which is totally different from the preservation that we study in Rome. In fact, we define this discipline and experimental presentation because it says um, I take care of uh, the existing building and monuments uh, but as an object can, that can be reimagined into a powerful agent of, trans of cultural transformation which means something completely far from what Giovannoni and uh, Cesare Brandi meant and so uh, about the, the practice of uh, restoration and the preservation that we have for sure in Rome, but which has an impact on contemporary design, architectural design. So, uh, tourist industry, of course, is also the major uh, result of our, uh, uh, you know, thinking and, and our discourse. Up to some months ago, one of the major problems in Rome and, and in other European uh, cities was over tourism. What about now with the, uh, in, in this sort of post-COVID era? Do we have to take care of that? And the um, competition uh, of uh, Piranesi Prize that uh, Professor Carpezzano carefully analyzed of some years ago um, is something that 
like um, you know was uh, uh, designed and thought for a mass tourism uh, I, I mean uh, condition uh, even though it was uh, already considered as a problem uh, especially from our friend archaeologists and the, the three projects that were uh, the winning one uh, um, are characterized in terms of design uh, by differences. I have been discussing them uh, in, in, in the Master Ala uh, Archaeology Landscape Architecture with uh, um, our colleague, uh, uh, Professor Vanzetti from the department of Professor Carafa. And, and I was, I think uh, I was interested to share with you uh, the point of view of archaeologists on this project. For example, he says that the one that was, has been defined like uh, the romantic uh, landscape oriented one, one from Chippefi, is the the worst that you can think from the archaeological point of view because uh, plants and whatever is natural is, is absolutely a, a problem for the archaeological uh, remains. So from the point of view of archaeology, you can completely cancel them. The one of uh, the group led by Professor Purini is con contemporary something minimalistic and maximalistic in, in, in itself because of course it is concentrated on a line but uh, concentrate is extension so it is a very powerful uh, intervention the one of professor uh, francesini on the contrary he, he, is the fascination of uh, uh, combining one uh, unique material, materiality, the old, the contemporary, and the, the mid city, the, 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 the Baroque city. The archaeologists preferred much more, I jumped quickly, um, um, the solution from the museographic point of view of this, uh, um, uh, of this project. Why? Because it is the one that redefines the structure of the fora that used to be at work like a as um, a consequence, as consequential um, and chronologically different rooms, I mean, uh, urban rooms. So they found that this was the one that from the archaeological point of view was the most uh, uh, successful in terms of uh, uh, transferring uh, knowledge and, and information. And I, um, I jumped to something that I saw and I, jumped, I, I met two days ago when during the review of the Master uh, Architectural Landscape Archaeology led by Alessandra Capuano, we had a, a web review with some students that, uh, uh, having a workshop in, uh, in Athens. This is the Keramica Eios uh, quarter and this is one of the projects presented. I don't know if it is the best project presented. There were other projects that were, uh, you know, of course, elaborated by the participants. But I selected this one and I wanted to share with you because it um, presents something that is, um, I think, uh, useful to complete my discourse. Uh, this is a project that has, does not correspond to the three categories that we have seen uh, related to the Prize of Ro Pre de Rome discussed before but belongs to a new category that is more curatorial oriented. I don't know if this is a, a possible future for this kind of uh, project, but probably is uh, something that mm, is almost new. It has some qualities, uh, uh, reversibility, I mean, so you can remove and, 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 you, and you, if you can even change, uh, not of course every day or every week, but uh, you know, every, every some numbers of year, um, the installation in, into a site and this creates also the possibility to, for having new work for architects and new thinking around the same uh, uh, theme. Um, so I think it was something that probably was useful for your students uh, and also to go back and conclude to the issue of um, touring industry. What about beyond over tourism and beyond uh, this new condition that we, we don't know exactly how, how, for how long we are going to face. Uh, does intervention in this uh, uh, complex, very much complex and delicate archaeological context uh, need to be more oriented to a curatorial installation, uh, um, you know, uh, outcome, or we still have to think like in the 70s, uh, or in or in the nine up to the nineties to something which architecture enter in a more you know uh, strong and um, invasive somehow way into the um, archaeological preexistence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria Eva. That was um, particularly interesting. We were just in the forum this morning, and uh, I was commenting on how over tourism. 
of a few months ago has transformed into um, a kind of nostalgia for tourism at all. There were more people working in the forum uh, than there were visitors. <laughs> we're going to move on now to Matteo Evo and uh, Nicolas Cardino from the Politecnico di Bari and architects and professors both. Um, Matteo is a professor of architectural and urban design, uh, secretary of ISUF Italy, co-editor of UND Urban Forum and Design Magazine. He studied under Canigia. He collaborated in the teaching of Giuseppe Strappa's course. He has participated in national and international conferences and design competitions, receiving significant prizes and awards. For some time, he has been carrying out research on morphology and urban phenomenology, areas of interest on which design, teaching, and professional activity has also focused. Among their recent publications, the monograph Architectura come lingua, Processo e Progetto, um, and Nicola Scardino, is architect PhD and teacher in the course of building types and urban morphologies at the Polytechnic of Bari. He's a member of ISUF Italy and the UND Urban Forum and Design Magazine, the winner of international uh, scholarships issued by organizations such as ISUF International and universities like the University of Wales. He participates in national and international design competitions, conferences and seminars, carries out research on issues related to urban morphology, landscape, planning activity, both didactic and professional focuses on this area of interest. And so you have the floor, uh, Matteo and Nicola. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, uh, Alessandro. Hi, Irene. Ciao. Ciao. Uh, the presentation focuses on the general theme architectural project for archaeological sites. I'm going to present the first part of this work through a, a theoretical speculation on the theme by referring to concrete design experiences and so to different methodological approaches. The second part of this PowerPoint will be presented by Nicola Scardino and will concern the design experiences for the Ipogeo Varese in Canosa di Puglia, a work I done from uh, 2011 and 2013 with my colleague and architect Carmine Robbe. Vedo che non parte il PowerPoint. Criticality of the archaeological project. Uh, the theme of the archaeological project, highly uh, relevant today, brings to the attention of the scientific community a series of questions that frequently find responses which are reconciled and often contradictory. The variables, sometimes numerous, which generally launch the project idea into a field of interest, both multifaceted and seductive, give rise to a composite interaction stimulated by different, uh, different points of view of those who take part to the process of definition of intervention hypothesis concerning areas where ancient traces are present. This postulates the need to establish a necessary and complementary participation between the disciplines interested in this phenomena, essential for building a common foundation based on the unity of purpose in order to initiate the critical cogito reflection uh, between the figures interacting in this process. Therefore, arises the question that leads to reflect on the selective modality of criteria to adopt in order to the set of principles that contribute to defining this relationship can be, can be distilled with sufficient agreement and objectives, principles which must be put in relation with speci specific constraints and vocations of area whose transformation is proposed. Of course, this duality expressed by relationship subject-object, each with its own attitudes, 
implies a multiplicity, a multiplicity of expectations that of the ancient testimony and itself and the other of the signer who hacks that make the matter even more complex, apparently contradictory and inextricable if it is not possible to fix interpretative parameters. The use of interrelative mechanics, therefore, creates the need to consider the critical place of the project as an essential foundation of a synthesis in which all knowledge coagulates by simultaneously interacting. The purpose of the dissertation is uh, precisely the interest, uh, interest <coughs> in seeking the existence of theoretical procedures, such as places of the possible project, to align on evaluation framework with which to draw a grid of basic problems capable of initiating an analytical reflection non-centered on the principle of authorship, nor left solely to the creative, creative capacity of the individual designer. Project for increasing the uh, valuability on the funerary area methodological principles. Before describing the project, we think it is us useful to introduce the topic with a question that inevitably appears in these cases and regards the choice of the covering system to be adopted, whose main purpose, in addition to protection, that is on top of that exploitation of the monumental site. The issue then seems more complex as more as it is reported to the archaeological sites that occur in entirely hypogeum structures and are placed, placed in urban areas where other buildings are located. That said, the problem already, already arises a reflection on the value to be given to the area as an element itself, in itself, whose visible appearance as part, special and of particular value, of a more general system cannot be underestimated and at the same time, how to relate to the surrounding built area. This outlines, to be noted, a grid of questions to be answered through a clear hierarchy of values that can define the relationship and the critical choices to be taken. The Varese Hypogeum is located in the suburb of the village and it, it is uh, accessible by a road that connects the city with the valley system of Ofanto River and uh, with that of the Murja Hills. The area is located between a house and a building used in the 19th century as the residence and a oil mill no longer uh, active. And then white area private property that puts it in a, in a direct relation with the white plain of the Cavoliere. On the other side of the path, appeared manufacturing facilities and warehouses. The height of the stratum of limestone on which the coverage structures were put in ancient times is on average at meter under meter two from street level, while the height of the available lot is quadrangular, is very different from the reconstructed geometry of the monument. Displacement imposes immediately the problem. How yeah. and how much to make see the presence of area to the external perception relating to the constraints constituted by the surroundings. And most importantly, how to define the protection without give up the aspect, mostly likely this exited um, at the uh, time of its completion of the fourth century before Christ, characteristic of the relationship between the burial area and the natural 
uncontaminated surrounding area. Given these initial considerations, it is therefore moved onto the project conjectural hypothesis, taking into account both the type of casing to be used, either to the building system to be employed in order to make the special articula articulation of the burial area readable. Given the circumstances, the principle adopted was not oriented to the choice of so-called container that hide outside its content. Consider, for example, the interesting project of Luigi Franciosini for the Villa Faragola at Ascoli Satriano, in which it was proposed a white parallelepiped that defines and organizes its, its internal space perfectly regularly in an isolated place in the flat country of the tavoliere, which shows only the volume in, of protective structure. In this case, instead, the idea cogito of the sign is not given up preserved for, for the protective structure, the fundamental condition of significant meaning that, in addition to be, being the external coverage as an emergency and to evoke critically the ancient arrangement. Now the second part, Nicola Scardino talks about the design concerning the covering of the Ipogeo Varese. Thank you. Eh, Matteo, dovresti chiudere la connessione per, in modo tale da consentirmi di condividere lo schermo. Ok. No. Nicola, stai condividendo lo schermo? Sì. Io? Il mio ancora? No, no, io. Forse devi toglierlo. Aspetta, non riesco sì, ho a eliminato. Aspetta. Adesso... Riesco. Ecco. Okay. Lo vedete? Yes. Sì. Ok. So, uh, so, thank you very much, Tom. Um, hello to everyone. Um, I'm going to talk now about the design project that uh, Matteo Ieva and the uh, architect Carmine Robbe made for the Ipogeo Varese. It has been a project made, by, made in 2011-2013. Um, let's start by looking at these two pictures. Uh, basically, um, I would like first of all um, to say that the site, archaeological site of Ipogeo Varese is along a territorial route that connects the city of Canosa di Puglia with the, the Murjan and the Ofanto Valley. Uh, two picture that shows the condition of the archaeological site just before the uh, intervention. Um, what I would like to say is that uh, um, the design of the covering taking consideration what was the original layout, the original plant, of the archaeological site and uh, from that picture you can see the original uh, this hold indicated the original uh, place where um, pillars were um, put inside um, uh, two questions um, are at the base of this uh, um, intervention how to uh, requalify the archaeological site and uh, mostly how to do that by preserving the uh, interaction between the archaeological site and the surrounding uh, landscape. 
Um, this is a picture that shows uh, the entrance to the funerary room and from that picture you can see, uh, we are in the basement, uh, we can see how before the intervention all the archaeological site was subjected to flooding, we are traces of the flooding. Um, now some picture that shows old finds uh, of this archaeological site now uh, recovered inside the archaeological museum of uh, uh, Canosa di Puglia. So here we have uh, two uh, drawings showing plan and section uh, of the archaeological site. In the bottom we can see the plan basically um, consists of the dromos which is a kind of uh, um, corridor, long corridor, excavated within the soil that led to the entrance to the funerary room, which is just up here, and also four more rooms just surrounding the hand of the dromos itself. Here, from that picture, we can see the, um, the entrance, the original entrance to the um, funerary room. In that case, two other questions um, are at the basis of the intervention. How to envelop this archaeological site? site um, so, which kind of structure used for envelop this archaeological site? By preserving the spatial articulation of the inside. So here we can see two more uh, sections, the longitudinal section that show the relation between the dramas and the cell at the hand of it, and also the transversal section that um, make clear the relation between the dramas, so the long corridor excavated within the soil, and the rooms that uh, are on the side of it. On the bottom, um, a reconstruction made by an archaeologist. From here we can see uh, the hypothesis of uh, surrounding portico around the dromos that here we can just see uh, excavated within, the, within the, the, the basement. So that's the, that's the, um, the design map. From that map, uh, we can recognize basically the main entrance configured like a vestibule that led to the basement at the level of basement through that stairs. Then we have uh, um, element of the sema just in that place and that place just on the side of the dromos and at the end of the dromos the nikos nikos sorry. Also, um, uh, two uh, interstitial area just on the side of the dromos, that one and that one, and also another um, interstitial area with a triangular shape uh, um, used by used for a bookshop, and um, an uh, annular path for architectural barrier that just surround the archaeological site. So all these elements that I described in a very analytical way are just covered in, uh, organically by the covering that the two architects designed, a wooden covering uh, surround, uh, supported by uh, pillars with a rectangular shape for the dromos area and uh, uh, a round shape for the uh, SEMA, SEMA sides. Um, inside uh, this covering system we find the hierarchies. So we have a serial uh, aggregation of wooden elements for the SEMA, Naikos and the Dromos part while um, um, square shape configuration for the uh, to uh, interstitial area. Yet yeah, it is, it is uh, almost clear from uh, this, uh, this plan that showed the covering system.
This is a render that shows from uh, the top all this uh, part. And basically, uh, it is very clear the room put at the hand of the drummers uh, destined for a uh, meeting. Here are some uh, section that shows the relation uh, between the um, spaces and the covering system. That's the main entrance. You can see a very uh, hierarchized within the, the project in terms of height. And here also the, the dromos, the space of the dromos. Here are the two section, perspective section that shows the intervention, the covering system. Uh, here from that picture, it is very clear the relation, sorry, from that one, sorry, on the bottom, the relation between the um, wall system and then surround the archaeological area and the internal punctual structural system have uh, made by boot. That's uh, a view uh, along the route. That's the main entrance. And uh, the entrance to the bookshop, the secondary entrance. Very interesting is the way the interior designer decided to create a kind of a screen between the exterior space and the interior of the uh, archaeological site. That's a view from the top. From here, we can see how uh, two different kinds of uh, polycarbonated were used for cover the wooden structure, um, dark for the Sema, Naikos, and the Dromos part, more uh, transparent for uh, the interstitial area, and for the, of course, for the vestibule from the the, the street, accessible from the street, accessible, sorry, from the street. It is also very clear here the stairs that uh, led to the basement level. Here another view just staying uh, underneath the wooden covering inside the archaeological site. That's the stair that uh, led to the basement level more or less uh, uh, three meters from the, um, the bookshop. And also, uh, it is not very clear from that picture, but to separate the space underneath the bookshop and the archaeological site is a, a very large uh, um, glass uh, glasses surface so the another render that shows the the stairs and um, as a element that um, divide the archaeological area from the area underneath the bookshop that's the meeting room just put on the hacks of the dramas, which is just uh, visible here in that picture. That's a picture during the construction phases. Here we can see, uh, for example, the, um, the, the construction of the, the stairs made by um, perimetral wool uh, concrete wool and the stairs made by uh, culture pesto and a slab of stone. Here we can see how to get to the archaeological level. Other picture that's showing the construction of the covering system. So we are here during the work basis.
Well, from that picture, it is pretty clear also the relation between the punctual internal construction system and the continuous surrounding fence, so the, the, the wall, um, a wall that uh, allow the visitor of the archaeological site to appreciate a kind of relation between the archaeological site and also the surrounding uh, landscape of the Offenthal Valley. This is another picture that shows the vestibule from the, the main route and also the screen wall that separate the exterior from the interior of the, of the archaeological site. Here the area of the dramas. These are other pictures that show the two different uh, um, arrangement of the covering element in that case so as i said before a serial in the space of uh, the dramos with um, a quadrangular with the with the quadrangular shape configuration for the interstitial area between the dramos and the same on the side so that's a view that shows the vestibular just staying at the basement level. Uh, so here are pictures that show the, the relation between the solid basement and a very uh, light um, constructive system of the covering so that's all thank you very much for the attention thank you very much for the presentation now we move on to our next uh, lecturer, who is uh, Rosa Anna Genovese uh, from University of Naples, Federico II. Uh, she's going to give a speech on archaeology, cities, and landscape. Uh, an uh, Rosa Anna Genovese, an architect specialized in architectural and urban restoration. Rosa Anna Genovese is associate professor of restoration at the University of Naples, Federico II. Uh, in the Department of Architecture. She's, she also teaches in the School of Spe Specialization in Architectural and Landscape Heritage in doctoral course of uh, DIARC in the doctoral course of, in assessment methods in integrated conservation of architectural, urban and environmental heritage and <sighs> in planning uh, and sustainable design of port areas. From 1991 to 2004, she was lecturer in the degree course in conservation of cultural heritage of the University of Naples, Suor Orsola Benin Casa. Uh, she was professor of the doctoral course of the European University Center for Cultural Heritage in 2003. Genovese, Professor, you have the floor. Are you there? Uh, Rosanna Genovese, are you there? Yes, we can see your presentation. Thank you, thank you. Good right. morning, thank you very much for this invitation of uh, Alessandro Camiz and uh, Tom Rankin uh, to the International Symposium, uh, the Roman Forum uh, Architecture and Archaeology. In uh, a moment, okay, is it good? Uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, this volume, uh, edited by me, uh, the essays uh, um, go some way to giving uh, um, an answer to the problems that the cities uh, with the significant archaeological wealth had to face. Uh, 
Uh, on the one hand, in fact, archaeology is presented as an important element in building, building up tourism and environmental development policies. And on the other, pressure due to intensive use causes a strong reaction from conservation authorities, which tend to isolate the more prestigious areas and monuments from their historical integration in the fabric of the city. The preservation of the archaeological heritage presupposes, on the one hand, as is the wish of many, cooperation between the archaeologists, the conservationists, the town planner, the landscape architect and the politician, and from another point of view, the respect of a number of basic points, as Michael Petzet recalled, such as identifying and cataloging the existing heritage to be considered a priority for, for conservation, the need to use precise scientific documentation together with the search and diagnosis techniques which uh, will not damage the excavation work in compliance with the general principle of the Charter of Venice, the distinction between excavation work for scientific purposes, emergency or rescue excavation, the protection and the management with the aim of the preservation in situ of the archaeological heritage and all the connected testimony and the elements gathered, Charter of Lausanne, uh, the distinguishability of the elements of integration to be limited to be absolute necessary, the need to carry out reconstruction with the extreme caution and in such a way as to be identified as much. Among the main forces in Italy, behind the setting up of a structure for the protection of the cultural heritage, especially from the archaeological point of view and its conservation, is without dub Giuseppe Fiorelli, first managing director of Antiquità e Belle Arti, who set the direction in a number of sectors, archaeological excavation to cataloging, from the training of official, officials to architectural restoration. The Italian legislation on the subject of archaeological sites has remained largely unchanged from the time of the historical law number 1089 of 1939, as can be uh, seen from an examination of the national legislation on archaeological conservation to which the Consolidation Act 1999 of the provision of law on the cultural and environmental heritage and the National Heritage Code of 2005 had, have, a did no update. From these arise problems of adaptation and the actual application of rules that have raised and continue to raise problems and bring about conflicts between the need to create public and the private works, often very important and urgent, and the need to study the remains of our past and to protect them. This situation is especially found in the urban context, which almost always constitutes a more problematic environment from the technical and the archaeological point of view. Back in 1956 and then 1968, UNESCO 
adopted specific recommendations on the subject. Naming public works among the greatest risk factors for cultural heritage, as can also be seen in Article 11 of the World Heritage Convention <coughs> held in Paris. In the same way, the Council of Europe carried out an in-depth study of the matter at the European Convention for the Protection of Archaeological Heritage. The more recent development legislation of the code concentrated, concentrated on the deed of understanding between the Minister of Cultural Heritage and the, the agents involved, the public and the private, and make it possible to plan and agree more constructively on the faces of archaeological with the, the related use of particularly important remains, contributing to an in-depth scientific study and the protection and the promotion of important archaeological discoveries that are often kept quiet due to fear. In the absence of provisions really capable of preserving the physical integrity of archaeological sites, the guarantee that they are known and protected necessarily runs through uh, the planning process at various levels. Recognizing the things of the past and the virtually and cartographically reconstructing its traces is a task for which archaeology has been waiting for decades, looking to planning as an instrument for the protection of archaeological resources. Mapping finds, reading the continual process of transformation, which has determined the current order of urban centers and their surroundings, creating a system or reference capable of making it possible to dialogue and exchange information among diverse institutionally responsible agents to create uniform reference document which can be updated in real time, which means having an irrepressible instrument for planning the historical city, but also promoting a new public conscience, a, a renewed sense of collective responsibility. One of the specific characteristic, characteristics in Italy of the relationship between the urban areas and the presence of archaeological sites is made up of, of in the Vesuvius area, the cesura between the land before and after eruption because of sudden burials of remarkable power. power. The context exists in its completeness and should not therefore be reconstructed and hypothesis on while the monuments are mainly conserved in their original elevation. The archaeological areas around Vesuvius differ in the way they were buried and their de facto relationship with the historical and the modern landscapes. Antonio De Simone gives us a better understanding of how this diversity makes it possible to identify a series of cases. The city of Pompeii, the archaeological zone of Torre Annunziata, the villas of ancient Stabie, the site of Herculaneum, different from each other, but having in common the distinction and separateness between the archaeological sites and their modern territory. In particular, the Herculaneum site represents for the Vesuvian territory 
a unique and exceptional case as it has an urban stratigraphy that puts together all the past historical periods from the classical of the ancient city, Ercolano Scavi, to the medieval and the baroque of a Bourbon urbanization. A moment. It has, as Vieri Quilici points out, right up to the highest levels, a weight of heritage unique in its historical and environmental value, which can be summed up in terms of archaeology, city, and landscape. But the need to redevelop the urban centers in the Vesuvian zones is at least as great as the weight of the archaeological site. The disorder, uh, disordered development of the city of Ercolano has worsened the vision of a dif difficult cohabitation between the ancient and the contemporary. Its demographic density requires the recovery of spaces for the public and in the absence of free areas, the archaeological site has the function of public park with controlled access in the unusual ways of an archaeological park in a, an urban context. In such a situation, the archaeological site would be fully reintegrated into today's urban landscape and the archaeological asset could foster a, a process of redesigning the modern city. It is a question of organization the parts of the city in a continuum of relationship facilitating, as the Simone points out, the perception, the visiting, and the making use of heritage, public pathways, horizontal and vertical connections between the different stratigraphies, visibility of the individual parts that will have to be general and differentiated accessibility, suitable forms of welcome, relevant information, real participation by the inhabitants in the management process. It is also necessary to look further at the aspect of the evolution of the criteria of structural consolidation of archaeological monuments having understood some typical operation, operations regarding archaeological findings, such as the reinforcement of columns, the straightening and the reinforcement of dangerous walls, the completion of, of outer walls, the reconstruction of building of parts of buildings, are the more recurrent but in sight practice and in modern and the contemporary studies. In the early years of the new century, however, a number of local a number of local authorities in Italy have started to fund using European aid to increase tourism, a series of schemes. Uh, which have not always been acceptable. In the light of this, it was decided to carry out an exemplary conservation operation, which would be a reference model for all those who in some way were involved in similar activities, focusing the attention of the, for example, the European Church of the Peccato originale in Matera, not only because of the quality and the historic importance of the paintings, which still now cover the walls, but oh, above all because of the extremely particular state of the key that threatened them. Michele Delia, 
illustrated the, uh, the cross curricular work carried out by a team of experts, geologists, geotechnicians, microbiologists, botanists, chemists, climatologists, architects and restorers, mostly from the Istituto Centrale del Restauro and coordinated by a scientific manager. These experts carried out first a careful reconnaissance investigation of the state of preservation of the cave and the limestone beads from which it is excavated, supported by a graphic, photographic, and photogrammetic survey to be used at the basis for driving up maps and accurate documentation of the state of conservation of the cave through the mapping of every individual form of decay found on each surface with the possibility of superimposing the different maps where the same surfaces have the different forms of alteration. Even it the idea of a continuity between past and present based on the legibility on the oldest layout and its evolutionary process has constituted the start starting point for most of the research program programs on or urban morphology the conflict that often characterizes characterizes the relationship between the pre-existing archaeology and the city seems to lie in the limits inherent in the historical antagonism between preservation and the transformation. Was more evident consequence consist in a separation which is not only physical, between the fields of the archaeological area and the surrounding urban context, but which also marks the antagonism of the various disciplinary and institutional fences of archaeology, town planning and architecture. Archaeological heritage, emphasized, said Roberto Di Stefano, my professor, comes into the more wide ranging sector of cultural heritage directly connected with the territory, together with the environmental of, and the landscape heritage, as well as the architectural and that of historical city. This is, uh, that is uh, to say, those parts of heritage that are most at risk of decay and destruction under the effect of a perverse use of the territory, which came about in the Hindu era. Uh, this is the panel of the Congress on Archaeology, Town and the Landscape uh, promoted by me. From this, it is immediately clear, therefore, uh, that the responsibility of the protection of the archaeological heritage is not only in the hands of the specifically archaeological bodies and institutions, but also of those responsible for the planning policies at all levels, international and national, of which conservation policy is an integral part. There is also a relationship between archaeological culture and the origin of the idea of landscape, a term which brings together the different ways of understanding a reality at first sight, unitary, and which can assume, indeed, different, if not contrasting meanings, depending on the inter the interpretations of human life space and the form of the nature present in the meanings of the environmentalists, landscapers, geologists, and agron or agronomists and botanists. 
the landscape, the most abundant thing of earth, according to the Portuguese writer José Saramago, improves the quality of our lives, exalting the concept of the beautiful. As a protagonist in the art and the writings of the travelers of the Great Tour, the most important part of cultural heritage in our country, witness to a history among the richest in civilization and the cultures, has undergone damage to the coherence of its landscape and the quality of life. And all from the 1950s also because of substantial exoduses from the countryside to the city and the growth in inauthorized in the chaotic construction work. Rather than conservation of the landscape, we need to think of conservation of the environment for the conservation of the values many needs in order to project together with the integrated criteria and the methods of conservation, both the cultural and the natural environment and the physical territory. The conservation of the environment in a civilly, uh, civilized country such as ours, observed Roberto Di Stefano, is possible in today's society as long as it is understood as an action to be undertaken for the advantage of humanity and therefore included and not distinct among the more general objectives of planning the national develop development, which should not be too tough uh, of as the mere the development of material well-being being, but as the global development of man with all his needs and especially his value, values. Humankind is living its fall as if it were an aesthetic experience. The crisis of contemporary values is increasingly uh, cyclic, uh, leading to a life immersed in ugliness, uh, surrounded by a type of permanent physical intoxic intoxication. From the town planning angle, we have made various steps towards the ugly of the immoral, giving the road the upper hand, uh, moving uh, individuals from uh, one point to another over the square understood as the platform for public life where shared the beauty, the spirit of aggregation was rooted. Waiting to get through the night, it is important then to try and find that highway that is education in beauty that for centuries has refined the human soul in order to establish an indivisible system of values as was the case uh, uh, through the Greek and the Renaissance words, the link that is between ethics and aesthetics, the harmonious relationship between the values of justice and those of beauty. The defense of nature, ecology, the fight against every form of pollution, the search for a more human urban environment, bring men back to the responsible control of the technological process as an instrument that allows him 
to live in symbiosis with his natural habitat. And so perhaps, Roberto Di Stefano reminds us, it will be possible to solve altogether the central question of all social relations, which is that of living together in places that can define and enclose in their human environment, natural and urban, those elements that allow the individual to experience the joy of life. Cultural heritage can play then a considerable role in, in humanization strategies and urban development and open up new prospects for research and integration between men and the city and the city for a more human life policy based on the balance between material and non-material values. It is in order to satisfy the needs values relationship that the conservation has uh, among um, uh, no, among other things, to protect in a global and not total way, but the cultural and the natural heritage. Riches that have value for the spiritual life of men. They therefore provide usefulness and thus have also economic value. Economic value which, however, should not be interpreted in the sense of taking advantage of usefulness for material needs using mainly uh, consumerist methods. This is a mistake which has been highlighted for years now in cultural debate and failed by useless attempts to reconcile the cultural need to protect and the debt of a misunderstood economic and social development. It is, it, if the cultural heritage is to be conserved, it is necessary to define a policy which wants the outcome may be inserted into a more general context of international cooperation. To bring about a global development which is not only sustainable, but which truly conforms to the double need of men for material goods and non-material values. This is the, uh, a congress for, with Andrei Tomaszewski, Francesco Caruso, Maria Rosa Suarez in Clown du Cassi, the president of Icomos Spain, uh, Manuel del Carrasco. Uh, so, uh, importance of intercultural dialogue and the participation of communities to the conservation, protection, and enhancement of cultural heritage. The search for the simultaneous satisfaction of both these needs, as I have said, constitutes the true duty of the state and no longer imposes the conservation of a cultural heritage of art and history, but the policy of a cultural heritage that is to say a series of guidelines for initiatives that the state should undertake in the various sectors of life associated with it and which converge towards the above described development. Guidelines to be chosen with the common and the conscious agreement of all the population through democratic participation and ensuring transparency. This is the contribution of communities to the process of identification, UNESCO World Heritage Convention, Lausanne Charter, Budapest Declaration, UNESCO Convention of Intangible Cultural Heritage, the FAR is very important, the FAR Convention, the NARA document, the Bura Charter, the UNESCO Recommendation of Historic Urban Landscape, and is the uh, uh, challenges uh, constituted by uh, 
harmonization of international principles and cultural a policy of cultural heritage. Allora, um, to share, sharing uh, transparency, to share first of all the reasons uh, with uh, it is necessary to conserve things that have value and that the people themselves must be able to freely, without any form of hidden persuasion, recognize and interpret. Also, it is the people who must choose the way to gain from these things the specific and particular utility, economic and cultural, that they offer, a way of using without consumption that requires complex forms of management, economic, technical, and administrative investment, as well as costs at times onerous that must be justified by sure materials benefit for the population. The reach a balance between conservation and use of the cultural heritage it is necessary to witness greater social participation and that there be the common conscious agreement of the majority to accept the choices for of cultural development which aims to reinforce the alliance between men and men and the environment. Only therefore the balance between public and private intervention, each one carrying out uh, its uh, own specific role, can guarantee, can guarantee the conservation of the cultural heritage to the advantage of the public. The existence, therefore, of the true policy of cultural heritage sustained by a participation and the common conscious agreement of various levels of the population today constitutes the pivotal instrument guaranteeing, guaranteeing economic, economic, social and cultural development of the different regions of the world to guarantee respect for the authenticity uh, at, in, of the cultural uh, heritage, integration of archaeology, cities and the landscape, and uh, also authenticity of uh, uh, material and non-material values continued with, within it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. We have one more presentation now to go in this very, very rich day. Um, we're going to hear from Federica Visconti and Renato Capozzi, who will now be talking about another project for the Via dei Fori in Pali in Rome, uh, a bridge for the Fori. And uh, Federica is an architect, PhD in urban design at Federico II in Naples. She's associate professor of architecture and urban composition at the DIARC. She's a member of the teaching staff in the PhD in architecture and construction at La Sapienza in Rome. And her research focuses on issues related to architecture of reason, relationship between architecture and urban form and the project and knowledge of archeology. span And with her is presenting Renato Capozzi. Hello, Renato. Hello. Um, PhD in architectural composition at the UAV in Venice and associate professor of architectural and urban composition at the DIARC Federico II in Naples. He's also on the teaching staff of the PhD program in, uh, oh, in Sapienza, and then the teaching staff of the PhD program in Sapienza in architecture and construction. Um, his research topics include architectural design and its theoretical dimension, the lessons of the masters, and the relationship between architecture and reality. So, Federica and Renato, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you for invitation. And uh, I am alone because Federica is attempting um, inspection inside. Uh, I try to share uh, my presentation. You see? Yep, it's come up now. 
and it's okay. Yep, yeah, I think you want to full screen it. Full screen, I try. Okay. okay. Perfect. Yes, perfect. Okay. Uh, I show you uh, uh, a project for a competition uh, for uh, uh, for Imperial in Rome with the Academia di Adrianea in Twitter Rome. Uh, it was a competition for. Uh, uh, a, a big uh, team group. Uh, you can uh, see the, the colleagues, uh, the participants, uh, sharing um, department or architecture of uh, University of Naples uh, with Valeria Pezza, me, Federica, and other colleagues, different disciplines. Uh, you can see landscape, restoration, archaeology, history of art, and so on. And for archaeology, we have Heinz Jürgen Best in, uh, in Rome. Um, and we have a partner, uh, professional and also academic partner, uh, it was uh, Uwe Schroeder, architect, uh, that, that teach in uh, Haken and uh, his office in uh, Bonn. Uh, our proposal, uh, starting uh, from dealing with the complexity of the project site, try a simplification, able to de determine choices and not to be intimidated by the value of the things being faced, one hand. And on the other hand, not to presume we are able to improve the past. The issues were limited to a, a purely technical level in the knowledge that facing with the uh, many different layers of urban construction, the complex and the alternative history of this area and uh, the generation that lived in and uh, built it in different ways over the time. Could be enabled decision to be made, decision that uh, are both strong and radical. Uh, you can see some uh, historical map, is a knowledge, I think, with the, you can sh recognize the presence of the uh, four imperiali, the traces of four imperiali, uh, but uh, Palatino, Hill, and Massenzio, and Campo Vaccino, the, the Roman fort. Uh, also, we have uh, indagate, uh, consult uh, some um, catastro, catastro division of the soil, uh, and some image that show as a uh, uh, the remains the, of archaeology uh, are dialectically in, uh, involved in the urban uh, development of uh, Rome in different ways uh, to reuse some uh, pieces of archaeological pieces uh, on built on these archaeological pieces and so on. Uh, this map is uh, an invention is a, a reconstruction hypothesis uh, 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 that show the complexity of uh, direction, the complexity of construction of the system of, of the uh, forum uh, uh, spaces that uh, works on the theme of the boundary, the boundary inside the boundary are columns. Uh, boundaries uh, touch another boundary and so on. The most clear example is uh, Foro Transitorio, uh, redrawing by Palladio. Uh, this is the drawing of Palladio for Transitorio. We have the presence of many, many beautiful spaces of the ancient imperial 
city of Rome. Uh, uh, we have uh, this is the actual condition uh, in, in this uh, reconstruction. It's not too well. Uh, it's not good reconstruction. It's a model uh, not uh, clear for me, but uh, it's clear that is very difficult to recognize the structure of this uh, for imperial form. There is a two street, Alexandrina, and four imperial street that uh, overlap the clear asset of the Roman form, uh, imperial form, and uh, is, a, is a an understanding and it's impossible to understand the sequence of space. Uh, for us, this is the main problem of this competition. How uh, try to um, uh, realize a clear uh, understanding of this system? Uh, for, for us, it's very important to um, work on the, on the trace of uh, the imperial and uh, transform uh, this street is a very large, very impacted, very uh, heavy on the system of form and uh, try to uh, realize a uh, clear connection between two parts that now are uh, separated, are uh, unrelated, each uh, and the world. Uh, our proposal, uh, you can see in this free sketch and in a model, study model of the complex system of soil, the complex system of the hill of, of the city of Rome, uh, our proposal is to realize uh, a bridge that uh, can able to allow the connection and the readable of the structure of the uh, form. This drawing is a famous project uh, did by Leonardo Beneo and Vittorio Gregotti uh, for imperial. Uh, this proposal tried to uh, erase the, 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 the line of the Via for Imperial to realize an archaeological, unitarian archaeological park uh, between uh, Altare della Pradia and Colosseum. For us, this is an interesting. Uh, uh, way to thinking about the possibility to uh, uh, put in the, in the, in presence of the contemporary city, the ancient city, uh, different layers, obviously, but uh, 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 it's possible to put uh, into dynamic urban dynamic. Uh, uh, story of the contemporary city, the the, the big uh, uh, morphological system of uh, uh, for imperiali, and uh, from this is the sketch that use the, the previous sketch that uh, that uh, represent the, this possibility, a huge bridge that connects the, these two points and uh, uh, allows uh, the, like, uh, the freedom space under the bridge and the possibility to look forward from uh, this part, the part of uh, for Romano and the system of Imperial, for Imperial. And we have some reference to think about the bridge. We work on this, uh, Method uh, our, for for us the project is a system of reference uh, in the architecture and in the architecture of the city. 
uh, in this slide we, we can recognize some uh, uh, well-known uh, reference. Uh, it's a bridge of, by Sabi Fell, uh, but plan from Paris, uh, a project for Cas uh, Street with Colonnades, and the famous project by Andrea Pallario for uh, Venice from uh, the Ponte di Rialto in Venice. Uh, you can uh, recognize that this bridge, this, the first solution is the second one. The first uh, version of the project is two for to uh, public space connected by a um, uh, bridge that have uh, colonnades, arcades in the two sides, like this uh, street in Karlsruhe. Uh, also, another, another reference was this, this um, the famous building in Oslo. Uh, the municipality of Oslo with this two tower, two brick tower that uh, are clear reference in the landscape or um, uh, horizontal landscape of the for, for imperial form. It's another sketch from the solution by Pallaio for Ponte di Via. Or another reference uh, very clear was uh, uh, Conrad uh, Street uh, in uh, uh, Roman cities in Africa, not Africa. Um, the problem of the big bridge, because it's, it's a huge bridge, is to find the constructive solution. So realize. Uh, uh, several uh, points of, of pillars uh, and uh, realize not only a bridge but uh, a colonel bridge and uh, uh, realize two uh, main entrance, uh, main uh, uh, signalatic uh, building to observe, to look the, the panorama around the forum, the hill of the city and the city overall. Mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in this part for the La Pache, uh, I will choose uh, only two uh, towers, big towers. In the other side, uh, near Basilica of Massenzio, I will propose um, uh, reflect on the possibility to build uh, uh, on the level of the contemporary city, not at the level of the ancient city, a new form, a new modern form that solves the problem of accessibility of, in the area, archaeological area, uh, the connection with the infrastructure, metro, uh, and so on. Also, the uh, antiquarium uh, that in the competition was uh, claimed. Uh, all the reference to uh, find the right shape for the uh, new form. Uh, you can recognize different example. Uh, uh, Pompeii Forum, Austria, Forum, Uffizi, that is a forum huh, in a way, and this is the solution we uh, choose uh, a linear forum with uh, uh, the start of the bridge in this point, the two towers, and re relating to the, this regular shape of the forum, colonnade shape. Uh, there are some pieces that solve the problem of different level, uh, the connection with uh, other uh, archaeological models. This uh, hypothesis 
hall was the antiquarium that had a different level uh, in, uh, in uh, Colina Velia, in uh, Velia Hill. Uh, this is a, a draw that show, has uh, this hypostyl uh, uh, hall uh, is connected on a uh, lower level to uh, follow the lavage. And we try to find the, the right solution for the for the bridge. Uh, I show uh, very shortly uh, some sketches uh, to uh, solve the problem. Uh, how many pillars? Uh, uh, in what way? What is the structural solution for uh, solve the problem of a bridge not uh, too heavy, uh, uh, capable to. Uh, open at the lower level. Seven, seventy, seven meters from this uh, line to the archaeological court. Uh, this is a, the, um, in a way uh, a, a sort of logo of the project. Uh, this is a Campidoglio. This is a Colosseum and. Uh, just one line to solve the relationship between these uh, two fundamental parts of the uh, of the of the city of Rome. Um, some solution, some variation to find the right position of the pillars. Uh, don't touch the possibility to find archaeological. Uh, relevant archaeological traces and uh, control of proportion of the the tower. The tower is uh, the same way of uh, of uh, Trajanian tower, Trajan obelisk, the column Trajan. Um, our problem is to. Um, Cost, uh, to build a, a new infrastructure that uh, uh, solve the problem of a connection. Don't cut the, 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 the city uh, contemporary from the ancient city. And in the same time to allow the possibility to look from a good position uh, the system of form that we they connect uh, throughout these uh, uh, elements. So I'm sketches to to understand uh, the relationship with uh, one of the heat of the, the bridge. This is the constructive solution of the bridge. It's a very complex uh, construction in steel. Uh, with a, a big uh, truss uh, cave and uh, over some pillar to realize the colonnade, two colonnade that uh, clinked in the in the in the point where are the, the pillars. Another sketch. Uh, this drawing, I think, uh, show clearly. Uh, or try to show clear uh, how the the bridge uh, find the right connection with the uh, uh, modern level of the city, uh, the level of the Via de Fori Imperiale, uh, and how this uh, public space is a public mediation to the present city, to the possibility to overlap the ancient city, uh, find the, uh, the, the older collect connection with the uh, Collina Velia, uh, follow the La Pace, and uh, it's possible to read the different orientation uh, of this morphological, different morphological system, the actual asset of the city, as actual the uh, design of the city uh, and the ancient, the ancient one. Some, some uh, drawing to 
clarified uh, antiquarium. And this is the, the final solution for one version of antiquarium. We have uh, two principal uh, level. The lower one at the level of the archaeology uh, uh, site is a possible uh, uh, hole. Uh, that connect with the uh, metro and uh, other uh, infrastructure line. Uh, the, the, the other, the main level is a double high level with uh, um, in another, in another uh, balcony around a, a big uh, spaces. Uh, a sort of uh, uh, courtyard, it's a uh, light courtyard, uh, light off. Uh, yeah, our colleagues, uh, you wish this uh, German, and uh, the light off is a, a special kind of spaces that uh, is, is closed uh, for four sides and the the cover is open to the sky. It's, uh, uh, it's an uh, interesting space to indicate under the, uh, this point under Velia uh, Hill. Some image of the model of the bridge, the connection with the the area of, uh, of Foro Romano uh, and uh, Terminal. And the other one, uh, we can see the Basilica of Massenzi. Uh, this is the two boats for competition. And Matt, I want to show you uh, more precise in the detail, the drawing. Uh, an urban drove to recognize different point of the project. This uh, fountain is the main entrance from Monument uh, uh, Altare della Patria and uh, obviously Campidoglio Hill. Uh, the line of the bridge and the other four uh, uh, strictly related with the uh, Massenzio Basilica and uh, uh, Velia Hill. Uh, you can see uh, the lower of this uh, slide uh, is it the section in this point. Uh, Another interesting uh, site, archaeological site, out of the area of the forum. Uh, this is uh, uh, Colonna Adriana, uh, you can see here. And uh, these elements give the, the right measures, the right uh, proportion of the uh, big tower. Uh, three, four plans that show. Uh, different level, the level of the modern contemporary city. Uh, you can see the bridge, the tower, the, the door tower, the forum and the other door tower, uh, the antiquarium, and uh, uh, the possibility to re-recognize uh, recognize now, now it's impossible to recognize this continuity of uh, uh, this uh, Roman form. This is for La Pace, for Transitorio, or for Nerva, and, and so on. Uh, in this drawing, uh, this is an intermediate uh, level, the level of the um, of the street, the actual level of Fo Imperiali, the Fo Imperiali, and the entrance to the uh, big light of nation. This one, more dark, is the archaeological 
you can see how it's possible to connect at this level, uh, this point with the system of forum. And also in this uh, part, you can recognize the, uh, the tower bell and the staircase tower to go inside this level. And uh, you can see here the connection with the metro and the railway uh, line. Uh, details of the new forum uh, that uh, design a new uh, public space for a public connection, electrical connection for tourism and so on. Uh, the section uh, that show uh, in backyard uh, the, the consum and in the cross section this point that show the relationship between the level of the uh, uh, yeah for imperiali the the main light uh, off a theater for conference for study and so on and this wall is a wall for from how this uh, recomposed inside. And uh, this is a level of the hypostic form. The hypostic form at the lower level of the archaeology, the intermediate level, the level of the city, and the, another one living in intermediate level to connect uh, other uh, quotes, uh, balcony to allow uh, the possibility to front this public space. And in this cross section, you can uh, see the relationship with the Massenzio Basilica, the different level of. For new forum is a colonnade. Here start the, the bridge and uh, Colina Vedia has uh, uh, modified by the, the antiquarium. This is the forma urbis inside. Uh, this is the, another uh, cross section uh, of the forum. So it's a sort of uh, 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 in conclusion, uh, uh, Federica is coming now, but uh, in conclusion, I want to um, uh, underline some questions of this project, some topics of this, of this project. Uh, the problem of uh, the relationship with the landscape, uh, not romantic way to establish this relationship, uh, not uh, uh, only infrastructure, but not uh, romantic uh, uh, way to uh, look at the archaeological site as uh, a new uh, natural uh, uh, landscape, uh, but the possibility to reconnect the trace of the uh, ancient uh, construction of the city to uh, make this uh, reconnection uh, uh, unstable. Uh, mm, another question um, is uh, the, the problem to uh, uh, recognize the possible relation between uh, the ruins the archaeological ruins, marvelous ruins of the Roman uh, form and uh, the new form uh, that you can use to uh, underline, to 
uh, able to uh, realize a new comprehension, a new understand of this uh, uh, kind of uh, public space. The project uh, works on these uh, analogies, use the analogies to solve the problem of a new public space that uh, uh, link the contemporary cities with the archaeological cities. Use the analogies to um, find the right uh, uh, shape of the bridge is a contemporary bridge, it's not uh, an ancient bridge, it's a clear contemporary bridge. And uh, try to find uh, uh, a new kind of landscape, not romantic landscape. It's a new landscape that's able to uh, give the value, recognize the value of ancient trace, not erase the a recent line of the contemporary city and built a new public space that learn uh, the lesson of the ancient city of Rome, the lesson of uh, architecture. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Renato, for a very interesting project and very beautiful drawings. Uh, okay. your sketches, your design sketches are fantastic. So we've had a very uh, intensive day, a very long day, lots of interesting interventions. And we have just a little bit of time. There, I know there have been a few observations and questions and I've been having a discussion in the chat with um, Benjamin. If, if he is there and wants to say something, um, you're welcome to. And um, I want to thank uh, Singe Alak, who's been doing a wonderful job as moderator and um, helping introduce people. And if um, Singe wants to uh, continue to observe and facilitate any discussion now, and also invite um, Alessandro Camis, um, who has been letting us moderate. But I think now, Alessandro, if you want to join the discussion, it's very appropriate. Do we have anybody? Um, Simge, why don't you just look at the chat and see if there's some questions that we want to address? I actually already checked, but uh, I only see Benjamin's um, discussion. Yeah, Benjamin, are you online? Would you like to say something? There's someone else named Jess Mich Mitchell. Uh, oh, yeah, and, Je and Jess is one of our students, yeah. Yes, Jess, you can directly ask prof uh, Professor yeah. Renato if you want. Cool, it was just to ask Renato about um, his software workflow because his drawings were so beautiful. Like, obviously, you do a lot of hand drawing, but how do you get to that? Like, is it 3D modeling using like Rhino? Like, how, what's your software workflow? Hmm. I, I know because I know Renato that those hand drawings are just coming from your head, they're, they're not based on any model. Is that correct, Renato? It's, it's correct, <laughs> totally correct. <laughs> you should move us uh, for us for the moment. Yeah. Jessica, we're old school where we, we conceptualize, we draw by hand, and then bring it into the model. Yes, because you, with the hand, you can stop the ideas. No? Uh, it's a way to stop on the paper uh, I, I, idea in your mind. But the idea is a form, it's a shape. And you, uh, is, it, is it necessary to um, uh, put this idea in a concrete uh, or very close to concrete situation? And the model is a way to try to um, control uh, uh, the possibility that the idea is really concrete in proportion with the real, I think. Yeah. Anyway, so, so we don't seem to have any other questions, although there was a very good discussion going on in the chat 
um, with Benjamin about. I, I the, am here if you want oh, to. Oh, you are uh, there. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. I mean, I thought I thought you saw. I mean, I have activated everything, but then it moved on again. I wasn't big enough. No, no. I'm glad. You, I'm glad you're here. Um, Alessandro said that you're old friends, and I told him we had a discussion going on in the background. You yeah. might just ben, if you want to say, go, go ahead. ahead. If you want to comment, go ahead, please. Well, I mean, I was just saying, of course, I mean, you already know that this is a bit of a hobby horse of mine anyway, uh, to, to, to make this sort of argument. Um, and, and Giuseppe knows that I've uh, just constructed the viewpoint for uh, U plus D on, on, well, at least making some of the same points. Um, but uh, I also recognize it in the current sort of purpose and audience, especially with focus on the Forum Romanum. Um, it's, it's arguably a bit of a mood point because obviously it's, it's, it's somewhat going against uh, the, the sole focus of um, archaeological excavation as a, as a challenge for conservation, if you like. Um, so so the, the, the challenge of conserving archaeology uh, as part of, uh, part of the city, uh, where sort of my question comes from is rather, you know, should we just see archaeology as uh, producing... Uh, things that are of interest and representative of, of, of history, or should we see it as potentially useful developmental knowledge on uh, how we can further evolve and design for the city to continue and, and to address some, some developmental challenges? Uh, I'm very much in the latter camp, or at least that is my main sort of, you know, research type of concern. Um, uh, but I'm only just uh, starting to scratch the, su the surface. But of course, I mean, I do appreciate that there is always going to be a time and space where there is also uh, a desire and perhaps a need to conserve and, and, and to present archaeology as part of the, uh, the urban fabric. Um, but, but especially, you know, as Alessandro was talking about framing it, I, I, I was, you know, having this growing sense of, well, we focus on the framing, we are sort of very actively detaching uh, the archaeology and, and sort of the knowledge that it, that it represents from uh, uh, being an, uh, an active part of, of the city, its urban life and its, and its developmental dynamics. And is that really, you know, where we want to go? Is, is that really all that archaeology should be within, you know, the dynamics of the city? So, so hence, sort of my comment, uh, you know, but I, I just wanted to quickly provide that I do, you know, I do appreciate that obviously with regards to the Forum Romanum, I mean, this is perhaps, you know, not maybe the most appropriate sort of point to make. Well, can I just make a quick uh, observation there? Because it's been a fascinating uh, day of discussions, and some of them have involved uh, boundaries and limits and separations, and many of them have involved continuity. And um, Heidegger said that boundaries are really a place of beginning, not ending. They're, they're places of connection. If we think of walls, we think of gates. And so I think we need to contextualize this notion of limits as a way of um, identifying in order to have greater knowledge, but not separating. Um, I think there, there's, there's two different ideas. I wholly agree with you, Ben, that we should be looking at ways of engaging people with the history, not separating them out. As, as Orazio said, uh, you know, the idea of, an aquarium where we're on one side looking in isn't a very healthy model. Uh, I think we should also remember that history never stopped, that we're still part of history. So. But, uh, let, me, let me answer to Ben. Thank you for your remarks. But I would like to rem remind everyone, I mean, the, <coughs> the, the notion of frame has been raised by, within our culture. But the purpose of the frame of painting is not only delimitating the painting and separating it from the environment, but it also has another purpose, which is connecting the painting with the environment. So bringing that metaphor into the archaeological site, designing the frame of the archaeological site is not necessarily separating the site, but enhancing the site and connecting it to its own environment. So I think it, it works yes, very yes, well but, as I mean, a matter I, I guess I'm, main, I'm mainly sort of responding to the fact, of course, that you sort of, you know, approach it as by deciding where the frame goes and, uh, and perhaps how the frame goes, you're also limiting or delimiting what the archaeology is. And uh, in that sense, you, you, you are still separating. I mean, I wrote a book about boundaries, so I know how they separate and connect. Uh, but... <laughs> Uh, you know, besides that sort of more uh, philosophical point, 
um, which I appreciate. I mean, depending on how you execute the frame and the kind of role that the frame plays also in a physical, uh, you know, segregating or integrating type of uh, way, uh, you can bring many nuances. But the fact of the matter is that you're sort of reserving a bit inside those boundaries to be something different from what is outside those boundaries. And my point is more about, you know, the, the, the what about, tradition of archaeology, I guess. What about the connection? <laughs> What about the connection from the, you know what is inside the frame, what is outside? So the frame is in, in when we translate it into architectural design, it's not a border, it's a connector, but it's also yes, a yeah, connector I, which I, is. I totally agree. It, but it's a connector so it's which distinction between in and out. <laughs> exactly, and that is the point because what I mean, if you recognize the archaeological site as a place of value, it has to be put in value. And again, so we're not translating the frame into the archaeological site. That's a metaphor. The, the function of the frame within the painting is to enhance the painting and connect it to its environment, the museum, usually. So if you translate it, you know, literally, this into the archaeological site, for well, the purpose of the frame, the, you know, the arch architectural design conceived as a frame is that to enhance the archaeological site, put it in value and connect it. I would underline that once more, connect it. So eventually the building might be an entrance to the archaeological site, which yeah, is Yeah, let me bring in an example. Let me bring in an example from this morning when I was speaking to you from the forum and our surveying team was coming into the forum and we faced the problem that one always faces that a very large piece of the city has been defined as a historic cultural site and therefore is limited and the connections are there but the connections are either you have you know, a permit like we did or you pay a ticket and you can't pass through. There have been some very interesting proposals to actually sever the forum, to create bridges like Renato's bridge, which would connect different areas. I mean, bridges is another metaphor there. But um, the reality is that if you, we might have a, a theoretical frame, but sometimes it does become also a, a true boundary. And, and boundaries are, well, you know, from, from my country, we've seen discussion about walls, which are a very <laughs> tangible part of our contemporary world, surveillance and boundaries. If we might want to take the Renato suggestion for our students, you need to draw. So pick up your yeah. pencil. Yeah, and in fact, okay. on Sunday, pick up we'll be pencil. doing a drawing pick, exercise. Pick up your drawing pad and your pencil and start drawing because you're not going to get beautiful projects unless you draw them with your hands and you conceive them with your hearts. So. Yeah. We have an archaeologist present in the room, Jan Gadein. Do you have anything you wanted to add about uh, what you were able to observe from our discussion today? And now Jan has excavated. The, the yes, but uh, the hi. So yeah, I'm an archaeologist. Um, you hear me? Yes, yes. And uh, at the same time, however, I teach uh, urban history of Rome to architects. So uh, that's an interesting combo. Um, my excavation is not an urban excavation. It's a rural excavation in the countryside outside Rome in Lazio. But, um, I think what Benjamin was saying, you know, it may, it may sound strange, but I would side with Benjamin in the sense um, that I think that um, this idea of the frame and this idea of the way by which excavations seem to be um, cut out of the city, uh, separated from the city, in a way this comes from what archaeology in a city for a very long time has been and that has been excavate the remains of a building and then that building was treated as an object that was like an object in a museum put uh, in a framework that um, you know you looked at from the outside um, urban archaeology as you all know has gone through a massive um, development over the last 20 30 years and Thus, for me, when I, when I also teach um, urban archaeological sites, uh, such as, for instance, uh, the Crypto Balbi excavations or the uh, excavations of the Imperial Forums, um, I, first of all, point out to my students the different way by which these two excavations have been treated. Um, and um, I feel myself that as an archaeologist in a city, you don't excavate any longer 
uh, because of what was there, but you excavate actually in function of the existing city. Mm -hmm. um, and thus, the challenge is uh, to communicate that, to translate that in a language that the citizen, that the common visitor, or the random Roman understands. And I, you know, we all know that in the imperial forums, that is failing. Um, it is incredibly hard to teach the imperial forums the way they look today, because there is no tool available um, to actually um, explain exactly what has gone, on, what has been going on, and why it looks the way it looks. Um, so I think that uh, Ben Ben is I think Ben is right in in maybe demanding more than the obvious uh, of a, from an from an excavation, but it is incredibly hard to actually create that fluidity. Um, you know, that one would like to see between the excavated part and the contemporary city. Thank you, Jan. That's my, that's that's my modest opinion. Yeah. Um, does anybody else want to add anything else to this discussion? <coughs> Irene, I see that you and I are sitting in front of the same bookshelf here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, there, there might be a lot of things to say. I, I feel that this is what I try to transfer, not because I believe it, that probably after almost 20 years, at least in Rome, of uh, discussion on, on the possibility to merge competencies, because, you know, we have seen it since 70s, uh, there were already very remarkable, interesting reply to this topic in, the more, in a more traditional sense. There is a need for a further step in which the competencies are really combined. I'm not a supporter of a landscape or you know a curatorial or whatever, but probably also to to really to really have a voice because the risk is not to have a voice, and so we have to measure ourselves with the economies with the, the availability of. Um, of resources in general, and resources means also that the, the, polit the politicians and, and the administrator has to follow the, um, the opportunity to, to implement something. I mean, in, in the last uh, two, three years, of course, this uh, latest uh, this collective global experience uh, expanded uh, problems already existing. Um, I mean, the risk is that we have a lot of talks, uh, very interesting drawings, but the possibility to really uh, have a and in, whatever kind of implementation is very limited. So there must be a way, especially through the communication system we have, to, to really make more democratic the access to this kind of information. So I, I think there is still a lot of work to do. And probably the youngest generation through this workshop uh, could figure out some interesting uh, framework. You know, it's, um, you don't need sometimes to do enormous changes, but just, you know, slight uh, perspective uh, shift. Yes, very good. Do we have any other comments or questions? It's been a long day, and I thank the students for having stayed with us. For me, Rosanna Genovese. Yes, yes, Professor uh, I think uh, archaeological heritage uh, comes into the more uh, uh, wide ring, ringing sector of cultural heritage, directly connected uh, with the territory, territory, together with the environmental and the landscape heritage, as well as the architectural and that uh, historic cities. And uh, for to reach uh, a balance between uh, conservation and the use of cultural heritage, it's very important the Faro Convention, the concept of a heritage community. Uh, it is necessary to witness greater social participation and that uh, there the, be the common uh, conscious segment uh, of the majority 
uh, to accept the choices for uh, an act of a cultural development uh, which aims to uh, reinforce the alliance between men and uh, the environment. I think that is very important. Mm. Yes, thank you very much. So considering all the different kinds of heritage and then finding a balance. I mean, I think that we can agree okay. that question between a balance between conservation and activation um, is, is the real challenge. And that's the challenge that our students will be working on throughout the week as they carry out different kinds of investigation in the archaeological park in a much more contained site than Forti Imperiali. I mean, luckily we are dealing with a very precise location yes. already within the archaeological park, but one in which um, not much has been tested yet. It's an okay. area at the edge of the archaeological park. Oh. Okay. Okay. Do we have uh, any other comments? We, I don't want to silence anybody. Any students who have a question or want to say anything? I, thank I will... you for, for the perfect. Uh, well, thank you all. And the, the, the density and the rhythm. It was like a horse race. <laughs> well, you know, I think that we're finding that with this new platform, which we are all getting used to after months and months of lockdown, um, I, I, I personally think that it will stay with us in the future. You know, when one thinks of getting on an airplane and going to a convention on the other side of the world or just connecting on a computer. There's pros and cons. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, can I just tell the students who are present, the students who are enrolled in the summer school that